Chapters one through six of Of Human Bondage. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter one. The day broke gray and dull. The clouds hung heavily, and there was a rawness in the air that suggested snow. A woman's servant came into the room in which a child was sleeping and drew the curtains. She glanced mechanically at the house opposite, a stucco house with a portico, and went to the child's bed. "'Wake up, Philip,' she said. She pulled down the bedclothes, took him in her arms, and carried him downstairs. He was only half awake. "'Your mother wants you,' she said. She opened the door of a room on the floor below and took the child over to a bed in which a woman was lying. It was his mother. She stretched out her arms and the child nestled by her side. He did not ask why he had been awakened. The woman kissed his eyes and with thin small hands felt the warm body through his white flannel nightgown. She pressed him closer to herself. "'Are you sleepy, darling?' she said. Her voice was so weak that it seemed to come already from a great distance. The child did not answer but smiled comfortably. He was very happy in the large warm bed with those soft arms about him. He tried to make himself smaller still as he cuddled up against his mother, and he kissed her sleepily. In a moment he closed his eyes and was fast asleep. The doctor came forwards and stood by the bedside. "'Oh, don't take him away yet!' she moaned. The doctor, without answering, looked at her gravely. Knowing she would not be allowed to keep the child much longer, the woman kissed him again, and she passed her hand down his body till she came to his feet. She held the right foot in her hand and felt the five small toes, and then slowly passed her hand over the left one. She gave a sob. "'What's the matter?' said the doctor. "'You're tired.' She shook her head, unable to speak, and the tears rolled down her cheeks. The doctor bent down. "'Let me take him.' She was too weak to resist his wish, and she gave the child up. The doctor handed him back to his nurse. "'You'd better put him back in his own bed.' "'Very well, sir.' The little boy, still sleeping, was taken away. His mother sobbed now, broken-heartedly. "'What will happen to him, poor child?' The monthly nurse tried to quiet her, and presently, from exhaustion, the crying ceased. The doctor walked to a table on the other side of the room, upon which, under a towel, lay the body of a stillborn child. He lifted the towel and looked. He was hidden from the bed by a screen, but the woman guessed what he was doing. "'Was it a girl or a boy?' she whispered to the nurse. "'Another boy.' The woman did not answer. In a moment the child's nurse came back. She approached the bed. "'Master Philip never woke up,' she said. There was a pause, then the doctor felt his patient's pulse once more. "'I don't think there's anything I can do just now,' he said. "'I'll call again after breakfast.' "'I'll show you out, sir,' said the child's nurse. They walked downstairs in silence. In the hall the doctor stopped. "'You've sent for Mrs. Carey's brother-in-law, haven't you?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Do you know at what time he'll be here?' "'No, sir. I'm expecting a telegram.' "'What about the little boy? I should think he'd be better out of the way.' "'Miss Watkins said she'd take him, sir.' "'Who's she?' "'She's his godmother, sir. Do you think Mrs. Carey will get over it, sir?' The doctor shook his head. End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 It was a week later— Philip was sitting on the floor in the drawing-room at Miss Watkins' house in Onslow Gardens. He was an only child and used to amusing himself. The room was filled with massive furniture, and on each of the sofas were three big cushions. There was a cushion, too, in each armchair. All these he had taken out, and, with the help of the gilt-rout chairs, light and easy to move, had made an elaborate cave in which he could hide himself from the red Indians who were lurking behind the curtains. He put his ear to the floor and listened to the herd of buffaloes that raced across the prairie. Presently, hearing the door open, he held his breath so that he might not be discovered. 
but a violent hand piled away a chair and the cushions fell down. "'You naughty boy! Miss Watkin will be cross with you.' "'Hello, Emma,' he said. The nurse bent down and kissed him, then began to shake out the cushions and put them back in their places. "'Am I to come home?' he asked. "'Yes, I've come to fetch you. You've got a new dress on.' It was in 1885 and she wore a bustle. Her gown was of black velvet with tight sleeves and sloping shoulders, and the skirt had three large flounces. She wore a black bonnet with velvet strings. She hesitated. The question she had expected did not come, and so she could not give the answer she had prepared. "'Aren't you going to ask how your mamma is?' she said at length. "'Oh, I forgot. How is mamma? Now she was ready. Your mamma is quite well and happy.' Oh, I am glad. Your mamma's gone away. You won't ever see her any more. Philip did not know what she meant. Why not? Your mamma's in heaven. She began to cry, and Philip, though he did not quite understand, cried too. Emma was a tall, big-boned woman with fair hair and large features. She came from Devonshire, and, notwithstanding her many years of service in London, had never lost the breadth of her accent. Her tears increased her emotion, and she pressed the little boy to her heart. She felt vaguely the pity of that child deprived of the only love in the world that is quite unselfish. It seemed dreadful that he must be handed over to strangers. But in a little while she pulled herself together. "'Your Uncle William is waiting in to see you,' she said. "'Go and say good-bye to Miss Watkin, and we'll go home.' I don't want to say good-bye, he answered, instinctively anxious to hide his tears. Very well, run upstairs and get your hat. He fetched it, and when he came down Emma was waiting for him in the hall. He heard the sound of voices in the study behind the dining-room. He paused. He knew that Miss Watkin and her sister were talking to friends, and it seemed to him, he was nine years old, that if he went in they would be sorry for him. I think I'll go and say good-bye to Miss Watkin. "'I think you'd better,' said Emma. "'Go in and tell them I'm coming,' he said. He wished to make the most of his opportunity. Emma knocked at the door and walked in. He heard her speak. "'Master Philip wants to say good-bye to you, miss.' There was a sudden hush of the conversation, and Philip limped in. Henrietta Watkin was a stout woman with a red face and dyed hair. In those days to dye the hair excited comment and Philip had heard much gossip at home when his godmothers changed color. She lived with an elder sister who had resigned herself contentedly to old age. Two ladies whom Philip did not know were calling, and they looked at him curiously. "'My poor child,' said Miss Watkin, opening her arms. She began to cry. Philip understood now why she had not been in to luncheon and why she wore a black dress. She could not speak. I've got to go home, said Philip at last. He disengaged himself from Miss Watkins' arms, and she kissed him again. Then he went to her sister and bade her good-bye, too. One of the strange ladies asked if she might kiss him, and he gravely gave her permission. Though crying, he keenly enjoyed the sensation he was causing. He would have been glad to stay a little longer, to be made much of, but felt they expected him to go, so he said that Emma was waiting for him he went out of the room. Emma had gone downstairs to speak with a friend in the basement, and he waited for her on the landing. He heard Henrietta Watkins' voice. "'His mother was my greatest friend. I can't bear to think that she's dead.' "'You oughtn't to have gone to the funeral, Henrietta,' said her sister. "'I knew it would upset you.' Then one of the strangers spoke. "'Poor little boy. It's dreadful to think of him quite alone in the world. I see he limps.' yes, he's got a club foot. It was such a grief to his mother. Then Emma came back. They called a hansom, and she told the driver where to go. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 When they reached the house Mrs. Carey had died in, it was in a dreary, respectable street between Notting Hill Gate and High Street, Kensington. Emma led Philip into the drawing-room. His uncle was writing letters of thanks for the wreaths which had been sent. One of them, which had arrived too late for the funeral, lay in its cardboard box on the hall table. "'Here's Master Philip,' said Emma. 
Mr. Carey stood up slowly and shook hands with the little boy. Then on second thoughts he bent down and kissed his forehead. He was a man of somewhat less than average height, inclined to corpulence, with his hair worn long, arranged over the scalp so as to conceal his baldness. He was clean-shaven. His features were regular, and it was possible to imagine that in his youth he had been good-looking. On his watch-chain he wore a gold cross. "'You're going to live with me now, Philip,' said Mr. Carey. "'Shall you like that?' Two years before Philip had been sent down to stay at the vicarage after an attack of chicken-pox, but there remained with him a recollection of an attic and a large garden rather than of his uncle and aunt. "'Yes. You must look upon me and your Aunt Louisa as your father and mother.' The child's mouth trembled a little. He reddened, but did not answer. "'Your dear mother left you in my charge.' Mr. Carey had no great ease in expressing himself. When the news came that his sister-in-law was dying, he set off at once for London, but on the way thought of nothing but the disturbance in his life that would be caused if her death forced him to undertake the care of her son. He was well over fifty, and his wife, to whom he had been married for thirty years, was childless. He did not look forward with any pleasure to the presence of a small boy who might be noisy and rough. He had never much liked his sister-in-law. "'I'm going to take you down to Black Stable tomorrow,' he said. "'With Emma?' The child put his hand in hers, and she pressed it. "'I'm afraid Emma must go away,' said Mr. Carey. "'But I want Emma to come with me.' Philip began to cry, and the nurse could not help crying, too. Mr. Carey looked at them helplessly. "'I think you'd better leave me alone with Master Philip for a moment.' "'Very good, sir.' Though Philip clung to her, she released herself gently. Mr. Carey took the boy on his knee and put his arm round him. "'You mustn't cry,' he said. "'You're too old to have a nurse now. We must see about sending you to school.' "'I want Emma to come with me,' the child repeated. "'It costs too much money, Philip. Your father didn't leave very much, and I don't know what's become of it. You must look at every penny you spend." Mr. Carey had called the day before on the family solicitor. Philip's father was a surgeon in good practice, and his hospital appointments suggested an established position, so that it was a surprise on his sudden death from blood poisoning to find that he had left his widow little more than his life insurance and what could be got for the lease of their house in Bruton Street. This was six months ago, and Mrs. Carey, already in delicate health, finding herself with child, had lost her head and accepted for the least the first offer that was made. She stored her furniture and, at a rent which the person thought outrageous, took a furnished house for a year, so that she might suffer from no inconvenience till her child was born. But she had never been used to the management of money, and was unable to adapt her expenditure to her altered circumstances. The little she had slipped through her fingers in one way or another, so that now, when all expenses were paid, not much more than two thousand pounds remained to support the boy till he was able to earn his own living. It was impossible to explain all this to Philip, and he was sobbing still. "'You'd better go to Emma,' Mr. Carey said, feeling that she could console the child better than anyone. Without a word Philip slipped off his uncle's knee, but Mr. Carey stopped him. "'We must go tomorrow, because on Saturday I've got to prepare my sermon.' and you must tell Emma to get your things ready today. You can bring all your toys, and if you want anything to remember your father and mother by, you can take one thing for each of them. Everything else is going to be sold. The boy slipped out of the room. Mr. Carey was unused to work, and he turned to his correspondence with resentment. On one side of the desk was a bundle of bills, and these filled him with irritation. One especially seemed preposterous. Immediately after Mrs. Carey's death, Emma had ordered from the florist masses of white flowers for the room in which the dead woman lay. It was sheer waste of money. Emma took far too much upon herself. Even if there had been no financial necessity, he would have dismissed her. But Philip went to her and hid his face in her bosom and wept as though his heart would break. And she, feeling that he was almost her own son, she had taken him when he was a month old, 
consoled him with soft words. She promised that she would come and see him sometimes, and that she would never forget him. And she told him about the country he was going to, and about her own home in Devonshire. Her father kept a turnpike on the high road that led to Exeter, and there were pigs in the sty, and there was a cow, and the cow had just had a calf, till Philip forgot his tears and grew excited at the thought of his approaching journey. Presently she put him down, for there was much to be done, and he helped her to lay out his clothes on the bed. She sent him into the nursery to gather up his toys, and in a little while he was playing happily. But at last he grew tired of being alone and went back to the bedroom, in which Emma was now putting his things into a big tin box. He remembered then that his uncle had said he might take something to remember his father and mother by. He told Emma, and asked her what he should take. "'You'd better go into the drawing-room and see what you fancy.' "'Uncle William's there. Never mind that. They're your own things now.' Philip went downstairs slowly and found the door open. Mr. Carey had left the room. Philip walked slowly round. They had been in the house so short a time that there was little in it that had a particular interest to him. It was a stranger's room, and Philip saw nothing that struck his fancy. But he knew which were his mother's things and which belonged to the landlord, and presently fixed on a little clock that he had once heard his mother say she liked. With this he walked rather disconsolately upstairs. Outside the door of his mother's bedroom he stopped and listened. Though no one had told him not to go in, he had a feeling it would be wrong to do so. He was a little frightened and his heart beat uncomfortably, but at the same time something impelled him to turn the handle. He turned it very gently, as if to prevent anyone within from hearing, and then slowly pushed the door open. He stood on the threshold for a moment before he had the courage to enter. He was not frightened now, but it seemed strange. He closed the door behind him. The blinds were drawn, and the room in the cold light of a January afternoon was dark. On the dressing-table were Mrs. Carey's brushes and the hand-mirror. In a little tray were hairpins. There was a photograph of himself on the chimney-piece and one of his father. He had often been in the room when his mother was not in it, but now it seemed different. There was something curious in the look of the chairs. The bed was made as though someone were going to sleep in it that night, and in a case on the pillow was a nightdress. Philip opened the large cupboard filled with dresses, and stepping in took as many of them as he could in his arms, and buried his face in them. They smelt of the scent his mother used. Then he opened the drawers filled with his mother's things and looked at them. There were lavender bags among the linen, and their scent was fresh and pleasant. The strangeness of the room left it, and it seemed to him that his mother had just gone out for a walk. She would be in presently, and would come upstairs to have nursery tea with him, and he seemed to feel her kiss on his lips. It was not true that he would never see her again. It was not true simply because it was impossible. He climbed up on the bed and put his head on the pillow. He lay there quite still. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Philip parted from Emma with tears, but the journey to Blackstable amused him, and when they arrived he was resigned and cheerful. Blackstable was sixty miles from London. Giving their luggage to a porter, Mr. Carey set out to walk with Philip to the vicarage. It took them little more than five minutes, and when they reached it Philip suddenly remembered the gate. It was red and five-barred, it swung both ways on easy hinges, and it was possible, though forbidden, to swing backwards and forwards on it. They walked through the garden to the front door. This was only used by visitors and on Sundays and on special occasions, as when the vicar went up to London or came back. The traffic of the house took place through a side door and there was a back door as well for the gardener and for beggars and tramps. It was a fairly large house of yellow brick with a red roof, built about five and twenty years before in an ecclesiastical style. The front door was like a church porch, and the drawing-room windows were gothic. 
Mrs. Carey, knowing by what train they were coming, waited in the drawing-room and listened for the click of the gate. When she heard it she went to the door. "'There's Aunt Louisa,' said Mr. Carey when he saw her. "'Run and give her a kiss.' Philip started to run, awkwardly trailing his club foot, and then stopped. Mrs. Carey was a little shriveled woman of the same age as her husband, with a face extraordinarily filled with deep wrinkles and pale blue eyes. Her gray hair was arranged in ringlets according to the fashion of her youth. She wore a black dress, and her only ornament was a gold chain from which hung a cross. She had a shy manner and a gentle voice. "'Did you walk, William?' she said almost reproachfully as she kissed her husband. "'I didn't think of it,' he answered, with a glance at his nephew. "'It didn't hurt you to walk, Philip, did it?' she asked the child. "'No, I always walk.' He was a little surprised at their conversation. Aunt Louisa told him to come in, and they entered the hall. It was paved with red and yellow tiles, on which alternately were a Greek cross and the Lamb of God. An imposing staircase led out of the hall. It was of polished pine, with a peculiar smell, and had been put in because, fortunately, when the church was reseated, enough wood remained over. The balusters were decorated with emblems of the four evangelists. "'I've had the stove lighted as I thought you'd be cold after your journey,' said Mrs. Carey. It was a large black stove that stood in the hall and was only lighted if the weather was very bad and the vicar had a cold. It was not lighted if Mrs. Carey had a cold. Coal was expensive. Besides, Mary Ann, the maid, didn't like fires all over the place. If they wanted all them fires they must keep a second girl. In the winter Mr. and Mrs. Carey lived in the dining-room so that one fire should do and in the summer they could not get out of the habit, so the drawing-room was used only by Mr. Carey on Sunday afternoons for his nap. But every Saturday he had a fire in the study, so that he could write his sermon. Aunt Louisa took Philip upstairs and showed him into a tiny bedroom that looked out on the drive. Immediately in front of the window was a large tree, which Philip remembered now because the branches were so low that it was possible to climb quite high up it. A small room for a small boy said Mrs. Carey. "'You won't be frightened at sleeping alone?' "'Oh, no.' On his first visit to the vicarage he had come with his nurse, and Mrs. Carey had had little to do with him. She looked at him now with some uncertainty. "'Can you wash your own hands, or shall I wash them for you?' "'I can wash myself,' he answered firmly. "'Well, I shall look at them when you come down to tea,' said Mrs. Carey. She knew nothing about children.' After it was settled that Philip should come down to Blackstable, Mrs. Carey had thought much how she should treat him. She was anxious to do her duty, but now he was there she found herself just as shy of him as he was of her. She hoped he would not be noisy and rough, because her husband did not like rough and noisy boys. Mrs. Carey made an excuse to leave Philip alone, but in a moment came back and knocked at the door. She asked him, without coming in, if he could pour out the water himself. Then she went downstairs and rang the bell for tea. The dining-room, large and well-proportioned, had windows on two sides of it, with heavy curtains of red rep. There was a big table in the middle, and at one end an imposing mahogany sideboard with a looking-glass in it. In one corner stood a harmonium. On each side of the fireplace were chairs covered in stamped leather, each with an antimacassar. One had arms and was called the husband, and the other had none and was called the wife. Mrs. Carey never sat in the armchair. She said she preferred a chair that was not too comfortable. There was always lots to do, and if her chair had had arms she might not be so ready to leave it. Mr. Carey was making up the fire when Philip came in, and he pointed out to his nephew that there were two pokers. One was large and bright and polished and unused and was called the vicar, and the other, which was much smaller and had evidently passed through many fires, was called the curate. "'What are we waiting for?' said Mr. Carey. "'I told Mary Ann to make you an egg. I thought you'd be hungry after your journey.' Mrs. Carey thought the journey from London to Black Sable very tiring. She seldom travelled herself, for the living was only three hundred a year, and when her husband wanted a holiday, since there was not money for two, he went by himself. 
He was very fond of church congresses and usually managed to go up to London once a year, and once he had been to Paris for the exhibition and two or three times to Switzerland. Marianne brought in the egg and they sat down. The chair was much too low for Philip, and for a moment neither Mr. Carey nor his wife knew what to do. "'I'll put some books under him,' said Marianne. She took from the top of the harmonium the large Bible and the prayer book from which the vicar was accustomed to read prayers, and put them on Philip's chair. "'Oh, William, he can't sit on the Bible,' said Mrs. Carey in a shocked tone. "'Can't you get him some books out of the study?' Mr. Carey considered the question for an instant. "'I don't think it matters this once if you put the prayer book on the top, Marianne,' he said. "'The Book of Common Prayer is the composition of men like ourselves. It has no claim to divine authorship.' "'I hadn't thought of that, William,' said Aunt Louisa. Philip perched himself on the books, and the vicar, having said grace, cut the top off his egg. "'There,' he said, handing it to Philip, "'you can eat my top if you like.' Philip would have liked an egg to himself, but he was not offered one, so took what he could. "'How have the chickens been laying since I went away?' asked the vicar. "'Oh, they've been dreadful, only one or two a day.' "'How do you like that top, Philip?' asked his uncle. "'Very much, thank you. You shall have another on Sunday afternoon.' Mr. Carey always had a boiled egg at tea on Sunday, so that he might be fortified for the evening service. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 Philip came gradually to know the people he was to live with, and by fragments of conversation, some of it not meant for his ears, learned a good deal both about himself and about his dead parents. Philip's father had been much younger than the vicar of Blackstable. After a brilliant career at St. Luke's Hospital, he was put on the staff and presently began to earn money in considerable sums. He spent it freely. When the parson set about restoring his church and asked his brother for a subscription, he was surprised by receiving a couple of hundred pounds. Mr. Carey, thrifty by inclination and economical by necessity, accepted it with mingled feelings. He was envious of his brother because he could afford to give so much, pleased for the sake of his church, and vaguely irritated by a generosity which seemed almost ostentatious. Then Henry Carey married a patient a beautiful girl but penniless, an orphan with no near relations, but of good family, and there was an array of fine friends at the wedding. The parson on his visits to her, when he came to London, held himself with reserve. He felt shy with her, and in his heart he resented her great beauty. She dressed more magnificently than became the wife of a hard-working surgeon, and the charming furniture of her house, the flowers among which she lived even in winter, suggested an extravagance which he deplored. He heard her talk of entertainments she was going to, and, as he told his wife on getting home again, it was impossible to accept hospitality without making some return. He had seen grapes in the dining-room that must have cost at least eight shillings a pound, and at luncheon he had been given asparagus two months before it was ready in the vicarage garden. Now all he had anticipated was come to pass. The vicar felt the satisfaction of the prophet who saw fire and brimstone consume the city which would not mend its way to his warning. Poor Philip was practically penniless, and what was the good of his mother's fine friends now? He heard that his father's extravagance was really criminal, and it was a mercy that Providence had seen fit to take his dear mother to itself. She had no more idea of money than a child." When Philip had been a week at Blackstable, an incident happened which seemed to irritate his uncle very much. One morning he found on the breakfast-table a small packet which had been sent on by post from the late Mrs. Carey's house in London. It was addressed to her. When the parson opened it he found a dozen photographs of Mrs. Carey. They showed the head and shoulders only, and her hair was more plainly done than usual, low on the forehead which gave her an unusual look. The face was thin and worn, but no illness could impair the beauty of her features. There was in the large dark eyes a sadness which Philip did not remember. The first sight of the dead woman gave Mr. Carey a little shock, 
but this was quickly followed by perplexity. The photographs seemed quite recent, and he could not imagine who had ordered them. "'Do you know anything about these, Philip?' he asked. "'I remember Mamma said she'd been taken,' he answered. Miss Watkins scolded her. She said, "'I wanted the boy to have something to remember me by when he grows up.' Mr. Carey looked at Philip for an instant. The child spoke in a clear treble. He recalled the words, but they meant nothing to him. "'You'd better take one of the photographs and keep it in your room,' said Mr. Carey. "'I'll put the others away.' He sent one to Miss Watkin, and she wrote and explained how they came to be taken. One day Mrs. Carey was lying in bed, but she was feeling a little better than usual, and the doctor in the morning had seemed hopeful. Emma had taken the child out, and the maids were downstairs in the basement. Suddenly Mrs. Carey felt desperately alone in the world. A great fear seized her that she would not recover from the confinement which she was expecting in a fortnight. Her son was nine years old. How could he be expected to remember her? She could not bear to think that he would grow up and forget, forget her utterly. And she had loved him so passionately because he was weakly and deformed, and because he was her child. She had no photographs of herself taken since her marriage, and that was ten years before. She wanted her son to know what she looked like at the end. He could not forget her then, not forget utterly. She knew that if she called her maid and told her she wanted to get up, the maid would prevent her, and perhaps send for the doctor, and she had not the strength now to struggle or argue. She got out of bed and began to dress herself. She had been on her back so long that her legs gave way beneath her, and then the soles of her feet tingled so that she could hardly bear to put them to the ground. But she went on. She was unused to doing her own hair, and when she raised her arms and began to brush it she felt faint. She could never do it as her maid did. It was beautiful hair, very fine, and of a deep, rich gold. Her eyebrows were straight and dark. She put on a black skirt but chose the bodice of the evening dress which she liked best. It was of a white damask which was fashionable in those days. She looked at herself in the glass. Her face was very pale, but her skin was clear. She had never had much color, and this had always made the redness of her beautiful mouth emphatic. She could not restrain a sob. But she could not afford to be sorry for herself. She was feeling already desperately tired, and she put on the furs which Henry had given her the Christmas before. She had been so proud of them and so happy then, and slipped downstairs with beating heart. She got safely out of the house and drove to a photographer. She paid for a dozen photographs. She was obliged to ask for a glass of water in the middle of the sitting, and the assistant, seeing she was ill, suggested that she come another day, but she insisted on staying till the end. At last it was finished and she drove back again to the dingy little house in Kensington, which she hated with all her heart. It was a horrible house to die in. She found the front door open, and when she drove up the maid and Emma ran down the steps to help her. They had been frightened when they found her room empty. At first they thought she must have gone to Miss Watkin, and the cook was sent round. Miss Watkin came back with her and was waiting anxiously in the drawing-room. She came downstairs now, full of anxiety and reproaches. But the exertion had been more than Mrs. Carey was fit for, and when the occasion for firmness no longer existed, she gave way. She fell heavily into Emma's arms and was carried upstairs. She remained unconscious for a time that seemed incredibly long to those that watched her and the doctor hurriedly sent for, did not come. It was next day, when she was a little better, that Miss Watkin got some explanation out of her. Philip was playing on the floor of his mother's bedroom, and neither of the ladies paid attention to him. He only understood vaguely what they were talking about, and he could not have said why those words remained in his memory. "'I wanted the boy to have something to remember me by when he grows up. I can't make out why she ordered a dozen, said Mr. Carey. Two would have done. End of chapter 5
Chapter Six. One day was very like another at the vicarage. Soon after breakfast, Mary Ann brought in the Times. Mister Carey shared it with two neighbors. He had it from ten till one, when the gardener took it over to Mister Ellis at the Limes, with whom it remained till seven. Then it was taken to Miss Brooks at the manor house, who, since she got it late, had the advantage of keeping it. In summer, Mrs. Carey, when she was making jam, often asked for a copy to cover the pots with. When the vicar settled down to his paper, his wife put on her bonnet and went out to do the shopping. Philip accompanied her. Blackstable was a fishing village. It consisted of a high street in which there were shops, the bank, the doctor's house, and the houses of two or three coal-ship owners. Round the little harbor were shabby streets in which lived fishermen and poor people. But since they went to chapel they were of no account. When Mrs. Carey passed the descending ministers in the street she stepped over to the other side to avoid meeting them, but if there was not time for this she fixed her eyes on the pavement. It was a scandal to which the vicar had never resigned himself that there were three chapels in the high street. He could not help feeling that the law should have stepped in to prevent their erection. Shopping in Blackstable was not a simple matter, for dissent helped by the fact that the parish church was two miles from town was very common, and it was necessary to deal only with churchgoers. Mrs. Carey knew perfectly that the vicarage custom might make all the difference to a tradesman's faith. There were two butchers who went to church, and they would not understand that the vicar could not deal with both of them at once, nor were they satisfied with this simple plan of going for six months to one and for six months to the other. The butcher who was not sending meat to the vicarage constantly threatened not to come to church, and the vicar was sometimes obliged to make a threat. It was very wrong of him not to come to church, but if he carried iniquity further and actually went to chapel, then, of course, excellent as his meat was, Mrs. Carey would be forced to leave him forever. Mrs. Carey often stopped at the bank to deliver a message to Josiah Graves, the manager, who was choir-master, treasurer, and church-warden. He was a tall, thin man with a sallow face and a long nose. His hair was very white, and to Philip he seemed extremely old. He kept the parish accounts, arranged the treats for the choir and the schools. Though there was no organ in the parish church, it was generally considered, in Blackstable, that the choir he led was the best in Kent, and when there was any ceremony such as a visit from the bishop for confirmation or from the rural dean to preach at the harvest thanksgiving, he made the necessary preparations. But he had no hesitation in doing all manner of things without more than a perfunctory consultation with the vicar and the vicar, though always ready to be saved trouble, much resented the churchwarden's managing ways. He really seemed to look upon himself as the most important person in the parish. Mr. Carey constantly told his wife that if Josiah Graves did not care he would give him a good rap over the knuckles one day, but Mrs. Carey advised him to bear with Josiah Graves. He meant well, and it was not his fault if he was not quite a gentleman. The vicar, finding his comfort in the practice of a Christian virtue, exercised forbearance, but he revenged himself by calling the churchwarden Bismarck behind his back. Once there had been a serious quarrel between the pair, and Mrs. Carey still thought of that anxious time with dismay. The conservative candidate had announced his intention of addressing a meeting at Blackstable, and Josiah Graves, having arranged that it should take place in the mission hall, went to Mr. Carey and told him that he hoped he would say a few words. It appeared that the candidate had asked Josiah Graves to take the chair. This was more than Mr. Carey could put up with. He had firm views upon the respect which was due to the cloth, and it was ridiculous for a churchwarden to take the chair at a meeting when the vicar was there. He reminded Josiah Graves that parson meant person, that is, the vicar was the person of the parish. Josiah Graves answered that he was the first to recognize the dignity of the church, but this was a matter of politics, and in his turn he reminded the vicar that their blessed Savior had enjoined upon them 
to render upon Caesar the things that were Caesar's. To this Mr. Carey replied that the devil could quote scripture to his purpose, himself had sole authority over the mission hall, and if he were not asked to be chairman he would refuse the use of it for a political meeting. Josiah Graves told Mr. Carey that he might do as he chose, and for his part he thought the Wesleyan chapel would be an equally suitable place. Then Mr. Carey said that if Josiah Graves set foot in what was little better than a heathen temple, he was not fit to be churchwarden in a Christian parish. Josiah Graves thereupon resigned all his offices, and that very evening sent to the church for his cassock and surplice. His sister, Miss Graves, who kept house for him, gave up her secretaryship of the maternity club, which provided the pregnant poor with flannel, baby linen, coals, and five shillings. Mr. Carey said he was at last master in his own house. But he soon found that he was obliged to see to all sorts of things that he knew nothing about, and Josiah Graves, after the first moment of irritation, discovered that he had lost his chief interest in life. Mrs. Carey and Miss Graves were much distressed by the quarrel. They met after a discreet exchange of letters, and made up their minds to put the matter right. They talked, one to her husband, the other to her brother, from morning till night. And since they were persuading these gentlemen to do what in their hearts they wanted, after three weeks of anxiety, a reconciliation was effected. It was to both their interest, but they ascribed it to a common love for their Redeemer. The meeting was held at the mission hall, and the doctor was asked to be chairman. Mr. Carey and Josiah Graves both made speeches. When Mrs. Carey had finished her business with the banker, she generally went upstairs to have a little chat with her sister, and while the ladies talked of parish matters, the curate or the new bonnet of Mrs. Wilson, Mr. Wilson was the richest man in Blackstable, he was thought to have at least five hundred a year, and he had married his cook. Philip sat demurely in the stiff parlour, used only to receive visitors, and busied himself with the restless movements of goldfish in a bowl. The windows were never opened except to air the room for a few minutes in the morning, and it had a stuffy smell which seemed to Philip to have a mysterious connection with banking. Then Mrs. Carey remembered that she had to go to the grocer, and they continued their way. When the shopping was done they often went down a side street of little houses, mostly of wood, in which fishermen dwelt, and here and there a fisherman sat on his doorstep mending his nets and nets hung to dry upon the doors, till they came to a small beach shut in on each side by warehouses, but with a view of the sea. Mrs. Carey stood for a few minutes and looked at it. It was turbid and yellow, and who knows what thoughts passed through her mind, while Philip searched for flat stones to play ducks and drakes. Then they walked slowly back. They looked into the post office to get the right time, nodded to Mrs. Wigram, the doctor's wife, who sat at her window sewing, and so got home. Dinner was at one o'clock, and on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday it consisted of beef, roast, hashed, and minced, and on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of mutton. On Sunday they ate one of their own chickens. In the afternoon Philip did his lessons. He was taught Latin and mathematics by his uncle, who knew neither and French and the piano by his aunt. Of French she was ignorant, but she knew the piano well enough to accompany the old-fashioned song she had sung for thirty years. Uncle William used to tell Philip that when he was a curate his wife had known twelve songs by heart, which she could sing at a moment's notice whenever she was asked. She often sang still when there was a tea-party at the vicarage. There were few people whom the Carries cared to ask there and their parties consisted always of the curate, Josiah Graves with his sister, Dr. Wigram and his wife. After tea Miss Graves played one or two of Mendelssohn's songs without words, and Mrs. Carey sang When the Swallows Homeward Fly, or Trot Trot, My Pony. But the Careys did not give tea parties often. The preparations upset them, and when their guests were gone they felt themselves exhausted. They preferred to have tea by themselves, and after tea they played backgammon. 
Mrs. Carey arranged that her husband should win because he did not like losing. They had cold supper at eight. It was a scrappy meal because Mary Ann resented getting anything ready after tea, and Mrs. Carey helped to clear away. Mrs. Carey seldom ate more than bread and butter with a little stewed fruit to follow, but the vicar had a slice of cold meat. Immediately after supper Mrs. Carey rang the bell for prayers, and then Philip went to bed. He rebelled against being undressed by Mary Ann, and after a while succeeded in establishing his right to dress and undress himself. At nine o'clock Mary Ann brought in the eggs and the plate. Mrs. Carey wrote the date on each egg and put the number down in a book. She then took the plate basket on her arm and went upstairs. Mr. Carey continued to read one of his old books, but as the clock struck ten he got up, put out the lamps, and followed his wife to bed. When Philip arrived there was some difficulty in deciding on which evening he should have his bath. It was never easy to get plenty of hot water since the kitchen boiler did not work, and it was impossible for two persons to have a bath on the same day. The only man who had a bathroom in Blackstable was Mr. Wilson, and it was thought ostentatious of him. Mary Ann had her bath in the kitchen on Monday night, because she liked to begin the week clean. Uncle William could not have his on Saturday, because he had a very heavy day before him, and he was always a little tired after a bath, so he had it on Friday. Mrs. Carey had hers on Thursday for the same reason. It looked as though Saturday were naturally indicated for Philip, but Mary Ann said she couldn't keep the fire up on Saturday night, what with all the cooking on Sunday, having to make pastry, and she didn't know what all, she did not feel up to giving the boy his bath on Saturday night, and it was quite clear that he could not bathe himself. Mrs. Carey was shy about bathing a boy, and of course the vicar had his sermon, but the vicar insisted that Philip should be clean and sweet for the Lord's day. Mary Ann said she would rather go than be put upon, and after eighteen years she didn't expect to have more work given her, and they might show some consideration, and Philip said he didn't want anyone to bathe him, but could very well bathe himself. This settled it. Mary Ann said she was quite sure he wouldn't bathe himself properly, and rather than he should go dirty, and not because he was going into the presence of the Lord, but because she couldn't abide a boy who wasn't properly washed, she'd work herself to the bone, even if it was Saturday night. End of chapter 6 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapter seven through twelve of Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter seven. Sunday was a day crowded with incident. Mr. Carey was accustomed to say that he was the only man in his parish who worked seven days a week. The household got up half an hour earlier than usual. No lying abed for a poor parson on the day of rest, Mr. Carey remarked as Mary Ann knocked at the door punctually at eight. It took Mrs. Carey longer to dress, and she got down to breakfast at nine, a little breathless, only just before her husband. Mr. Carey's boots stood in front of the fire to warm. Prayers were longer than usual, and the breakfast more substantial. After breakfast the vicar cut thin slices of bread for the communion, and Philip was privileged to cut off the crust. He was sent to the study to fetch a marble paperweight with which Mr. Carey pressed the bread till it was thin and pulpy, and that it was cut into small squares. The amount was regulated by the weather. On a very bad day few people came to church, and on a very fine one, though many came, few stayed for communion. There were most when it was dry enough to make the walk to church pleasant, but not so fine that people wanted to hurry away. Then Mrs. Carey brought the communion plate out of the safe which stood in the pantry, and the vicar polished it with a chamois leather. At ten the fly drove up, and Mr. Carey got into his boots. 
Mrs. Carey took several minutes to put on her bonnet, during which the vicar, in a voluminous cloak, stood in the hall with just such an expression on his face as would have become an early Christian about to be led into the arena. It was extraordinary that after thirty years of marriage his wife could not be ready in time on Sunday morning. At last she came in black satin. The vicar did not like colors in a clergyman's wife at any time, but on Sundays he was determined that she should wear black. Now and then in conspiracy with Miss Graves she ventured a white feather or a pink rose in her bonnet, but the vicar insisted that it should disappear. He said he would not go to church with a scarlet woman. Mrs. Carey sighed as a woman, but obeyed as a wife. They were about to step into the carriage when the vicar remembered that no one had given him his egg. They knew that he must have an egg for his voice. There were two women in the house, and no one had the least regard for his comfort. Mrs. Carey scolded Mary Ann, and Mary Ann answered that she could not think of everything. She hurried away to fetch an egg, and Mrs. Carey beat it up in a glass of sherry. The vicar swallowed it at a gulp. The communion plate was stowed in the carriage, and they set off. The fly came from the Red Lion and had a peculiar smell of stale straw. They drove with both windows closed so that the vicar should not catch cold. The sexton was waiting at the porch to take the communion plate, and while the vicar went to the vestry Mrs. Carey and Philip settled themselves in the vicarage pew. Mrs. Carey placed in front of her the sixpenny bit she was accustomed to put in the plate and gave Philip threepence for the same purpose. The church filled up gradually, and the service began. Philip grew bored during the sermon, but if he fidgeted Mrs. Carey put a gentle hand on his arm and looked at him reproachfully. He regained interest when the final hymn was sung and Mr. Graves passed round with the plate. When everyone had gone Mrs. Carey went into Miss Graves' pew to have a few words with her while they were sitting for the gentleman and Philip went to the vestry. His uncle, the curate, and Mr. Graves were still in their surplices. Mr. Carey gave him the remains of the consecrated bread and told him he might eat it. He had been accustomed to eat it himself, as it seemed blasphemous to throw it away, but Philip's keen appetite relieved him from the duty. Then they counted the money. It consisted of pennies, sixpences, and threepenny bits. There were always two single shillings, one put in the plate by the vicar and the other by Mr. Graves, and sometimes there was a florin. Mr. Graves told the vicar who had given this. It was always a stranger to Blackstable, and Mr. Carey wondered who he was. But Miss Graves had observed the rash act and was able to tell Mrs. Carey that the stranger came from London, was married, and had children. During the drive home Mrs. Carey passed the information on, and the vicar made up his mind to call on him and ask for a subscription to the additional curate society. Mr. Carey asked if Philip had behaved properly, and Mrs. Carey remarked that Mrs. Wigram had a new mantle, Mr. Cox was not in church, and somebody thought that Miss Phillips was engaged. When they reached the vicarage they all felt that they deserved a substantial dinner. When this was over Mrs. Carey went to her room to rest and Mr. Carey lay down on the sofa in the drawing-room for forty winks. They had tea at five, and the vicar ate an egg to support himself for evensong. Mrs. Carey did not go to this so that Mary Ann might, but she read the service through and the hymns. Mr. Carey walked to church in the evening, and Philip limped along by his side. The walk through the darkness along the country road strangely impressed him, and the church with all its lights in the distance coming gradually nearer seemed very friendly. At first he was shy with his uncle, but little by little grew used to him, and he would slip his hand in his uncle's and walk more easily for the feeling of protection. They had supper when they got home. Mr. Carey's slippers were waiting for him on a footstool in front of the fire, and by their side Phillips, one the shoe of a small boy, the other misshapen and odd. He was dreadfully tired when he went up to bed, and he did not resist when Mary Ann undressed him. She kissed him after she tucked him up, and he began to love her. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 Philip had led always the solitary life of an only child, 
and his loneliness at the vicarage was no greater than it had been when his mother lived. He made friends with Mary Ann. She was a chubby little person of thirty-five, the daughter of a fisherman, and had come to the vicarage at eighteen. It was her first place and she had no intention of leaving it, but she held a possible marriage as a rod over the timid heads of her master and mistress. Her father and mother lived in a little house off Harbor Street, and she went to see them on her evenings out. Her stories of the sea touched Philip's imagination, and the narrow alleys round the harbor grew rich with the romance which his young fancy lent them. One evening he asked whether he might go home with her, but his aunt was afraid that he might catch something, and his uncle said that evil communications corrupted good manners. He disliked the fisher folk who were rough uncouth, and went to chapel. But Philip was more comfortable in the kitchen than in the dining-room, and whenever he could he took his toys and played there. His aunt was not sorry. She did not like disorder, and though she recognized that boys must be expected to be untidy, she preferred that he should make a mess in the kitchen. If he fidgeted his uncle was apt to grow restless and say it was high time he went to school. Mrs. Carey thought Philip very young for this, and her heart went out to the motherless child, but her attempts to gain his affection were awkward, and the boy, feeling shy, received her demonstrations with so much sullenness that she was mortified. Sometimes she heard his shrill voice raised in laughter in the kitchen, but when she went in he grew suddenly silent and he flushed darkly when Mary Ann explained the joke. Mrs. Carey could not see anything amusing in what she heard, and she smiled with constraint. "'He seems happier with Mary Ann than with us, William,' she said, when she returned to her sewing. "'One can see he's been very badly brought up. He wants licking into shape.' On the second Sunday after Philip arrived an unlucky incident occurred. Mr. Carey had retired as usual after dinner for a little snooze in the drawing-room but he was in an irritable mood and could not sleep. Josiah Graves that morning had objected strongly to some candlesticks with which the vicar had adorned the altar. He had bought them second-hand in Turkenberry, and he thought they looked very well, but Josiah Graves said they were popish. This was a taunt that always aroused the vicar. He had been at Oxford during the movement which ended in the secession from the established church of Edward Manning, and he felt a certain sympathy for the Church of Rome. He would willingly have made the service more ornate than had been usual in the low church parish of Blackstable, and in his secret soul he yearned for possessions and lighted candles. He drew the line at incense. He hated the word Protestant. He called himself a Catholic. He was accustomed to say that Papists required an epithet. They were Roman Catholic, but the Church of England was Catholic in the best, the fullest, and the noblest sense of the term. He was pleased to think that his shaven face gave him the look of a priest, and in his youth he had possessed an aesthetic air which added to the impression. He often related that on one of his holidays in Boulogne, one of those holidays upon which his wife, for economy's sake, did not accompany him, when he was sitting in a church, the curé had come up to him and invited him to preach a sermon. He dismissed his curates when they married, having decided views on the celibacy of the unbeneficed clergy. But when at an election the liberals had written on his garden fence in large blue letters, This Way to Rome, he had been very angry, and threatened to prosecute the leaders of the liberal party in Blackstable. He made up his mind now that nothing Josiah Graves said would induce him to remove the candlesticks from the altar, and he muttered Bismarck to himself once or twice irritably. Suddenly he heard an unexpected noise. He pulled the handkerchief off his face, got up from the sofa on which he was lying, and went into the dining-room. Philip was seated on the table with all his bricks around him. He had built a monstrous castle, and some defect in the foundation had just brought the structure down in noisy ruin. "'What are you doing with those bricks, Philip? You know you're not allowed to play games on Sunday.' Philip stared at him for a moment with frightened eyes and, as his habit was, flushed deeply. "'I always used to play at home,' he answered. "'I'm sure your dear mamma never allowed you to do such a wicked thing as that.' Philip did not know it was wicked, but, if it was, he did not wish it to be supposed that his mother had consented to it. He hung his head and did not answer. 
Don't you know it's very, very wicked to play on Sunday? What do you suppose it's called the day of rest for? You're going to church tonight, and how can you face your maker when you've been breaking one of his laws in the afternoon? Mr. Carey told him to put the bricks away at once, and stood over him while Philip did so. "'You're a very naughty boy,' he repeated. "'Think of the grief you're causing your poor mother in heaven.' Philip felt inclined to cry, but he had an instinctive disinclination to letting other people see his tears, and he clenched his teeth to prevent the sobs from escaping. Mr. Carey sat down in his armchair and began to turn over the pages of a book. Philip stood at the window. The vicarage was set back from the high road to Turcanbury, and from the dining-room one saw a semicircular strip of lawn, and then as far as the horizon green fields. Sheep were grazing in them. The sky was forlorn and gray. Philip felt infinitely unhappy. Presently Mary Ann came in to lay the tea, and Aunt Louisa descended the stairs. "'Have you had a nice little nap, William?' she asked. "'No,' he answered. "'Philip made so much noise that I couldn't sleep a wink.' This was not quite accurate, for he had been kept awake by his own thoughts, and Philip, listening sullenly, reflected that he had only made a noise once, and there was no reason why his uncle should not have slept before or after. When Mrs. Carey asked for an explanation, the vicar narrated the facts. "'He hasn't even said he was sorry,' he finished. "'Oh, Philip, I'm sure you're sorry,' said Mrs. Carey, anxious that the child should not seem wickeder to his uncle than need be. Philip did not reply. He went on munching his bread and butter. He did not know what power it was in him that prevented him from making any expression of regret. He felt his ears tingling. He was a little inclined to cry. But no word would issue from his lips. "'You needn't make it worse by sulking,' said Mr. Carey. Tea was finished in silence. Mr. Carey looked at Philip surreptitiously now and then, but the vicar elaborately ignored him. When Philip saw his uncle go upstairs to get ready for church, he went into the hall and got his hat and coat, but when the vicar came downstairs and saw him he said, "'I don't wish you to go to church tonight, Philip. I don't think you're in a proper frame of mind to enter the house of God.' Philip did not say a word. He felt it was a deep humiliation that was placed upon him, and his cheeks reddened. He stood silently, watching his uncle put on his broad hat and his voluminous cloak. Mrs. Carey, as usual, went to the door to see him off. Then she turned to Philip. "'Never mind, Philip. You won't be a naughty boy next Sunday, will you? And then your uncle will take you to church with him in the evening.' She took off his coat and hat and led him into the dining-room. "'Shall you and I read the service together, Philip, and we'll sing the hymns at the harmonium? Would you like that?' Philip shook his head decidedly. Mrs. Carey was taken aback. If he would not read the evening service with her, she did not know what to do with him. "'Then what would you like to do until your uncle comes back?' she asked helplessly. Philip broke his silence at last. "'I want to be left alone,' he said. "'Philip, how can you say anything so unkind? Don't you know that your uncle and I only want your good? Don't you love me at all? I hate you. I wish you was dead.' Mrs. Carey gasped. He said the words so savagely that it gave her quite a start. She had nothing to say. She sat down in her husband's chair, and as she thought of her desire to love the friendless crippled boy, and her eager wish that he should love her, she was a barren woman, and even though it was clearly God's will that she should be childless, she could scarcely bear to look at little children sometimes. Her heart ached so. The tears rose to her eyes, and one by one slowly rolled down her cheeks. Philip watched in amazement. She took out her handkerchief and now she cried without restraint. Suddenly Philip realized that she was crying because of what he had said, and he was sorry. He went up to her silently and kissed her. It was the first kiss he had ever given her without being asked. And the poor lady, so small in her black satin, shriveled up and sallow, with her funny corkscrew curls, took the little boy on her lap and put her arms around him and wept as though her heart would break but her tears were partly tears of happiness, for she felt that the strangeness between them was gone. 
she loved him now with a new love because he had made her suffer. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 on the following Sunday, when the vicar was making his preparations to go into the drawing-room for his nap, all the actions of his life were conducted with ceremony, and Mrs. Carey was about to go upstairs, Philip asked, "'What shall I do if I'm not allowed to play?' "'Can't you sit still for once and be quiet?' "'I can't sit still till tea-time.' Mr. Carey looked out the window, but it was cold and raw, and he could not suggest that Philip should go out into the garden. "'I know what you can do.' you can learn by heart the collect for the day. He took the prayer-book which was used for prayers from the harmonium, and turned the pages till he came to the place he wanted. It's not a long one. If you can say it without a mistake when I come in to tea, you shall have the top of my egg. Mrs. Carey drew up Philip's chair to the dining-room table. They had bought him a high chair by now, and placed the book in front of him. The devil finds work for idle hands to do, said Mr. Carey. He put some more coals on the fire so that there should be a cheerful blaze when he came in to tea, and went into the drawing-room. He loosened his collar, arranged the cushions, and settled himself comfortably on the sofa. But thinking the drawing-room a little chilly, Mrs. Carey brought him a rug from the hall. She put it over his legs and tucked it round his feet. She drew the blind so that the light should not offend his eyes, and since he had closed them already went out of the room on tiptoe. The vicar was at peace with himself to-day, and in ten minutes he was asleep. He snored softly. It was the sixth Sunday after Epiphany, and the collect began with the words, O God, whose blessed Son was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil, and make us the sons of God and heirs of eternal life. Philip read it through. He could make no sense of it. He began saying the words aloud to himself but many of them were unknown to him, and the construction of the sentence was strange. He could not get more than two lines in his head, and his attention was constantly wandering. There were fruit-trees trained on the walls of the vicarage, and a long twig beat now and then against the window-pane. Sheep grazed stolidly in the field beyond the garden. It seemed as though there were knots inside his brain." Then panic seized him that he would not know the words by tea-time, and he kept on whispering them to himself quickly. He did not try to understand, but merely to get them parrot-like into his memory. Mrs. Carey could not sleep that afternoon, and by four o'clock she was so wide awake that she came downstairs. She thought she would hear Philip his colic so that he should make no mistakes when he said it to his uncle. His uncle then would be pleased he would see that the boy's heart was in the right place. But when Mrs. Carey came to the dining-room and was about to go in, she heard a sound that made her stop suddenly. Her heart gave a little jump. She turned away and quietly slipped out of the front door. She walked round the house till she came to the dining-room window, and then cautiously looked in. Philip was still sitting on the chair she had put him in, but his head was on the table, buried in his arms, and he was sobbing desperately. She saw the convulsive movement of his shoulders. Mrs. Carey was frightened. A thing that had always struck her about the child was that he seemed so collected. She had never seen him cry, and now she realized that his calmness was some instinctive shame of showing his feelings. He hid himself to weep. Without thinking that her husband disliked being wakened suddenly, she burst into the drawing-room. "'William, William,' she said, "'the boy's crying as though his heart will break.' Mr. Carey sat up and disentangled himself from the rug about his legs. "'What's he got to cry about?' "'I don't know. Oh, William, we can't let the boy be unhappy. Do you think it's our fault? If we'd had children we'd have known what to do.' Mr. Carey looked at her in perplexity. He felt extraordinarily helpless. "'He can't be crying because I gave him the colic to learn.' It's not more than ten lines. Don't you think I might take him some picture-books to look at, William? There are some of the Holy Land. There couldn't be anything wrong in that. Very well. I don't mind. Mrs. Carey went into the study. To collect books was Mr. Carey's only passion, and he never went into Turcanbury without spending an hour or two in the second-hand shop. He always brought back four or five musty volumes. He never read them, for he had long lost the habit of reading, 
but he liked to turn the pages, look at the illustrations if they were illustrated, and mend the bindings. He welcomed wet days because on them he could stay at home without pangs of conscience and spend the afternoon with white of egg and a glue pot, patching up the Russia leather of some battered quarto. He had many volumes of old travels with steel engravings, and Mrs. Carey quickly found two which described Palestine. She coughed elaborately at the door so that Philip should have time to compose himself. She felt that he would be humiliated if she came upon him in the midst of his tears. Then she rattled the door handle. When she went in, Philip was poring over the prayer book, hiding his eyes with his hands so that she might not see he had been crying. "'Do you know the collect yet?' she said. He did not answer for a moment, and she felt that he did not trust his voice. She was oddly embarrassed. "'I can't learn it by heart,' he said at last with a gasp. "'Oh, well, never mind,' she said. "'You needn't. I've got some picture books for you to look at. Come and sit on my lap and we'll look at them together.' Philip slipped off his chair and limped over to her. He looked down so that she should not see his eyes. She put her arms round him. "'Look,' she said, "'that's the place where our blessed Lord was born.' She showed him an eastern town with flat roofs and cupolas and minarets. In the foreground was a group of palm trees, and under them were resting two Arabs and some camels. Philip passed his hands over the picture as if he wanted to feel the houses and the loose habiliments of the nomads. "'Read what it says,' he asked. Mrs. Carey, in her even voice, read the opposite page. It was a romantic narrative of some eastern traveller of the thirties, pompous maybe, but fragrant with the emotion with which the East came to the generation that followed Byron and Chateaubriand. In a moment or two Philip interrupted her. "'I want to see another picture.' When Mary Ann came in and Mrs. Carey rose to help her lay the cloth, Philip took the book in his hands and hurried through the illustrations. It was with difficulty that his aunt induced him to put the book down for tea. He had forgotten his horrible struggle to get the collect by heart. He had forgotten his tears. Next day it was raining, and he asked for the book again. Mrs. Carey gave it to him joyfully. Talking over his future with her husband, she had found that both desired him to take orders, and this eagerness for the book which described places hallowed by the presence of Jesus seemed a good sign. It looked as though the boy's mind addressed itself naturally to holy things, but in a day or two he asked for more books. Mr. Carey took him into his study, showed him the shelf in which he kept illustrated works, and chose for him one that dealt with Rome. Philip took it greedily. The pictures led him to a new amusement. He began to read the page before and the page after each engraving to find out what it was about, and soon he lost all interest in his toys. Then, when no one was near, he took out books for himself, and perhaps because the first impression on his mind was made by an eastern town he found his chief amusement in those which described the Levant. His heart beat with the excitement at the pictures of mosques and rich palaces, but there was one in a book on Constantinople which peculiarly stirred his imagination. It was called The Hall of the Thousand Columns. It was a Byzantine cistern which the popular fancy had endowed with fantastic vastness, and the legend which he read told that a boat was always moored at the entrance to tempt the unwary, but no traveller venturing into the darkness had ever been seen again. And Philip wondered whether the boat went on for ever through one pillared alley after another, or came at last to some strange mansion. One day a good fortune befell him, for he hit upon Lane's translation of The Thousand Nights and a Night. He was captured first by the illustrations, and then he began to read, to start with, the stories that dealt with magic, and then the others and those he liked he read again and again. He could think of nothing else. He forgot the life about him. He had to be called two or three times before he would come to his dinner. Insensibly he formed the most delightful habit in the world, the habit of reading. He did not know that thus he was providing himself with a refuge from all the distress of life. He did not know either that he was creating for himself an unreal world which would make the real world of every day a source of bitter disappointment. 
presently he began to read other things. His brain was precocious. His aunt and uncle, seeing that he occupied himself and neither worried nor made a sound, ceased to trouble themselves about him. Mr. Carey had so many books that he did not know them, and as he read little he forgot the odd lots he had bought at one time and another because they were cheap. Haphazard among the sermons and homilies, the travels, the lives of the saints, the fathers, the histories of the church, were old-fashioned novels, and these Philip at last discovered. He chose them by their titles, and the first he read was The Lancashire Witches, and then he read The Admirable Crichton, and then many more. Whenever he started a book with two solitary travelers riding along the brink of a desperate ravine, he knew he was safe. The summer was come now, and the gardener and old sailor made him a hammock and fixed it up for him the branches of a weeping willow, and here for long hours he lay, hidden from anyone who might come to the vicarage, reading, reading passionately. Time passed, and it was July. August came. On Sundays the church was crowded with strangers, and the collection at the operatory often amounted to two pounds. Neither the vicar nor Mrs. Carey went out of the garden much during this period, for they disliked strange faces and they looked upon the visitors from London with aversion. The house opposite was taken for six weeks by a gentleman who had two little boys, and he sent in to ask if Philip would like to go and play with them, but Mrs. Carey returned a polite refusal. She was afraid that Philip would be corrupted by little boys from London. He was going to be a clergyman and it was necessary that he should be preserved from contamination. She liked to see in him an infant Samuel. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Careys made up their mind to send Philip to King's School at Turcanbury. The neighboring clergy sent their sons there. It was united by long tradition to the cathedral. Its headmaster was an honorary canon, and a past headmaster was the archdeacon, boys were encouraged there to aspire to holy orders, and the education was such as might prepare an honest lad to spend his life in God's service. A preparatory school was attached to it, and to this it was arranged that Philip should go. Mr. Carey took him into Turcanbury one Thursday afternoon towards the end of September. All day Philip had been excited and rather frightened. He knew little of school life but what he had read in the stories of the boy's own paper. He had also read Eric, or Little by Little. When they got out of the train at Turcanbury, Philip felt sick with apprehension, and during the drive into the town sat pale and silent. The high brick wall in front of the school gave it the look of a prison. There was a little door in it which opened on their ringing, and a clumsy untidy man came out and fetched Philip's tin trunk and his play-box. They were shown into the drawing-room. It was filled with massive, ugly furniture, and the chairs of the suite were placed round the walls with a forbidding rigidity. They waited for the headmaster. "'What's Mr. Watson like?' asked Philip after a while. "'You'll see for yourself.' There was another pause. Mr. Carey wondered why the headmaster did not come. Presently Philip made an effort and spoke again. "'Tell him I've got a club foot,' he said. Before Mr. Carey could speak the door burst open and Mr. Watson swept into the room. To Philip he seemed gigantic. He was a man of over six feet high and broad with enormous hands and a great red beard. He talked loudly in a jovial manner, but his aggressive cheerfulness struck terror in Philip's heart. He shook hands with Mr. Carey and then took Philip's small hand in his. "'Well, young fellow, are you glad to come to school?' he shouted. Philip reddened and found no word to answer. "'How old are you?' Nine, said Philip. "'You must say, sir,' said his uncle. "'I expect you've got a good lot to learn,' the headmaster bellowed cheerily. To give the boy confidence he began to tickle him with rough fingers. Philip, feeling shy and uncomfortable, squirmed under his touch. "'I put him in the small dormitory for the present. You'll like that, won't you?' he added to Philip. "'Only eight of you in there. You won't feel so strange. Then the door opened and Mrs. Watson came in. She was a dark woman with black hair, neatly parted in the middle. She had curiously thick lips and a small round nose. Her eyes were large and black. 
there was a singular coldness in her appearance. She seldom spoke and smiled more seldom still. Her husband introduced Mr. Carey to her and then gave Philip a friendly push towards her. "'This is a new boy, Helen. His name's Carey.' Without a word she shook hands with Philip and then sat down, not speaking, while the headmaster asked Mr. Carey how much Philip knew and what books he had been working with. The vicar of Blackstable was a little embarrassed by Mr. Watson's boisterous heartiness, and in a moment or two got up. "'I think I'd better leave Philip with you now.' "'That's all right,' said Mr. Watson. "'He'll be safe with me. He'll get on like a house on fire. Won't you, young fellow?' Without waiting for an answer from Philip, the big man burst into a great bellow of laughter. Mr. Carey kissed Philip on the forehead and went away. "'Come along, young fellow!' shouted Mr. Watson. I'll show you the schoolroom. He swept out of the drawing-room with giant strides, and Philip hurriedly limped along behind him. He was taken into a long bare room with two tables that ran along its whole length. On each side of them were wooden forms. Nobody much here yet, said Mr. Watson. I'll just show you the playground, and then I'll leave you to shift for yourself. Mr. Watson led the way. Philip found himself in a large playground with high brick walls on three sides of it. On the fourth side was an iron railing through which you saw a vast lawn, and beyond this some of the buildings of King's School. One small boy was wandering disconsolately, kicking up the gravel as he walked. "'Hello, Venning!' shouted Mr. Watson. "'When did you turn up?' The small boy came forward and shook hands. "'Here's a new boy. He's older and bigger than you, so don't you bully him.' The headmaster glared amicably at the two children, filling them with fear by the roar of his voice, and then, with a guffaw, left them. "'What's your name?' "'Carrie.' "'What's your father?' "'He's dead.' "'Oh. Does your mother wash?' "'My mother's dead, too.' Philip thought this answer would cause the boy a certain awkwardness, but Benning was not to be turned from his facetiousness for so little. "'Well, did she wash?' he went on. "'Yes,' said Philip indignantly. "'She was a washerwoman then.' "'No, she wasn't. Then she didn't wash.' The little boy crowed with delight at the success of his dialectic. Then he caught sight of Philip's feet. "'What's the matter with your foot?' Philip instinctively tried to withdraw it from sight. He hid it behind the one which was whole. "'I've got a club foot,' he answered. "'How did you get it?' "'I've always had it. Let's have a look.' "'No. Don't, then.' The little boy accompanied the words with a sharp kick on Philip's shin, which Philip did not expect, and thus could not guard against. The pain was so great that it made him gasp, but greater than the pain was the surprise. He did not know why Benning kicked him. He had not the presence of mind to give him a black eye. Besides, the boy was smaller than he, and he had read in the boy's own paper that it was a mean thing to hit anyone smaller than yourself. While Philip was nursing his shin, a third boy appeared, and his tormentor left him. In a little while he noticed that the pair were talking about him, and he felt they were looking at his feet. He grew hot and uncomfortable. But others arrived, a dozen together, and then more, and they began to talk about their doings during the holidays, where they had been, and what wonderful cricket they had played. A few new boys appeared, and with these presently Philip found himself talking. He was shy and nervous. He was anxious to make himself pleasant, but he could not think of anything to say. He was asked a great many questions and answered them all quite willingly. One boy asked him whether he could play cricket. No, answered Philip, I've got a club foot. The boy looked down quickly and reddened. Philip saw that he felt he had asked an unseemly question. He was too shy to apologize and looked at Philip awkwardly. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 Next morning, when the clanging of a bell awoke Philip, he looked round his cubicle in astonishment. Then a voice sang out, and he remembered where he was. "'Are you awake, singer?' The partitions of the cubicle were of polished pitch pine, and there was a great curtain in front. In those days there was little thought of ventilation, and the windows were closed except when the dormitory was aired in the morning. Philip got up and knelt down to say his prayers. It was a cold morning and he shivered a little, but he had been taught by his uncle that his prayers were more acceptable to God if he said them in his nightshirt than if he waited 
till he was dressed. This did not surprise him, for he was beginning to realize that he was the creature of a god who appreciated the discomfort of his worshippers. Then he washed. There were two baths for the fifty boarders, and each boy had a bath once a week. The rest of the washing was done in a small basin on a washstand, which with the bed and the chair made up the furniture of each cubicle. The boys chatted gaily while they dressed. Philip was all ears. Then another bell sounded and they ran downstairs. They took their seats on the forms on each side of the two long tables in the schoolroom, and Mr. Watson, followed by his wife and the servants, came in and sat down. Mr. Watson read prayers in an impressive manner, and the supplications thundered out in his loud voice as though they were threats personally addressed to each boy. Philip listened with anxiety. Then Mr. Watson read a chapter from the Bible, and the servants trooped out. In a moment the untidy youth brought in two large pots of tea, and on a second journey immense dishes of bread and butter. Philip had a squeamish appetite, and the thick slabs of poor butter on the bread turned his stomach, but he saw other boys scraping it off and followed their example. They all had potted meats and such like, which they had brought in their play boxes, and some had extras, eggs or bacon, upon which Mr. Watson made a profit. When he had asked Mr. Carey whether Philip was to have these, Mr. Carey replied that he did not think boys should be spoiled. Mr. Watson quite agreed with him. He considered nothing was better than bread and butter for growing lads, but some parents unduly pampering their offspring insisted on it. Philip noticed that extras gave boys a certain consideration and made up his mind when he wrote to Aunt Louisa to ask for them. After breakfast the boys wandered out into the playground. Here the day boys were gradually assembling. They were sons of the local clergy, of the officers at the depot, and of such manufacturers or men of business as the old town possessed. Presently a bell rang, and they all trooped into school. This consisted of a large, long room at opposite ends of which two undermasters conducted the second and third forms, and of a smaller one leading out of it, used by Mr. Watson, who taught the first form. To attach the preparatory to the senior school, these three classes were known officially, on speech days and in reports, as upper, middle, and lower second. Philip was put in the last. The master, a red-faced man with a pleasant voice, was called Rice. He had a jolly manner with boys, and the time passed quickly. Philip was surprised when it was a quarter to eleven, and they were let out for ten minutes' rest. The whole school rushed noisily into the playground. The new boys were told to go into the middle, while the others stationed themselves along opposite walls. They began to play pig in the middle. The old boys ran from wall to wall while the new boys tried to catch them. When one was seized and the mystic word said, one, two, three, and a pig for me, he became a prisoner, and turning sides helped to catch those who were still free. Philip saw a boy running past and tried to catch him, but his limp gave him no chance, and the runners taking their opportunity made straight for the ground he covered. Then one of them had the brilliant idea of imitating Philip's clumsy run. Other boys saw it and began to laugh. Then they all copied the first, and they ran round Philip, limping grotesquely, screaming in their treble voices with shrill laughter. They lost their heads with the delight of their new amusement, and choked with helpless merriment. One of them tripped Philip up, and he fell, heavily as he always fell, and cut his knee. They laughed all the louder when he got up. A boy pushed him from behind, and he would have fallen again if another had not caught him. The game was forgotten in the entertainment of Philip's deformity. One of them invented an odd rolling limp that struck the rest as supremely ridiculous, and several of the boys lay down on the ground and rolled about in laughter. Philip was completely scared. He could not make out why they were laughing at him. His heart beat so that he could hardly breathe, and he was more frightened than he had ever been in his life. He stood still stupidly while the boys ran round him, mimicking and laughing. They shouted to him to try and catch them, but he did not move. He did not want them to see him run any more. He was using all his strength to prevent himself from crying. 
Suddenly the bell rang, and they all trooped back to school. Philip's knee was bleeding, and he was dusty and disheveled. For some minutes Mr. Rice could not control his form. They were excited still by the strange novelty, and Philip saw one or two of them furtively looking down at his feet. He tucked them under the bench. In the afternoon they went up to play football, but Mr. Watson stopped Philip on the way out after dinner. "'I suppose you can't play football, Carrie?' he asked him. Philip blushed self-consciously. "'No, sir.' "'Very well. You'd better go up to the field. You can walk as far as that, can't you?' Philip had no idea where the field was, but he answered all the same. "'Yes, sir.' The boys went in charge of Mr. Rice, who glanced at Philip, and seeing he had not changed, asked why he was not going to play. "'Mr. Watson said I needn't, sir,' said Philip. "'Why?' There were boys all round him, looking at him curiously, and a feeling of shame came over Philip. He looked down without answering. Others gave the reply. "'He's got a club foot, sir.' "'Oh, I see. Mr. Rice was quite young. He had only taken his degree a year before, and he was suddenly embarrassed. His instinct was to beg the boy's pardon, but he was too shy to do so. He made his voice gruff and loud. "'Now then, you boys, what are you waiting about for? Get on with you.' Some of them had already started, and those that were left now set off in groups of two or three. "'You'd better come along with me, Carrie,' said the master. "'You don't know the way, do you?' Philip guessed the kindness, and a sob came to his throat. "'I can't go very fast, sir.' "'Then I'll go very slow,' said the master with a smile. Philip's heart went out to the red-faced, commonplace young man who said a gentle word to him. He suddenly felt less unhappy. But at night, when they went up to bed and were undressing, the boy who was called Singer came out of his cubicle and put his head in Philip's. "'I say, let's look at your foot,' he said. No answered Philip. He jumped into bed quickly. "'Don't say no to me,' said Singer. "'Come on, Mason.' The boy in the next cubicle was looking round the corner, and at the words he slipped in. They made for Philip and tried to tear the bedclothes off him, but he held them tightly. "'Why can't you leave me alone?' he cried. Singer seized a brush, and with the back of it beat Philip's hands clenched on the blanket. Philip cried out, "'Why don't you show us your foot quietly? I won't. In desperation Philip clenched his fist and hit the boy who tormented him, but he was at a disadvantage, and the boy seized his arm. He began to turn it. "'Oh, don't, don't,' said Philip. "'You'll break my arm.' "'Stop still, then, and put out your foot.' Philip gave a sob and a gasp. The boy gave the arm another wrench. The pain was unendurable. "'All right, I'll do it,' said Philip. He put out his foot. Singer still kept his hand on Philip's wrist. He looked curiously at the deformity. "'Isn't it beastly?' said Mason. Another came in and looked, too. "'Ugh!' he said in disgust. "'My word, it is rum,' said Singer, making a face. "'Is it hard?' He touched it with the tip of his forefinger, cautiously, as though it were something that had a life of its own. Suddenly they heard Mr. Watson's heavy tread on the stairs. They threw the clothes back on Philip and dashed like rabbits into their cubicles. Mr. Watson came into the dormitory. Raising himself on tiptoe, he could see over the rod that bore the green curtain, and he looked into two or three of the cubicles. The little boys were safely in bed. He put out the light and went out. Singer called out to Philip, but he did not answer. He had got his teeth in the pillow so that his sobbing should be inaudible. He was not crying for the pain they had caused him, nor for the humiliation he had suffered when they looked at his foot, but with rage at himself because, unable to stand the torture, he had put out his foot of his own accord. And then he felt the misery of his life. It seemed to his childish mind that this unhappiness must go on forever. For no particular reason he remembered that cold morning when Emma had taken him out of bed and put him beside his mother. He had not thought of it once since it happened, but now he seemed to feel the warmth of his mother's body against his and her arms around him. Suddenly it seemed to him that his life was a dream, his mother's death and the life at the vicarage, and these two wretched days at school, and he would awake in the morning and be back again at home. His tears dried as he thought of it. He was too unhappy 
it must be nothing but a dream, and his mother was alive, and Emma would come up presently and go to bed. He fell asleep, but when he awoke next morning it was to the clanging of a bell, and the first thing his eyes saw was the green curtain of his cubicle. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 As time went on Philip's deformity ceased to interest. It was accepted like one boy's red hair and another's unreasonable corpulence. But meanwhile he had grown horribly sensitive. He never ran if he could help it, because he knew it made his limp more conspicuous, and he adopted a peculiar walk. He stood still as much as he could with his club foot behind the other, so that it should not attract notice, and he was constantly on the lookout for any reference to it. Because he could not join in the games which other boys played, their life remained strange to him. He only interested himself from the outside in their doings, and it seemed to him that there was a barrier between them and him. Sometimes they seemed to think that it was his fault if he could not play football and he was unable to make them understand. He was left a good deal to himself. He had been inclined to talkativeness, but gradually he became silent. He began to think of the difference between himself and others. The biggest boy in his dormitory, Singer, took a dislike to him, and Philip, small for his age, had to put up with a good deal of hard treatment. About halfway through the term a mania ran through the school for a game called Nibs. It was a game for two, played on a table or a form with steel pegs. You had to push your nib with the fingernail so as to get the point of it over your opponent's, while he maneuvered to prevent this and to get the point of his nib over the back of yours. When this result was achieved, you breathed on the ball of your thumb, pressed it hard on the two nibs, and if you were able then to lift them without dropping either, both nibs became yours. Soon nothing was seen but boys playing this game, and the more skillful acquired vast stores of nibs. But in a little while Mr. Watson made up his mind that it was a form of gambling, forbade the game, and confiscated all the nibs in the boys' possession. Philip had been very adroit, and it was with a heavy heart that he gave up his winning, but his fingers itched to play still, and a few days later on his way to the football field he went into a shop and bought a pennyworth of j-pens. He carried them loose in his pocket and enjoyed feeling them. Presently Singer found out that he had them. Singer had given up his nibs too, but he had kept back a very large one called a jumbo, which was almost unconquerable, and he could not resist the opportunity of getting Philip's j's out of him. Though Philip knew that he was at a disadvantage with his small nibs, he had an adventurous disposition and was willing to take the risk. Besides, he was aware that Singer would not allow him to refuse. He had not played for a week and sat down to the game now with a thrill of excitement. He had lost two of his small nibs quickly and Singer was jubilant, but the third time, by some chance, the jumbo slipped round and Philip was able to push his jay across it. He crowed with triumph. At that moment Mr. Watson came in. "'What are you doing?' he asked. He looked from Singer to Philip, but neither answered. "'Don't you know that I've forbidden you to play that idiotic game?' Philip's heart beat fast. He knew what was coming and was dreadfully frightened, but in his fright there was a certain exultation. He had never been swished. Of course it would hurt, but it was something to boast about afterwards. "'Come into my study.' The headmaster turned and they followed him side by side. Singer whispered to Philip, "'We're in for it.' Mr. Watson pointed to Singer. "'Bend over,' he said. Philip, very white, saw the boy quiver at each stroke, and after the third he heard him cry out. Three more followed. "'That'll do. Get up.' Singer stood up. The tears were streaming down his face. Philip stepped forward. Mr. Watson looked at him for a moment. "'I'm not going to cane you. You're a new boy, and I can't hit a cripple.' Go away, both of you, and don't be naughty again. When they got back into the schoolroom a group of boys who had learned in some mysterious way what was happening were waiting for them. They set upon Singer at once with eager questions. Singer faced them, his face red with the pain and marks of tears still on his cheeks. He pointed with his head at Philip. 
who was standing a little behind him. "'He got off because he's a cripple,' he said angrily. Philip stood silent and flushed. He felt that they looked at him with contempt. "'How many did you get?' one boy asked Singer. But he did not answer. He was angry because he had been hurt. "'Don't ask me to play nibs with you again,' he said to Philip. "'It's jolly nice for you. You don't risk anything. I didn't ask you. Didn't you?' He quickly put out his foot and tripped Philip up. Philip was always rather unsteady on his feet, and he fell heavily to the ground. "'Cripple,' said Singer. For the rest of the term he tormented Philip cruelly, and, though Philip tried to keep out of his way, the school was so small that it was impossible. He tried being friendly and jolly with him. He abased himself so far as to buy him a knife, but though Singer took the knife he was not placated. Once or twice driven beyond endurance he hit and kicked the bigger boy but singer was so much stronger that philip was helpless and he was always forced after more or less torture to beg his pardon it was that which rankled with philip he could not bear the humiliation of apologies which were wrung from him by pain greater than he could bear and what made it worse was that there seemed no end to his wretchedness singer was only eleven and would not go to the upper school till he was thirteen. Philip realized that he must live two years with a tormentor from whom there was no escape. He was only happy while he was working and when he got into bed, and often there recurred to him then that queer feeling that his life with all its misery was nothing but a dream, and that he would awake in the morning in his own little bed in London. End of chapter 12 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapters thirteen through sixteen of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maud. Chapter 13 Two years passed, and Philip was nearly twelve. He was in the first form, within two or three places of the top, and after Christmas, when several boys would be leaving for the senior school, he would be head boy. He had already quite a collection of prizes, worthless books on bad paper, but in gorgeous bindings decorated with the arms of the school. His position had freed him from bullying, and he was not unhappy. His fellows forgave him his success because of his deformity. After all, it's jolly easy for him to get prizes, they said. There's nothing he can do but swat. He had lost his early terror of Mr. Watson. He had grown used to the loud voice, and when the headmaster's heavy hand was laid on his shoulder, Philip discerned vaguely the intention of a caress. He had the good memory which is more useful for scholastic achievements than mental power, and he knew Mr. Watson expected him to leave the preparatory school with a scholarship. But he had grown very self-conscious. The newborn child does not realize that his body is more a part of himself than surrounding objects, and will play with his toes without any feeling that they belong to him more than the rattle by his side, and it is only by degrees through pain that he understands the fact of the body. And experiences of the same kind are necessary for the individual to become conscious of himself. But here there is the difference that, although everyone becomes equally conscious of his body as a separate and complete organism, everyone does not become equally conscious of himself as a complete and separate personality. The feeling of apartness from others comes to most with puberty but it is not always developed to such a degree as to make the difference between the individual and his fellows noticeable to the individual. It is such as he, as little conscious of himself as the bee in a hive, who are the lucky in life, for they have the best chance of happiness. Their activities are shared by all, and their pleasures are only pleasures because they are enjoyed in common. You will see them on Whit Monday dancing on Hampstead Heath, shouting at a football match, or from club windows in Pall Mall cheering a royal procession. It is because of them that man has been called a social animal. 
Philip passed from the innocence of childhood to bitter consciousness of himself by the ridicule which his club foot had excited. The circumstances of his case were so peculiar that he could not apply to them the ready-made rules which acted well enough in ordinary affairs, and he was forced to think for himself. The many books he had read filled his mind with ideas which, because he only half understood them, gave more scope to his imagination. Beneath his painful shyness something was growing up within him, and obscurely he realized his personality. But at times it gave him odd surprises. He did things he knew not why, and afterwards when he thought of them found himself all at sea. There was a boy named Luard between whom and Philip a friendship had arisen, and one day when they were playing together in the schoolroom Luard began to perform some trick with an ebony penholder of Philip's. "'Don't play the giddy ox,' said Philip. "'You'll only break it. I shan't.' But no sooner were the words out of the boy's mouth than the penholder snapped in two. Luard looked at Philip with dismay. "'Oh, I say, I'm awfully sorry.' The tears rolled down Philip's cheeks, but he did not answer. "'I say, what's the matter?' said Luard with surprise. "'I'll get you another one exactly the same.' "'It's not about the penholder I care,' said Philip in a trembling voice. "'Only it was given me by my mater just before she died.' "'I say, I'm awfully sorry, Carrie. "'It doesn't matter. It wasn't your fault.' Philip took the two pieces of the penholder and looked at them. He tried to restrain his sobs. He felt utterly miserable. And yet he could not tell why, for he knew quite well that he had bought the penholder during his last holidays at Blackstable, for one and twopence. He did not know in the least what had made him invent that pathetic story, but he was quite as unhappy as though it had been true. The pious atmosphere of the vicarage and the religious tone of the school had made Philip's conscience very sensitive. He absorbed insensibly the feeling about him that the tempter was ever on the watch to gain his immortal soul. And though he was not more truthful than most boys, he never told a lie without suffering from remorse. When he thought over this incident he was very much distressed, and made up his mind that he must go to Luard and tell him that the story was an invention. Though he dreaded humiliation more than anything in the world, he hugged himself for two or three days at the thought of the agonizing joy of humiliating himself to the glory of God. But he never got any further. He satisfied his conscience by the more comfortable method of expressing his repentance only to the Almighty. But he could not understand why he should have been so genuinely affected by the story he was making up. The tears that flowed down his grubby cheeks were real tears. Then by some accident of association there occurred to him that scene when Emma had told him of his mother's death, and though he could not speak for crying, he had insisted on going in to say good-bye to the Mrs. Watkin so that they might see his grief and pity him. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 then a wave of religiosity passed through the school. Bad language was no longer heard, and the little nastiness of small boys were looked upon with hostility. The bigger boys, like the Lord's Temporal of the Middle Ages, used the strength of their arms to persuade those weaker than themselves to virtuous courses. Philip, his restless mind avid for new things, became very devout. He heard soon that it was possible to join a Bible League, and wrote to London for particulars. These consisted in a form to be filled up with the applicant's name, age, and school, a solemn declaration to be signed that he would read a set portion of Holy Scripture every night for a year, and a request for half a crown. This, it was explained, was demanded partly to prove the earnestness of the applicant's desire to become a member of the League, and partly to cover clerical expenses. Philip duly sent the papers and the money, and in return received a calendar worth about a penny, on which was set down the appointed passage to be read each day, and a sheet of paper on one side, of which was a picture of the good shepherd and a lamb, and on the other, decoratively framed in red lines, a short prayer which had to be said before beginning to read. Every evening he undressed as quickly as possible in order to have time for his task 
before the gas was put out. He read industriously, as he read always without criticism, stories of cruelty, deceit, ingratitude, dishonesty, and low cunning. Actions which would have excited his horror in the life about him in the reading passed through his mind without comment, because they were committed under the direct inspiration of God. The method of the League was to alternate a book of the Old Testament with a book of the New, and one night Philip came across these words of Jesus Christ. If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all this, whatever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. They made no particular impression upon him, but it happened that two or three days later, being Sunday, the canon in residence chose them for the text of his sermon. Even if Philip had wanted to hear this it would have been impossible, for the boys of King's School sit in the choir, and the pulpit stands at the corner of the transept so that the teacher's back is almost turned to them. The distance also is so great that it needs a man with a fine voice and a knowledge of elocution to make himself heard in the choir, and accordingly to long usage the canons of Turcanbury are chosen for their learning rather than for any qualities which might be of use in a cathedral church. But the words of the text, perhaps because he had read them so short a while before, came clearly enough to Philip's ears, and they seemed on a sudden to have a personal application. He thought about them through most of the sermon, and that night on getting into bed he turned over the pages of the gospel and found once more the passage. Though he believed implicitly everything he saw in print, he had learned already that in the Bible things that said one thing quite clearly often mysteriously meant another. There was no one he liked to ask at school, so he kept the question he had in mind till the Christmas holidays, and then one day he made an opportunity. It was after supper and prayers were just finished. Mrs. Carey was counting the eggs that Mary Ann had brought in as usual and writing on each one the date. Philip stood at the table and pretended to turn listlessly the pages of the Bible. "'I say, Uncle William, this passage here, does it really mean that?' He put his finger against it as though he had come across it accidentally. Mr. Carey looked up over his spectacles. He was holding the black stable times in front of the fire. It had come in that evening damp from the press, and the vicar always aired it for ten minutes before he began to read. "'What passage is that?' he asked. "'Why, this about if you have faith you can remove mountains.' "'If it says so in the Bible it is so, Philip,' said Mrs. Carey gently, taking up the plate-basket. Philip looked at his uncle for an answer. "'It's a matter of faith. Do you mean to say that if you really believed you could move mountains you could?' "'By the grace of God,' said the vicar. "'Now say good-night to your uncle, Philip,' said Aunt Louisa. You're not wanting to move a mountain tonight, are you?" Philip allowed himself to be kissed on the forehead by his uncle and preceded Mrs. Carey upstairs. He had got the information he wanted. His little room was icy and he shivered when he put on his nightshirt, but he always felt that his prayers were more pleasing to God when he said them under conditions of discomfort. The coldness of his hands and feet were an offering to the Almighty, and tonight he sank on his knees buried his face in his hands, and prayed to God with all his might that he would make his clubfoot whole. It was a very small thing beside the moving of mountains. He knew that God could do it if he wished, and his own faith was complete. Next morning, finishing his prayers with the same request, he fixed a date for the miracle. O God, in thy loving mercy and goodness, if it be thy will, please make my foot all right on the night before I go back to school. He was glad to get his petition into a formula, and he repeated it later in the dining-room during the short pause which the vicar always made after prayers before he rose from his knees. He said it again in the evening and again shivering in his nightshirt before he got into bed. And he believed. For once he looked forward with eagerness to the end of the holidays. He laughed to himself as he thought of his uncle's astonishment when he ran down the stairs three at a time, and after breakfast he and Aunt Louisa 
would have to hurry out and buy a new pair of boots. At school they would be astounded. "'Hello, Carrie. What have you done with your foot?' "'Oh, it's all right now,' he would answer casually, as though it were the most natural thing in the world. He would be able to play football. His heart leaped as he saw himself running, running faster than any of the other boys. At the end of the Easter term there were the sports, and he would be able to go in for the races. He rather fancied himself over the hurdles. It would be splendid to be like everyone else, not to be stared at curiously by new boys who did not know about his deformity, nor at the baths in summer to need incredible precautions while he was undressing before he could hide his foot in the water. He prayed with all the power of his soul. No doubts assailed him. He was confident in the word of God. And the night before he was to go back to school he went up to bed tremulous with excitement. There was snow on the ground, and Aunt Louisa had allowed herself the unaccustomed luxury of a fire in her bedroom. But in Philip's little room it was so cold that his fingers were numb, and he had great difficulty in undoing his collar. His teeth chattered. The idea came to him that he must do something more than usual to attract the attention of God, and he turned back the rug which was in front of his bed so that he could kneel on the bare boards. And then it struck him that his nightshirt was a softness that might displease his Maker, so he took it off and said his prayers naked. When he got into bed he was so cold that for some time he could not sleep, but when he did it was so soundly that Mary Ann had to shake him when she brought in his hot water next morning. She talked to him while she drew the curtains, but he did not answer. He had remembered at once that this was the morning for the miracle. His heart was filled with joy and gratitude. His first instinct was to put down his hand and feel the foot which was whole now, but to do this seemed to doubt the goodness of God. He knew that his foot was well, but at last he made up his mind, and with the toes of his right foot he just touched his left. Then he passed his hand over it. He limped downstairs just as Mary Ann was going into the dining-room for prayers, and then sat down to breakfast. "'You're very quiet this morning, Philip,' said Aunt Louisa presently. "'He's thinking of the good breakfast he'll have at school tomorrow,' said the vicar. When Philip answered it was in a way that always irritated his uncle, with something that had nothing to do with the matter in hand. He called it a bad habit of wool-gathering. "'Supposing you'd ask God to do something,' said Philip, and really believed it was going to happen, like moving a mountain, I mean, and you had faith, and it didn't happen. What would it mean?' "'What a funny boy you are,' said Aunt Louisa. "'You asked about moving mountains two or three weeks ago.' "'It would just mean that you hadn't got faith,' answered Uncle William. Philip accepted the explanation. If God had not cured him it was because he did not really believe. And yet he did not see how he could believe more than he did. But perhaps he had not given God enough time. He had only asked him for nineteen days. In a day or two he began his prayer again, and this time he fixed upon Easter. That was the time of his son's glorious resurrection, and God in his happiness might be mercifully inclined. But now Philip added other means of attaining his desire. He began to wish when he saw a new moon or a dappled horse, and he looked out for shooting stars. During Exiat they had a chicken at the vicarage, and he broke the lucky bone with Aunt Louisa and wished again, each time that his foot might be made whole. He was appealing unconsciously to gods older to his race than the God of Israel, and he bombarded the Almighty with his prayer, at odd times of the day, whenever it occurred to him, in identical words always, for it seemed to him important to make his request in the same terms. But presently the feeling came to him that this time also his faith would not be great enough. He could not resist the doubt that assailed him. He made his own experience into a general rule. I suppose no one ever has faith enough, he said. It was like the salt which his nurse used to tell him about. You could catch any bird by putting salt on his tail, and once he had taken a little bag of it into Kensington Gardens, but he could never get near enough to put the salt on a bird's tail. Before Easter he had given up the struggle. 
he felt a dull resentment against his uncle for taking him in. The text which spoke of the moving of mountains was just one of those that said one thing and meant another. He thought his uncle had been playing a practical joke on him. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 The King's School at Turkenbury, to which Philip went when he was thirteen, prided itself on its antiquity. It traced its origin to an abbey school, founded before the conquest, where the rudiments of learning were taught by Augustine monks. And like many another establishment of this sort, on the destruction of the monasteries it had been reorganized by the officers of King Henry the Eighth, and thus acquired its name. Since then, pursuing its modest course, it had given to the sons of the local gentry and of the professional people of Kent an education sufficient to their needs. One or two men of letters, beginning with a poet, then whom only Shakespeare had a more splendid genius, and ending with a writer of prose whose view of life had affected profoundly the generation of which Philip was a member, had gone forth from its gates to achieve fame. It had produced one or two eminent lawyers, but eminent lawyers are common, and one or two soldiers of distinction. But during the three centuries since its separation from the monastic order it had trained especially men of the church, bishops, deans, canons, and above all country clergymen. There were boys in the school whose fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers had been educated there, and had all been rectors of parishes in the diocese of Turcanbury, and they came to it with their minds made up already to be ordained. But there were signs notwithstanding that even there changes were coming. For a few, repeating what they had heard at home, said that the church was no longer what it used to be. It wasn't so much the money, but the class of people who went in for it weren't the same, and two or three boys knew curates whose fathers were tradesmen. They'd rather go out to the colonies. In those days the colonies were still the last hope of those who could get nothing to do in England. Then be a curate under some chap who wasn't a gentleman. At King's School, as at Blackstable Vicarage, a tradesman was anyone who was not lucky enough to own land and here a fine distinction was made between the gentleman farmer and the landowner. Or did not follow one of the four professions to which it was possible for a gentleman to belong. Among the day boys, of whom there were about a hundred and fifty, sons of the local gentry and of the men stationed at the depot, those whose fathers were engaged in business were made to feel the degradation of their state. The masters had no patience with modern ideas of education, which they read of sometimes in the Times or the Guardian, and hoped fervently that King's School would remain true to its old traditions. The dead languages were taught with such thoroughness that an old boy seldom thought of Homer or Virgil in after life without a qualm of boredom, and though in the common room at dinner one or two bolder spirits suggested that mathematics were of increasing importance, the general feeling was that they were a less noble study than the classics. Neither German nor chemistry was taught, and French only by the form masters. They could keep order better than a foreigner, and since they knew the grammar as well as any Frenchman, it seemed unimportant that none of them could have got a cup of coffee in the restaurant at Boulogne unless the waiter had known a little English. Geography was taught chiefly by making boys draw maps and this was a favorite occupation, especially when the country dealt with was mountainous. It was possible to waste a great deal of time in drawing the Andes or the Apennines. The masters, graduates of Oxford or Cambridge, were ordained and unmarried. If by chance they wished to marry, they could only do so by accepting one of the smaller livings at the disposal of the chapter. But for many years none of them had cared to leave the refined society of Turcanbury, which, owing to the cavalry depot, had a martial as well as an ecclesiastical tone for the monotony of life in a country rectory, and they were now all men of middle age. The headmaster, on the other hand, was obliged to be married, and he conducted the school till age began to tell upon him. When he retired he was rewarded with a much better living than any of the undermasters could hope for and an honorary canonry. 
but a year before Philip entered the school a great change had come over it. It had been obvious for some time that Dr. Fleming, who had been headmaster for the quarter of a century, was become too deaf to continue his work to the greater glory of God and when one of the livings on the outskirts of the city fell vacant, with a stipend of six hundred a year, the chapter offered it to him in such a manner as to imply that they thought it high time for him to retire. He could nurse his ailments comfortably on such an income. Two or three curates who had hoped for preferment told their wives it was scandalous to give a parish that needed a young, strong, and energetic man to an old fellow who knew nothing of parochial work and had feathered his nest already. But the mutterings of the unbeneficed clergy do not reach the ears of a cathedral chapter. And as for the parishioners, they had nothing to say in the matter, and therefore nobody asked for their opinion. The Wesleyans and the Baptists both had chapels in the village. When Dr. Fleming was thus disposed of, it became necessary to find a successor. It was contrary to the traditions of the school that one of the lower masters should be chosen. The common room was unanimous in desiring the election of Mr. Watson, headmaster of the preparatory school. He could hardly be described as already a master of King's School. They had all known him for twenty years, and there was no danger that he would make a nuisance of himself. But the chapter sprang a surprise in them. It chose a man called Perkins. At first nobody knew who Perkins was, and the name favorably impressed no one. But before the shock of it had passed away it was realized that Perkins was the son of Perkins the linen draper. Dr. Fleming informed the masters just before dinner, and his manner showed his consternation. Such of them as were dining in ate their meal almost in silence, and no reference was made to the matter till the servants had left the room. Then they sat too. The names of those present on this occasion are unimportant, but they had been known to generations of schoolboys as Size, Tar, Winks, Squirts, and Pat. They all knew Tom Perkins. The first thing about him was that he was not a gentleman. They remembered him quite well. He was a small, dark boy with untidy black hair and large eyes. He looked like a gypsy. He had come to the school as a day boy with the best scholarship on their endowment so that his education had cost him nothing. Of course he was brilliant. At every speech day he was loaded with prizes. He was their show boy, and they remembered now bitterly their fear that he would try to get some scholarship at one of the larger public schools and so pass out of their hands. Dr. Fleming had gone to the linen draper his father, they all remembered the shop, Perkins and Cooper, in St. Catherine Street, and said he hoped Tom would remain with them till he went to Oxford. The school was Perkins and Cooper's best customer, and Mr. Perkins was only too glad to give the required assurance. Tom Perkins continued to triumph. He was the finest classical scholar that Dr. Fleming remembered, and on leaving the school took with him the most valuable scholarship they had to offer. He got another and Magdalen and settled down to a brilliant career at the university. The school magazine recorded the distinctions he achieved year after year, and when he got his double first Dr. Fleming himself wrote a few words of eulogy on the front page. It was with greater satisfaction that they welcomed his success, since Perkins and Cooper had fallen upon evil days. Cooper drank like a fish, and just before Tom Perkins took his degree the linen drapers filed their petition in bankruptcy. In due course Tom Perkins took holy orders and entered upon the profession for which he was so admirably suited. He had been an assistant master at Wellington and then at Rugby. But there was quite a difference between welcoming his success at other schools and serving under his leadership in their own. Tar had frequently given him lines and squirts had boxed his ears. They could not imagine how the chapter had made such a mistake. No one could be expected to forget that he was the son of a bankrupt linen draper, and the alcoholism of Cooper seemed to increase the disgrace. It was understood that the dean had supported his candidature with zeal, so the dean would probably ask him to dinner. 
but would the pleasant little diners in the precincts ever be the same when Tom Perkins sat at the table? And what about the depot? He really could not expect officers and gentlemen to receive him as one of themselves. It would do the school incalculable harm. Parents would be dissatisfied, and no one could be surprised if there were wholesale withdrawals. And then the indignity of calling him Mr. Perkins. The masters thought by way of protest of sending in their resignations in a body, but the uneasy fear that they would be accepted with equanimity restrained them. The only thing is to prepare ourselves for changes, said Size, who had conducted the fifth form for five and twenty years with unparalleled incompetence. And when they saw him they were not reassured. Dr. Fleming invited them to meet him at luncheon. He was now a man of thirty-two, tall and lean, but with the same wild and unkempt look they remembered on him as a boy. His clothes, ill-made and shabby, were put on untidily. His hair was as black and as long as ever, and he had plainly never learned to brush it. It fell over his forehead with every gesture, and he had a quick movement of the hand with which he pushed it back from his eyes. He had a black moustache and a beard which came high up on his face almost to the cheekbones. He talked to the masters quite easily, as though he had parted from them a week or two before. He was evidently delighted to see them. He seemed unconscious of the strangeness of the position, and appeared not to notice any oddness in being addressed as Mr. Perkins. When he bade them good-bye, one of the masters, for something to say, remarked that he was allowing himself plenty of time to catch his train. "'I want to go round and have a look at the shop,' he answered cheerily. There was a distinct embarrassment. They wondered that he could be so tactless, and to make it worse Dr. Fleming had not heard what he said. His wife shouted it in his ear. "'He wants to go round and look at his father's old shop.' Only Tom Perkins was unconscious of the humiliation which the whole party felt. He turned to Mrs. Fleming. "'Who's got it now, do you know?' She could hardly answer. She was very angry. "'It's still a linen draper's,' she said bitterly. "'Grove is the name. We don't deal there any more. I wonder if he'd let me go over the house. I expect he would if you explain who you are.' It was not till the end of dinner that evening that any reference was made in the common room to the subject that was all in their minds. Then it was Size who asked. "'Well, what did you think of our new head? They thought of the conversation at luncheon. It was hardly a conversation, it was a monologue. Perkins had talked incessantly. He talked very quickly, with a flow of easy words and in a deep, resonant voice. He had a short, odd little laugh which showed his white teeth. They had followed him with difficulty, for his mind darted from subject to subject with a connection they did not always catch. He talked of pedagogics and this was natural enough, but he had much to say of modern theories in Germany which they had never heard of and received with misgiving. He talked of the classics, but he had been to Greece, and he discoursed of archaeology. He had once spent a winter digging. They could not see how that helped a man to teach boys to pass examination. He talked of politics. It sounded odd to them to hear him compare Lord Beaconsfield's with Alcibiades. He talked of Mr. Gladstone and Home Rule. They realized that he was a liberal. Their hearts sank. He talked of German philosophy and of French fiction. They could not think a man profound whose interests were so diverse. It was Winks who summed up the general impression and put it into a form they all felt conclusively damning. Winks was the master of the upper third, a weak-kneed man with drooping eyelids. He was too tall for his strength and his movements were slow and languid. He gave an impression of lassitude, and his nickname was eminently appropriate. "'He's very enthusiastic,' said Winks. Enthusiasm was ill-bred. Enthusiasm was ungentlemanly. They thought of the Salvation Army with its brain trumpets and its drums. Enthusiasm meant change. They had goose-flesh when they thought of all the pleasant old habits which stood in imminent danger. They hardly dared to look forward to the future. "'He looks more of a gypsy than ever,' said one after a pause. "'I wonder if the dean and chapter knew that he was a radical when they elected him, 
another observed bitterly. But conversation halted. They were too much disturbed for words. When Tar and Size were walking together to the chapter house on speech day a week later, Tar, who had a bitter tongue, remarked to his colleague, "'Well, we've seen a good many speech days here, haven't we? I wonder if we shall see another.' Size was more melancholy even than usual. "'If anything worth having comes along in the way of a living, I don't mind when I retire.'" End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 a year passed, and when Philip came to the school the old masters were all in their places, but a good many changes had taken place notwithstanding their stubborn resistance, none the less formidable because it was concealed under an apparent desire to fall in with the new head's ideas. Though the form masters still taught French to the lower school, another master had come with a degree of doctor in philosophy from the University of Heidelberg and a record of three years spent in a French lycée, to teach French to the upper forms and German to anyone who cared to take it up, instead of Greek. Another master was engaged to teach mathematics more systematically than had been found necessary hitherto. Neither of these was ordained. This was a real revolution, and when the pair arrived the older masters received them with distrust. A laboratory had been fitted up, army classes were instituted, they all said the character of the school was changing, and heaven only knew what further projects Mr. Perkins turned in that untidy head of his. The school was small as public schools go, there were not more than two hundred boarders, and it was difficult for it to grow larger, for it was huddled up against the cathedral. The precincts, with the exception of a house in which some of the masters lodged, were occupied by the cathedral clergy, and there was no more room for building. But Mr. Perkins devised an elaborate scheme by which he might obtain sufficient space to make the school double its present size. He wanted to attract boys from London. He thought it would be good for them to be thrown in contact with the Kentish lads, and it would sharpen the country wits of these. "'It's against all our traditions,' said Size when Mr. Perkins made the suggestion to him. We've rather gone out of our way to avoid the contamination of boys from London. Oh, what nonsense! said Mr. Perkins. No one had ever told the form master before that he talked nonsense, and he was meditating an acid reply in which perhaps he might insert a veiled reference to hosiery, when Mr. Perkins, in his impetuous way, attacked him outrageously. That house in the precincts, if you'd only marry I'd get the chapter to put another couple of stories on, and we'd make dormitories and studies, and your wife could help you. The elderly clergyman gasped. Why should he marry? He was fifty-seven. A man couldn't marry at fifty-seven. He couldn't start looking after a house at his time of life. He didn't want to marry. If the choice lay between that and the country living he would much sooner resign. All he wanted now was peace and quietness. I'm not thinking of marrying, he said. Mr. Perkins looked at him with his dark bright eyes, and if there was a twinkle in them, poor Size never saw it. What a pity! Couldn't you marry to oblige me? It would help me a great deal with the dean and chapter when I suggest rebuilding your house. But Mr. Perkins' most unpopular innovation was his system of taking occasionally another man's form. He asked it as a favor, but after all it was a favor which could not be refused, and as Tar, otherwise Mr. Turner, said, it was undignified for all parties. He gave no warning, but after morning prayers would say to one of the masters, I wonder if you'd mind taking the sixth today at eleven. We'll change over, shall we? They did not know whether this was usual at other schools, but certainly it had never been done at Turcanbury. The results were curious. Mr. Turner, who was the first victim, broke the news to his form that the headmaster would take them for Latin that day, and on that pretense that they might like to ask a question or two so that they should not make perfect fools of themselves, spent the last quarter of an hour of the history lesson in construing for them the passage of Livy which had been set for the day. But when he rejoined his class and looked at the paper on which Mr. Perkins had written the marks, a surprise awaited him. 
for the two boys at the top of the form seemed to have done very ill, while others who had never distinguished themselves before were given full marks. When he asked Eldridge, his cleverest boy, what was the meaning of this, the answer came sullenly. Mr. Perkins never gave us any construing to do. He asked me what I knew about General Gordon. Mr. Turner looked at him in astonishment. The boys evidently felt they had been hardly used, and he could not help agreeing with their silent dissatisfaction. He could not see either what General Gordon had to do with Livy. He hazarded an inquiry afterwards. Eldridge was dreadfully put out because you asked him what he knew about General Gordon, he said to the headmaster with an attempt at a chuckle. Mr. Perkins laughed. I saw that they got to the agrarian laws of Caius Gracchus, and I wondered if they knew anything about the agrarian troubles in Ireland. But all they knew about Ireland was that Dublin was on the Liffey, so I wondered if they'd ever heard of General Gordon. Then the horrid fact was disclosed that the new head had a mania for general information. He had doubts about the utility of examinations on subjects which had been crammed for the occasion. He wanted common sense. Size grew more worried every month. He could not get the thought out of his head that Mr. Perkins would ask him to fix a day for his marriage, and he hated the attitude the head adopted towards classical literature. There was no doubt that he was a fine scholar, and he was engaged on a work which was quite in the right tradition. He was writing a treatise on the trees in Latin literature, but he talked of it flippantly, as though it were a pastime of no great importance like billiards which engaged his leisure but was not to be considered with seriousness. And Squirts, the master of the middle third, grew more ill-tempered every day. It was in his form that Philip was put on entering the school. The Reverend B. B. Gordon was a man by nature ill-suited to be a schoolmaster. He was impatient and choleric. With no one to call him to account, with only small boys to face him, he had long lost all power of self-control. He began his work in a rage and ended it in a passion. He was a man of middle height and of a corpulent figure. He had sandy hair worn very short and now growing gray, and a small, bristly moustache. His large face with indistinct features and small blue eyes was naturally red, but during his frequent attacks of anger it grew dark and purple. His nails were bitten to the quick, for while some trembling boy was construing he would sit at his desk shaking with the fury that consumed him and gnaw his fingers. Stories, perhaps exaggerated, were told of his violence, and two years before there had been some excitement in the school when it was heard that one father was threatening a prosecution. He had boxed the ears of a boy named Walters with a book so violently that his hearing was affected and the boy had to be taken away from the school. The boy's father lived in Turkhanbury, and there had been much indignation in the city, the local paper had referred to the matter. But Mr. Walters was only a brewer, so the sympathy was divided. The rest of the boys, for reasons best known to themselves, though they loathed the master, took his side in the affair, and to show their indignation that the school's business had been dealt with outside made things as uncomfortable as they could for Walter's younger brother, who still remained. But Mr. Gordon had only escaped the country living by the skin of his teeth, and he had never hit a boy since. The right the masters possessed to cane boys on the hand was taken away from them, and Squirts could no longer emphasize his anger by beating his desk with the cane. He never did more now than take a boy by the shoulders and shake him. He still made a naughty or refractory lad stand with one arm stretched out for anything from ten minutes to half an hour, and he was as violent as before with his tongue. No master could have been more unfitted to teach things to so shy a boy as Philip. He had come to the school with fewer terrors than he had when first he went to Mr. Watson's. He knew a good many boys who had been with him at the preparatory school. He felt more grown up and instinctively realized that among the larger numbers his deformity would be less noticeable. But from the first day Mr. Gordon struck terror in his heart, and the master, quick to discern the boys who were frightened of him, seemed on that account to take a peculiar dislike to him. Philip had enjoyed his work, 
but now he began to look upon the hours passed in school with horror. Better than risk an answer which might be wrong and excite a storm of abuse from the master, he would sit stupidly silent, and when it came towards his turn to stand up and construe he grew sick and white with apprehension. His happy moments were those when Mr. Perkins took the form. He was able to gratify the passion for general knowledge which beset the headmaster. He had read all sorts of strange books beyond his years, and often Mr. Perkins, when a question was going round the room, would stop at Philip with a smile that filled the boy with rapture and say, "'Now, Carrie, you tell them.' The good marks he got on these occasions increased Mr. Gordon's indignation. One day it came to Philip's turn to translate, and the master sat there glaring at him and furiously biting his thumb. He was in a ferocious mood. Philip began to speak in a low voice. "'Don't mumble!' shouted the master. Something seemed to stick in Philip's throat. "'Go on, go on, go on!' Each time the words were screamed more loudly. The effect was to drive all he knew out of Philip's head, and he looked at the printed page vacantly. Mr. Gordon began to breathe heavily. "'If you don't know, why don't you say so? Do you know it or not? Did you hear all this construed last time or not? Why don't you speak? Speak, you blockhead, speak!' The master seized the arms of his chair and grasped them as though to prevent himself from falling upon Philip. They knew that in past days he often used to seize boys by the throat till they almost choked. The veins in his forehead stood out and his face grew dark and threatening. He was a man insane. Philip had known the passage perfectly the day before, but now he could remember nothing. "'I don't know it,' he gasped. "'Why don't you know it? Let's take the words one by one. We'll soon see if you don't know it.' Philip stood silent, very white, trembling a little, with his head bent down on the book. The master's breathing grew almost stertorous. The headmaster says you're clever. I don't know how he sees it. General information. He laughed savagely. I don't know what they put you in his form for, blockhead. He was pleased with the word, and he repeated it at the top of his voice. Blockhead! Blockhead! Club-footed blockhead! That relieved him a little. He saw Philip redden suddenly. He told him to fetch the black book. Philip put down his Caesar and went silently out. The black book was a somber volume in which the names of boys were written with their misdeeds, and when a name was put down three times it meant a caning. Philip went to the headmaster's house and knocked at his study door. Mr. Perkins was seated at his table. "'May I have the black book, please, sir?' "'There it is,' answered Mr. Perkins, indicating its place by a nod of his head. "'What have you been doing that you shouldn't?' "'I don't know, sir.' Mr. Perkins gave him a quick look, but without answering went on with his work. Philip took the book and went out. When the hour was up, a few minutes later, he brought it back. "'Let me have a look at it,' said the headmaster. "'I see Mr. Gordon has black-booked you for gross impertinence. What was it?' "'I don't know, sir. Mr. Gordon said I was a club-footed blockhead.' Mr. Perkins looked at him again. He wondered whether there was sarcasm behind the boy's reply, but he was still much too shaken. His face was white and his eyes had a look of terrified distress. Mr. Perkins got up and put the book down. As he did so, he took up some photographs. "'A friend of mine sent me some pictures of Athens this morning,' he said casually. "'Look here, there's the Acropolis.' He began explaining to Philip what he saw. The ruin grew vivid with his words. He showed him the theatre of Dionysus and explained in what order the people sat and how beyond they could see the blue Aegean. And then suddenly he said, I remember Mr. Gordon used to call me a gypsy counter-jumper when I was in his form. And before Philip, his mind fixed on the photographs, had time to gather the meaning of the remark, Mr. Perkins was showing him a picture of Salamis, and with his finger, a finger of which the nail had a little black edge to it, was pointing out how the Greek ships were placed and how the Persian. End of chapter 16. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com.
Chapters seventeen through twenty of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter seventeen. Philip passed the next two years with comfortable monotony. He was not bullied more than other boys of his size, and his deformity, withdrawing him from games, acquired for him an insignificance for which he was grateful. He spent a couple of terms with Winks in the upper third. Winks, with his weary manner and his drooping eyelids, looked infinitely bored. He did his duty, but he did it with an abstracted mind. He was kind, gentle, and foolish. He had a great belief in the honor of boys. He felt that the first thing to make them truthful was not to let it enter your head for a moment that it was possible for them to lie. "'Ask much,' he quoted, "'and much shall be given to you.' Life was easy in the upper third. You knew exactly what lines would come to your turn to construe, and with the crib that passed from hand to hand you could find out all you wanted in two minutes. You could hold a Latin grammar open on your knees while questions were passing round and Winks never noticed anything odd in the fact that the same incredible mistake was to be found in a dozen different exercises. He had no great faith in examinations, for he noticed that boys never did so well in them as in form. It was disappointing, but not significant. In due course they were moved up, having learned little but a cheerful effrontery in the distortion of truth, which was possibly of greater service to them in after life than an ability to read Latin at sight. Then they fell into the hands of Tar. His name was Turner. He was the most vivacious of the old masters, a short man with an immense belly, a black beard turning now to gray, and a swarthy skin. In his clerical dress there was indeed something in him to suggest the tar-barrel, and though on principle he gave five hundred lines to any boy on whose lips he overheard his nickname, at dinner parties in the precincts he often made little jokes about it. He was the most worldly of the masters, he dined out more frequently than any of the others, and the society he kept was not so exclusively clerical. The boys looked upon him as rather a dog. He left off his clerical attire during the holidays and had been seen in Switzerland in gay tweeds. He liked a bottle of wine and a good dinner, and having once been seen at the Café Royal with a lady who was very probably a near relation, was thenceforward supposed by generations of schoolboys to indulge in orgies, the circumstantial details of which pointed to an unbounded belief in human depravity. Mr. Turner reckoned that it took him a term to lick boys into shape after they had been in the upper third, and now and then he let fall a sly hint which showed that he knew perfectly what went on in his colleague's form. He took it good-humouredly. He looked upon boys as young ruffians who were more apt to be truthful if it was quite certain a lie would be found out, whose sense of honour was peculiar to themselves and did not apply to dealings with masters, and who were least likely to be troublesome when they learned that it did not pay. He was proud of his form and as eager at fifty-five that it should do better in examinations than any of the others as he had been when he first came to the school. He had the collar of the obese, easily roused and as easily calmed, and his boys soon discovered that there was much kindliness beneath the invective with which he constantly assailed them. He had no patience with fools, but was willing to take much trouble with boys whom he suspected of concealing intelligence behind their willfulness. He was fond of inviting them to tea, and, though vowing they never got a look in with him at the cakes and muffins, for it was the fashion to believe that his corpulence pointed to a voracious appetite, and his voracious appetite to tapeworms, they accepted his invitations with real pleasure. Philip was now more comfortable, for space was so limited that there were only studies for boys in the upper school, and then he had lived in the great hall in which they all ate and in which the lower forms did preparation in a promiscuity which was vaguely distasteful to him. Now and then it made him restless to be with people and he wanted urgently to be alone. He set out for solitary walks into the country. 
there was a little stream with pollards on both sides of it that ran through green fields, and it made him happy, he knew not why, to wander along its banks. When he was tired he lay face downward on the grass and watched the eager scurrying of minnows and of tadpoles. It gave him a peculiar satisfaction to saunter round the precincts. On the green in the middle they practiced at nets in the summer, but during the rest of the year it was quiet. Boys used to wander around sometimes arm in arm, or a studious fellow with abstracted gaze walked slowly, repeating to himself something he had to learn by heart. There was a colony of rooks in the great elms, and they filled the air with melancholy cries. Along one side lay the cathedral with its great central tower, and Philip, who knew as yet nothing of beauty, felt when he looked at it a troubling delight which he could not understand. When he had a study, it was a little square room looking on a slum and four boys shared it, he bought a photograph of that view of the cathedral and pinned it up over his desk, and he found himself taking a new interest in what he saw from the window of the fourth form room. It looked on to old lawns, carefully tended in fine trees with foliage, dense and rich. It gave him an odd feeling in his heart, and he did not know if it was pain or pleasure. It was the first dawn of the aesthetic emotion. It accompanied other changes. His voice broke. It was no longer quite under his control, and queer sounds issued from his throat. Then he began to go to the classes which were held in the headmaster's study immediately after tea to prepare boys for confirmation. Philip's piety had not stood the test of time, and he had long since given up his nightly reading of the Bible. But now, under the influence of Mr. Perkins, with this new condition of the body which made him so restless, his old feelings revived, and he reproached himself bitterly for his backsliding. The fires of hell burned fiercely before his mind's eye. If he had died during that time when he was little better than an infidel, he would have been lost. He believed implicitly in pain everlasting. He believed in it much more than in eternal happiness, and he shuddered at the dangers he had run. Since the day on which Mr. Perkins had spoken kindly to him when he was smarting under the particular form of abuse which he could least bear, Philip had conceived for his headmaster a dog-like adoration. He racked his brains vainly for some way to please him. He treasured the smallest word of commendation which by chance fell from his lips. And when he came to the quiet little meetings in his house he was prepared to surrender himself entirely. He kept his eyes fixed on Mr. Perkins' shining eyes, and sat with mouth half open, his head a little thrown forward so as to miss no word. The ordinariness of the surroundings made the matters they dealt with extraordinarily moving, and often the master, seized himself by the wonder of his subject, would push back the book in front of him, and with his hands clasped together over his heart, as though to still the beating, would talk of the mysteries of their religion. Sometimes Philip did not understand, but he did not want to understand. He felt vaguely that it was enough to feel. It seemed to him, then, that the headmaster, with his black straggling hair and his pale face, was like those prophets of Israel who feared not to take things to task. And when he thought of the Redeemer he saw him only with the same dark eyes and those wan cheeks. Mr. Perkins took this part of his work with great seriousness. There was never here any of that flashing humor which made the other masters suspect him of flippancy. Finding time for everything in his busy day, he was able at certain intervals to take separately for a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes the boys whom he was preparing for confirmation. He wanted to make them feel that this was the first consciously serious step in their lives. He tried to grope into the depths of their souls. He wanted to instill in them his own vehement devotion. In Philip, notwithstanding his shyness, he felt the possibility of a passion equal to his own. The boy's temperament seemed to him essentially religious. One day he broke off suddenly from the subject on which he had been talking. "'Have you thought at all what you're going to do when you grow up?' he asked. "'My uncle wants me to be ordained,' said Philip. "'And you?' Philip looked away. He was ashamed to answer that he felt himself unworthy. 
I don't know any life that's so full of happiness as ours. I wish I could make you feel what a wonderful privilege it is. One can serve God in every walk, but we stand nearer to Him. I don't want to influence you, but if you made up your mind, oh, at once, you couldn't help feeling that joy and relief which never desert one again. Philip did not answer, but the headmaster read in his eyes that he realized already something of what he tried to indicate. If you go on as you are now you'll find yourself head of the school one of these days, and you ought to be pretty safe for a scholarship when you leave. Have you got anything of your own? My uncle says I shall have a hundred a year when I'm twenty-one. You'll be rich. I had nothing. The headmaster hesitated a moment, and then, idly drawing lines with a pencil on the blotting paper in front of him, went on. I'm afraid your choice of professions will be rather limited. You naturally can't go in for anything that required physical activity. Philip reddened to the roots of his hair, as he always did when any reference was made to his club foot. Mr. Perkins looked at him gravely. I wonder if you're not oversensitive about your misfortune. Has it ever struck you to thank God for it? Philip looked up quickly. His lips tightened. He remembered how for months, trusting in what they told him, he had implored God to heal him as he had healed the leper and made the blind to see. As long as you accept it rebelliously, it can only cause you shame. But if you looked upon it as a cross that was given to you to bear only because your shoulders were strong enough to bear it, a sign of God's favor, then it would be a source of happiness to you instead of misery. He saw that the boy hated to discuss the matter and he let it go. But Philip thought over all that the headmaster had said, and presently his mind taken up entirely with the ceremony that was before him, a mystical rapture seized him. His spirit seemed to free itself from the bonds of the flesh, and he seemed to be living a new life. He aspired to perfection with all the passion that was in him. He wanted to surrender himself entirely to the service of God, and he made up his mind definitely that he would be ordained. When the great day arrived, his soul deeply moved by all the preparation, by the books he had studied, and above all the overwhelming influence of the head, he could hardly contain himself for fear and joy. One thought had tormented him. He knew that he would have to walk alone through the chancel, and he dreaded showing his limp thus obviously not only to the whole school who were attending the service, but also to the strangers, people from the city or parents who had come to see their sons confirmed. But when the time came he felt suddenly that he could accept the humiliation joyfully, and as he limped up the chancel, very small and insignificant beneath the lofty vaulting of the cathedral, he offered consciously his deformity as a sacrifice to the God who loved him. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 But Philip could not live long in the rarefied air of the hilltops. What had happened to him when first he was seized by the religious emotion happened to him now. Because he felt so keenly the beauty of faith, because the desire for self-sacrifice burned in his heart with such a gem-like glow, his strength seemed inadequate to his ambition. He was tired out by the violence of his passion. His soul was filled on a sudden with a singular aridity. He began to forget the presence of God which had seemed so surrounding, and his religious exercises, still very punctually performed, grew merely formal. At first he blamed himself for this falling away, and the fear of hell-fire urged him to renew vehemence. But the passion was dead, and gradually other interests distracted his thoughts. Philip had few friends. His habit of reading isolated him. It became such a need that after being in company for some time he grew tired and restless. He was vain of the wider knowledge he had acquired from the perusal of so many books. His mind was alert, and he had not the skill to hide his contempt for his companion's stupidity. They complained that he was conceited, and since he excelled only in matters which to them were unimportant, they asked satirically what he had to be conceited about. He was developing a sense of humor, and found that he had a knack of saying bitter things which caught people on the raw. He said them because they amused him, hardly realizing how much they hurt, and was much offended when he found that his victims regarded him with active dislike. 
the humiliations he suffered when first he went to school had caused in him a shrinking from his fellows which he could never entirely overcome. He remained shy and silent. But though he did everything to alienate the sympathy of the other boys, he longed with all his heart for the popularity which to some was so easily accorded. These from his distance he admired extravagantly, and though he was inclined to be more sarcastic with them than with others, though he made little jokes at their expense, he would have given anything to change places with them. Indeed, he would gladly have changed places with the dullest boy in the school who was whole of limb. He took to a singular habit. He would imagine that he was some boy whom he had a particular fancy for. He would throw his soul, as it were, into the other's body, talk with his voice, and laugh with his heart. He would imagine himself doing all the things the other did. It was so vivid that he seemed for a moment really to be no longer himself. In this way he enjoyed many intervals of fantastic happiness. At the beginning of the Christmas term which followed on his confirmation Philip found himself moved into another study. One of the boys who shared it was called Rose. He was in the same form as Philip, and Philip had always looked upon him with envious admiration. He was not good-looking, though his large hands and big bones suggested that he would be a tall man, he was clumsily made. But his eyes were charming, and when he laughed, he was constantly laughing, his face wrinkled all round them in a jolly way. He was neither clever nor stupid, but good enough at his work and better at games. He was a favorite with masters and boys, and he, in his turn, liked everyone. When Philip was put in the study he could not help seeing that the others, who had been together for three terms, welcomed him coldly. It made him nervous to feel himself an intruder, but he had learned to hide his feelings, and they found him quiet and unobtrusive. With Rose, because he was as little able as anyone else to resist his charm, Philip was even more than usually shy and abrupt and whether on account of this, unconsciously bent upon exerting the fascination he knew was his only by the results, or whether from sheer kindness of heart, it was Rose who first took Philip into the circle. One day, quite suddenly, he asked Philip if he would walk to the football field with him. Philip flushed. "'I can't walk fast enough for you,' he said. "'Rot! Come on!' And just before they were setting out, some boy put his hand in the study door, and asked Rose to go with him. "'I can't,' he answered. "'I've already promised Carrie.' "'Don't bother about me,' said Philip quickly. "'I shan't mind.' "'Rot,' said Rose. He looked at Philip with those good-natured eyes of his and laughed. Philip felt a curious tremor in his heart. In a little while their friendship growing with boyish rapidity, the pair were inseparable. Other fellows wondered at the sudden intimacy, and Rose was asked what he saw in Philip. Oh, I don't know, he answered. He's not half a bad chap, really. Soon they grew accustomed to the two walking in the chapel arm in arm, or strolling round the precincts in conversation. Wherever one was, the other could be found also, and, as though acknowledging his proprietorship, boys who wanted Rose would leave messages with Carrie. Philip at first was reserved. He would not let himself yield entirely to the proud joy that filled him, but presently his distrust of the fates gave way before a wild happiness. He thought Rose the most wonderful fellow he had ever seen. His books were now insignificant. He could not bother about them when there was something infinitely more important to occupy him. Rose's friends used to come in to tea in the study sometimes, or sit about when there was nothing better to do. Rose liked a crowd and the chance of a rag, and they found that Philip was quite a decent fellow. Philip was happy. When the last day of the term came he and Rose arranged by which train they should come back, so that they might meet at the station and have tea in the town before returning to school. Philip went home with a heavy heart. He thought of Rose all through the holidays, and his fancy was active with the things they would do together next term. He was bored at the vicarage, and when on the last day his uncle put him the usual question in the usual facetious tone, "'Well, are you glad to be going back to school?' Philip answered joyfully, "'Rather!' In order to be sure of meeting Rose at the station he took an earlier train than he usually did, and he waited about the platform for an hour. 
When the train came in from Faversham, where he knew Rose had to change, he ran along it excitedly. But Rose was not there. He got a porter to tell him when another train was due, and he waited. But again he was disappointed, and he was cold and hungry, so he walked through side streets and slums by a shortcut to the school. He found Rose in the study with his feet on the chimney-piece talking eighteen to the dozen with half a dozen boys who were sitting on whatever there was to sit on. He shook hands with Philip enthusiastically, but Philip's face fell, for he realized that Rose had forgotten all about their appointment. "'I say, why are you so late?' said Rose. "'I thought you were never coming.' "'You were at the station at half-past four, said another boy. "'I saw you when I came.' Philip blushed a little. He did not want Rose to know that he had been such a fool as to wait for him. "'I had to see about a friend of my people's,' he invented readily. "'I was asked to see her off.' But his disappointment made him a little sulky. He sat in silence and, when spoken to, answered in monosyllables. He was making up his mind to have it out with Rose when they were alone. But when the others had gone, Rose at once came over and sat on the arm of the chair in which Philip was lounging. I say, I'm jolly glad we're in the same study this term. Ripping, isn't it? He seemed so genuinely pleased to see Philip that Philip's annoyance vanished. They began as if they had not been separated for five minutes to talk eagerly of the thousand things that interested them. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 At first Philip had been too grateful for Rose's friendship to make any demands on him. He took things as they came and enjoyed life. But presently he began to resent Rose's universal amiability. He wanted a more exclusive attachment, and he claimed as a right what before he had accepted as a favor. He watched jealously Rose's companionship with others, and though he knew it was unreasonable could not help himself sometimes saying bitter things to him. If Rose spent an hour playing the fool in another study, Philip would receive him when he returned to his own with a sullen frown. He would sulk for a day, and he suffered more because Rose either did not notice his ill-humor or deliberately ignored it. Not seldom Philip, knowing all the time how stupid he was, would force a quarrel, and they would not speak to one another for a couple of days. But Philip could not bear to be angry with him long, and even when convinced that he was in the right, would apologize humbly. Then for a week they would be as great friends as ever. But the best was over, and Philip could see that Rose often walked with him merely from old habit or from fear of his anger. They had not so much to say to one another as at first, and Rose was often bored. Philip felt that his lameness began to irritate him. Towards the end of the term two or three boys caught scarlet fever and there was much talk of sending them all home in order to escape an epidemic. But the sufferers were isolated, and since no more were attacked it was supposed that the outbreak was stopped. One of the stricken was Philip. He remained in hospital through the Easter holidays, and at the beginning of the summer term was sent home to the vicarage to get a little fresh air. The vicar, notwithstanding medical assurance that the boy was no longer infectious, received him with suspicion. He thought it very inconsiderate of the doctor to suggest that his nephew's convalescence should be spent by the seaside, and consented to have him in the house only because there was nowhere else he could go. Philip went back to school at half-term. He had forgotten the quarrels he had had with Rose, but remembered only that he was his greatest friend. He knew that he had been silly. He made up his mind to be more reasonable." During his illness Rose had sent him in a couple of little notes, and he had ended each with the words, Hurry up and come back. Philip thought Rose must be looking forward as much to his return as he was himself to seeing Rose. He found that, owing to the death from scarlet fever of one of the boys in the sixth, there had been some shifting in the studies, and Rose was no longer in his. It was a bitter disappointment. But as soon as he arrived he burst into Rose's study. Rose was sitting at his desk working with a boy called Hunter and turned round crossly as Philip came in. "'Who the devil's that?' he cried. And then, seeing Philip, "'Oh, it's you!' Philip stopped in embarrassment. "'I thought I'd come by and see how you were. We were just working.' 
Hunter broke into the conversation. "'When did you get back?' Five minutes ago.' They sat and looked at him as though he was disturbing them. They evidently expected him to go quickly. Philip reddened. "'I'll be off. You might look in when you're done,' he said to Rose. "'All right.' Philip closed the door behind him and limped back to his own study. He felt frightfully hurt. Rose, far from seeming glad to see him, had looked almost put out. They might never have been more than acquaintances. Though he waited in his study, not leaving it for a moment just in case then Rose should come, his friend never appeared. And next morning when he went into prayers he saw Rose and Hunter singing a long arm in arm. What he could not see for himself others told him. He had forgotten that three months is a long time in a schoolboy's life, and though he had passed them in solitude, Rose had lived in the world. Hunter had stepped into the vacant place. Philip found that Rose was quietly avoiding him, but he was not the boy to accept a situation without putting it into words. He waited till he was sure Rose was alone in his study and went in. "'May I come in?' he asked. Rose looked at him with an embarrassment that made him angry with Philip. "'Yes, if you want to.' "'It's very kind of you,' said Philip sarcastically. "'What do you want?' "'I say, why have you been so rotten since I came back?' "'Oh, don't be an ass,' said Rose. "'I don't know what you see in Hunter. That's my business.' Philip looked down. He could not bring himself to say what was in his heart. He was afraid of humiliating himself. Rose got up. "'I've got to go to the gym,' he said. When he was at the door, Philip forced himself to speak. "'I say, Rose, don't be a perfect beast. Oh, go to hell!' Rose slammed the door behind him and left Philip alone. Philip shivered with rage. He went back to his study and turned the conversation over in his mind. He hated Rose now. He wanted to hurt him. He thought of biting things he might have said to him. He brooded over the end to their friendship and fancied that others were talking of it. In his sensitiveness he saw sneers and wonderings in other fellows' manner when they were not bothering their heads with him at all. He imagined to himself what they were saying. After all, it wasn't likely to last long. I wonder he ever stuck Carrie at all, blighter. To show his indifference he struck up a violent friendship with a boy called Sharp whom he hated and despised. He was a London boy with a loutish air, a heavy fellow with the beginnings of a moustache on his lip and bushy eyebrows that joined one another across the bridge of his nose. He had soft hands and manners too suave for his ears. He spoke with the suspicion of a cockney accent. He was one of those boys who are too slack to play games, and he exercised great ingenuity in making excuses to avoid such as were compulsory. He was regarded by boys and masters with a vague dislike, and it was from arrogance that Philip now sought his society. Sharp, in a couple of terms, was going to Germany for a year. He hated school, which he looked upon as an indignity to be endured till he was old enough to go out into the world. London was all he cared for, and he had many stories to tell of his doings there during the holidays. From his conversation he spoke in a soft, deep-toned voice, there emerged the vague rumor of the London streets by night. Philip listened to him at once, fascinated and repelled. With his vivid fancy he seemed to see the surging throng round the pit-door of theatres and the glitter of cheap restaurants, bars where men, half-drunk, sat on high stools talking with barmaids, and under the street lamps the mysterious passing of dark crowds bent upon pleasure. Sharp lent him cheap novels from Hollywood Row, which Philip read in his cubicle with a sort of wonderful fear. Once Rose tried to effect a reconciliation. He was a good-natured fellow who did not like having enemies. I say, Carrie, why are you being such a silly ass? It doesn't do you any good cutting me and all that. I don't know what you mean, answered Philip. Well, I don't see why you shouldn't talk. You bore me, said Philip. Please yourself. Rose shrugged his shoulders and left him. Philip was very white, as he always became when he was moved, and his heart beat violently. When Rose went away he felt suddenly sick with misery. He did not know why he had answered in that fashion. He would have given anything to be friends with Rose. He hated to have quarreled with him, and now that he saw he had given him pain he was very sorry. 
but at the moment he had not been master of himself. It seemed that some devil had seized him, forcing him to say bitter things against his will, even though at the time he wanted to shake hands with Rose and meet him more than halfway. The desire to wound had been too strong for him. He had wanted to revenge himself for the pain and the humiliation he had endured. It was pride. It was folly, too, for he knew that Rose would not care at all, while he would suffer bitterly. The thought came to him that he would go to Rose and say, I say, I'm sorry I was such a beast. I couldn't help it. Let's make it up. But he knew he would never be able to do it. He was afraid that Rose would sneer at him. He was angry with himself, and when Sharp came in a little while afterwards he seized upon the first opportunity to quarrel with him. Philip, had a fiendish instinct for discovering other people's raw spots, and was able to say things that rankled because they were true. But Sharp had the last word. I heard Rose talking about you to Mellor just now, he said. Mellor said, Why didn't you kick him? It would teach him manners. And Rose said, I didn't like to. Damn crippled. Philip suddenly became scarlet. He could not answer, for there was a lump in his throat that almost choked him. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Philip was moved into the sixth, but he hated school now with all his heart, and having lost his ambition, cared nothing whether he did ill or well. He awoke in the morning with a sinking heart because he must go through another day of drudgery. He was tired of having to do things because he was told, and the restrictions irked him not because they were unreasonable, but because they were restrictions. He yearned for freedom. He was weary of repeating things that he knew already, and of the hammering away for the sake of a thick-witted fellow at something that he understood from the beginning. With Mr. Perkins you could work or not as you chose. He was at once eager and abstracted. The sixth form room was in a part of the old abbey which had been restored, and it had a Gothic window. Philip tried to cheat his boredom by drawing this over and over again and sometimes out of his head he drew the great tower of the cathedral or the gateway that led into the precincts. He had a knack for drawing. Aunt Louisa during her youth had painted in watercolors, and she had several albums filled with sketches of churches, old bridges, and picturesque cottages. They were often shown at the vicarage tea parties. She had once given Philip a paint-box as a Christmas present, and he had started by copying her pictures. He copied them better than anyone could have expected, and presently he did little pictures of his own. Mrs. Carey encouraged him. It was a good way to keep him out of mischief, and later on his sketches would be useful for bazaars. Two or three of them had been framed and hung in his bedroom. But one day at the end of the morning's work Mr. Perkins stopped him as he was lounging out of the form room. "'I want to speak to you, Carey.' Philip waited. Mr. Perkins ran his lean fingers through his beard and looked at Philip. He seemed to be thinking over what he wanted to say. "'What's the matter with you, Carrie?' he said abruptly. Philip, flushing, looked at him quickly. But knowing him well by now, without answering, he waited for him to go on. "'I've been dissatisfied with you lately. You've been slack and inattentive. You seem to take no interest in your work. It's been slovenly and bad.' "'I'm very sorry, sir.' said Philip. Is that all you have to say for yourself? Philip looked down sulkily. How could he answer that he was bored to death? You know, this term you'll go down instead of up. I shan't give you a very good report. Philip wondered what he would say if he knew how the report was treated. It arrived at breakfast. Mr. Carey glanced at it indifferently and passed it over to Philip. There's your report. You better see what it says, he remarked as he ran his fingers through the wrapper of a catalogue of second-hand books. Philip read it. "'Is it good?' asked Aunt Louisa. "'Not so good as I deserve,' answered Philip, with a smile, giving it to her. "'I'll read it afterwards when I've got my spectacles,' she said. But after breakfast Marianne came in to say the butcher was there, and she generally forgot. Mr. Perkins went on. "'I'm disappointed with you, and I can't understand.' I know you can do things if you want to, but you don't seem to want to any more. I was going to make you a monitor next term, but I think I'd better wait a bit." Philip flushed. 
He did not like the thought of being passed over. He tightened his lips. And there's something else. You must begin thinking of your scholarship now. You won't get anything unless you start working very seriously. Philip was irritated by the lecture. He was angry with the headmaster and angry with himself. I don't think I'm going up to Oxford, he said. Why not? I thought your idea was to be ordained. I've changed my mind. Why? Philip did not answer. Mr. Perkins, holding himself oddly as he always did, like a figure in one of Perugino's pictures, drew his fingers thoughtfully through his beard. He looked at Philip as though he were trying to understand, and then abruptly told him he might go. Apparently he was not satisfied, for one evening a week later, when Philip had to go into his study with some papers, he resumed the conversation. But this time he adopted a different method. He spoke to Philip not as a schoolmaster with a boy, but as one human being with another. He did not seem to care now that Philip's work was poor, that he ran small chance against keen rivals of carrying off the scholarship necessary for him to go to Oxford. The important matter was his changed intention about his life afterwards. Mr. Perkins set himself to revive his eagerness to be ordained. With infinite skill he worked on his feelings, and this was easier since he was himself genuinely moved. Philip's change of mind caused him bitter distress, and he really thought he was throwing away his chance of happiness in life, for he knew not what. His voice was very persuasive, and Philip, easily moved by the emotion of others, very emotional himself, notwithstanding a placid exterior, his face partly by nature but also from the habit of all these years at school, seldom except by his quick flushing showed what he felt, Philip was deeply touched by what the master said. He was very grateful to him for the interest he showed, and he was conscience-stricken by the grief which he felt his behavior caused him. It was subtly flattering to know that with the whole school to think about Mr. Perkins should trouble with him, but at the same time something else in him, like another person standing at his elbow, clung desperately to two words. I won't, I won't, I won't. He felt himself slipping. He was powerless against the weakness that seemed to well up in him. It was like the water that rises up in an empty bottle held over a full basin, and he set his teeth saying the words over and over to himself. I won't. I won't. I won't. At last Mr. Perkins put his hand on Philip's shoulder. I don't want to influence you, he said. You must decide for yourself. Pray to Almighty God for help and guidance. When Philip came out of the headmaster's house there was a light rain falling. He went under the archway that led to the precincts. There was not a soul there, and the rooks were silent in the elms. He walked round slowly. He felt hot, and the rain did him good. He thought over all that Mr. Perkins had said, calmly now that he was withdrawn from the fervor of his personality, and he was thankful he had not given way. In the darkness he could but vaguely see the great mass of the cathedral. He hated it now because of the irksomeness of the long services which he was forced to attend. The anthem was interminable, and you had to stand drearily while it was being sung. You could not hear the droning sermon, and your body twitched because you had to sit still when you wanted to move about. Then Philip thought of the two services every Sunday at Blackstable. The church was bare and cold, and there was a smell all about one of pomade and starched clothes. The curate preached once, and his uncle preached once. As he grew up he had learned to know his uncle. Philip was downright and intolerant, and he could not understand that a man might sincerely say things as a clergyman which he had never acted up to as a man. The deception outraged him. His uncle was a weak and selfish man whose chief desire it was to be saved trouble. Mr. Perkins had spoken to him of the beauty of a life dedicated to the service of God. Philip knew what sort of lives the clergy led in the corner of East Anglia which was his home. There was the vicar of Whitestone, a parish a little way from Blackstable. He was a bachelor, and to give himself something to do had lately taken up farming. The local paper constantly reported the cases he had in the county court against this one and that, laborers he would not pay their wages to, or tradesmen whom he accused of cheating him. 
scandal said he starved his cows and there was much talk about some general action which should be taken against him then there was the vicar of fern a bearded fine figure of a man his wife had been forced to leave him because of his cruelty and she had filled the neighborhood with stories of his immorality the vicar of searle a tiny hamlet by the sea was to be seen every evening in the public house a stone's throw from his vicarage and the church wardens had been to mr carey to ask his advice there was not a soul for any of them to talk to except small farmers or fishermen there were long winter evenings when the wind blew whistling drearily through the leafless trees and all around they saw nothing but the bare monotony of ploughed fields and there was poverty and there was lack of any work that seemed to matter every kink in their characters had free play there was nothing to restrain them they grew narrow and eccentric philip knew all this but in his young intolerance he did not offer it as an excuse he shivered at the thought of leading such a life he wanted to get out into the world End of chapter twenty recording by tom weiss tom's audiobooks dot com chapters twenty one through twenty three of of human bondage this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maud. Chapter 21. Mr. Perkins soon saw that his words had had no effect on Philip, and for the rest of the term ignored him. He wrote a report which was vitriolic. When it arrived and Aunt Louisa asked Philip what it was like, he answered cheerfully, Rotten! is it said the vicar i must look at it again do you think there's any use in my staying on at turcanbury i should have thought it would be better if i went to germany for a bit what has put that in your head said aunt louisa don't you think it's a rather a good idea sharp had already left king's school and had written to philip from hanover he was really starting life and it made philip more restless to think of it he felt he could not bear another year of restraint but then you won't get a scholarship i haven't a chance of getting one anyhow and besides i don't know that i particularly want to go to oxford but if you're going to be ordained philip aunt louisa exclaimed in dismay i've given up that idea long ago mrs carey looked at him with startled eyes and then used to self-restraint she poured out another cup of tea for his uncle they did not speak in a moment Philip saw tears slowly falling down her cheeks. His heart was suddenly wrung because he caused her pain. In her tight black dress made by the dressmaker down the street, with her wrinkled face and pale tired eyes, her gray hair still done in the frivolous ringlets of her youth, she was a ridiculous but strangely pathetic figure. Philip saw it for the first time. Afterwards, when the vicar was shut up in his study with the curate, he put his arms round her waist. "'I say, I'm sorry you're upset, Aunt Louisa,' he said. "'But it's no good my being ordained if I haven't a real vocation, is it?' "'I'm so disappointed, Philip,' she moaned. "'I'd set my heart on it. I thought you could be your uncle's curate, and then when our time came. After all, we can't last forever, can we? You might have taken his place.' Philip shivered. He was seized with panic. His heart beat like a pigeon in a trap beating with its wings. His aunt wept softly her head upon his shoulder. "'I wish you'd persuade Uncle William to let me leave Turcanbury. I'm so sick of it.' But the vicar of Blackstable did not easily alter any arrangements he had made, and it had always been intended that Philip should stay at King's School till he was eighteen, and should then go to Oxford. At all events he would not hear of Philip leaving then, for no notice had been given, and the term's fee would have to be paid in any case. "'Then will you give notice for me to leave at Christmas?' said Philip at the end of a long and often bitter conversation. "'I'll write to Mr. Perkins about it and see what he says. Oh, I wish to goodness I were twenty-one. It is awful to be at somebody else's beck and call.' "'Philip, you shouldn't speak to your uncle like that,' said Mrs. Carey gently. 
but don't you see that Perkins will want me to stay? He gets so much ahead for every chap in the school. Why don't you want to go to Oxford? What's the good if I'm not going into the church? You can't go into the church. You're in the church already, said the vicar. Ordained, then, replied Philip impatiently. What are you going to be, Philip? asked Mrs. Carey. I don't know. I've not made up my mind, but whatever I am it'll be useful to know foreign languages. I shall get far more out of a year in Germany than by staying on at that hole. He would not say that he felt Oxford would be little better than a continuation of his life at school. He wished immensely to be his own master. Besides, he would be known to a certain extent among old schoolfellows, and he wanted to get away from them all. He felt that his life at school had been a failure. He wanted to start fresh. It happened that his desire to go to Germany fell in with certain ideas which had been of late discussed at Blackstable. Sometimes friends came to stay with the doctor and brought news of the world outside, and the visitors spending August by the sea had their own way of looking at things. The vicar had heard that there were people who did not think the old-fashioned education so useful nowadays as it had been in the past, and modern languages were gaining an importance which they had not had in his own youth. His own mind was divided, for a younger brother of his had been sent to Germany when he failed in some examination, thus creating a precedent, but since he had there died of typhoid it was impossible to look upon the experiment as other than dangerous. The result of innumerable conversations was that Philip should go back to Turkhanbury for another term, and then should leave. With this agreement Philip was not dissatisfied, but when he had been back a few days the headmaster spoke to him. "'I've had a letter from your uncle. It appears you want to go to Germany, and he asked me what I think about it.' Philip was astounded. He was furious with his guardian for going back on his word. "'I thought it was settled, sir,' he said. "'Far from it. I've written to say I think it is the greatest mistake to take you away.' Philip immediately sat down and wrote a violent letter to his uncle. He did not measure his language. He was so angry that he could not get to sleep till quite late that night, and he awoke in the early morning and began brooding over the way they had treated him. He waited impatiently for an answer. In two or three days it came. It was a mild, pained letter from Aunt Louisa, saying that he should not write such things to his uncle, who was very much distressed he was unkind and unchristian. He must know they were only trying to do their best for him, and they were so much older than he that they must be better judges of what was good for him. Philip clenched his hands. He had heard that statement so often, and he could not see why it was true. They did not know the conditions as he did. Why should they accept as self-evident that their greater age gave them greater wisdom? The letter ended with the information that Mr. Carey had withdrawn the notice he had given. Philip nursed his wrath till the next half-holiday. They had them on Tuesdays and Thursdays, since on Saturday afternoons they had to go to a service in the cathedral. He stopped behind when the rest of the sixth went out. "'May I go to Blackstable this afternoon, please, sir?' he asked. "'No,' said the headmaster briefly. "'I wanted to see my uncle about something very important.' "'Didn't you hear me say no?' Philip did not answer. He went out. He felt almost sick with humiliation, the humiliation of having to ask, and the humiliation of the curt refusal. He hated the headmaster now. Philip writhed under that despotism which never vouchsafed the reason for the most tyrannous act. He was too angry to care what he did, and after dinner walked down to the station by the back ways he knew so well just in time to catch the train to Blackstable. He walked into the vicarage and found his uncle and aunt sitting in the dining-room. "'Hello, where have you sprung from?' said the vicar. It was very clear that he was not pleased to see him. He looked a little uneasy. "'I thought I'd come and see you about my leaving. I wanted to know what you mean by promising me one thing when I was here and doing something different a week later.' He was a little frightened at his own boldness, but he had made up his mind exactly what words to use, and though his heart beat violently he forced himself to say them. "'Have you got leave to come here this afternoon?' "'No,' I asked Perkins, and he refused. 
If you like to write and tell him I've been here, you can get me into a really fine old row. Mrs. Carey sat knitting with trembling hands. She was unused to scenes, and they agitated her extremely. "'It would serve you right if I told him,' said Mr. Carey. "'If you like to be a perfect sneak, you can. After writing to Perkins as you did, you're quite capable of it.' It was foolish of Philip to say that, because it gave the vicar exactly the opportunity he wanted. "'I'm not going to sit still while you say impertinent things to me,' he said with dignity. He got up and walked quickly out of the room into his study. Philip heard him shut the door and lock it. "'Oh, I wish to God I were twenty-one. It is awful to be tied down like this.' Aunt Louisa began to cry quietly. "'Oh, Philip, you ought to have spoken to your uncle like that. Do please go and tell him you're sorry.' "'I'm not in the least sorry. He's taking a mean advantage. Of course it's just waste of money keeping me on at school, but what does he care? It's not his money.' It was cruel to put me under the guardianship of people who know nothing about things. Philip! Philip, in his voluble anger, stopped suddenly at the sound of her voice. It was broken-hearted. He had not realized what bitter things he was saying. Philip, how can you be so unkind? You know we are only trying to do our best for you, and we know that we have no experience. It isn't as if we had any children of our own. That's why we consulted, Mr. Perkins. Her voice broke. I've tried to be like a mother to you. I've loved you as if you were my own son. She was so small and frail, there was something so pathetic in her old maidish air, that Philip was touched. A great lump came suddenly in his throat and his eyes filled with tears. I'm so sorry, he said. I didn't mean to be beastly. He knelt down beside her and took her in his arms, and kissed her wet, withered cheeks. She sobbed bitterly, and he seemed to feel on a sudden the pity of that wasted life. She had never surrendered herself before to such a display of emotion. "'I know I've not been what I wanted to be to you, Philip, but I didn't know how. It's been just as dreadful for me to have no children as for you to have no mother.' Philip forgot his anger and his own concerns, but thought only of consoling her with broken words and clumsy little caresses. Then the clock struck, and he had to bolt off at once to catch the only train that would get him back to Turkhanbury in time for call-over. As he sat in the corner of the railway carriage he saw that he had done nothing. He was angry with himself for his weakness. It was despicable to have allowed himself to be turned from his purpose by the pompous airs of the vicar and the tears of his aunt but as the result of he knew not what conversations between the couple, another letter was written to the headmaster. Mr. Perkins read it with an impatient shrug of the shoulders. He showed it to Philip. It ran. Dear Mr. Perkins, forgive me for troubling you again about my ward, but both his aunt and I have been uneasy about him. He seems very anxious to leave school, and his aunt thinks he is unhappy. It is very difficult for us to know what to do, as we are not his parents. He does not seem to think he is doing very well, and he feels it is wasting his money to stay on. I should be very much obliged if you would have a talk to him, and if he is still of the same mind perhaps it would be better if he left at Christmas as I originally intended. Yours very truly, William Carey. Philip gave him back the letter. He felt a thrill of pride in his triumph. He had got his own way, and he was satisfied. His will had gained a victory over the wills of others. It's not much good my spending half an hour writing to your uncle if he changes his mind the next letter he gets from you, said the headmaster irritably. Philip said nothing, and his face was perfectly placid, but he could not prevent the twinkle in his eyes. Mr. Perkins noticed it and broke into a little laugh. You've rather scored, haven't you? he said. Then Philip smiled outright. He could not conceal his exultation. "'Is it true that you're very anxious to leave?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Are you unhappy here?' Philip blushed. He hated instinctively any attempt to get into the depths of his feelings. "'Oh, I don't know, sir.' Mr. Perkins, slowly dragging his fingers through his beard, looked at him thoughtfully. He seemed to speak almost to himself. 
Of course schools are made for the average. The holes are all round, and whatever shape the pegs are they must wedge in somehow. One hasn't time to bother about anything but the average. Then suddenly he addressed himself to Philip. Look here. I've got a suggestion to make to you. It's getting on towards the end of the term now. Another term won't kill you, and if you want to go to Germany you'd better go after Easter than after Christmas. It'll be much pleasanter in the spring than in midwinter. If at the end of the next term you still want to go, I'll make no objection. What do you say to that? Thank you very much, sir. Philip was so glad to have gained the last three months that he did not mind the extra term. The school seemed less of a prison when he knew that before Easter he would be free from it forever. His heart danced within him. That evening in chapel he looked round at the boys, standing according to their forms, each in his due place, and he chuckled with satisfaction at the thought that soon he would never see them again. It made him regard them almost with a friendly feeling. His eyes rested on Rose. Rose took his position as a monitor very seriously. He had quite an idea of being a good influence in the school. It was his turn to read the lesson that evening, and he read it very well. Philip smiled when he thought that he would be rid of him forever, and it would not matter in six months whether Rose was tall and straight-limbed, and where would the importance be that he was a monitor and captain of the eleventh? Philip looked at the masters in their gowns. Gordon was dead. He had died of apoplexy two years before, but all the rest were there. Philip knew now what a poor lot they were, except Turner, perhaps. There was something of a man in him, and he writhed at the thought of the subjection in which they had held him. In six months they would not matter either. Their praise would mean nothing to him, and he would shrug his shoulders at their censure. Philip had learned not to express his emotions by outward signs and shyness still tormented him, but he had often very high spirits, and then, though he limped about demurely, silent and reserved, it seemed to be hallooing in his heart. He seemed to himself to walk more lightly. All sorts of ideas danced through his head, fancies chased one another so furiously that he could not catch them, but their coming and their going filled him with exhilaration. Now, being happy, he was able to work, and during the remaining weeks of the term set himself to make up for his long neglect. His brain worked easily, and he took a keen pleasure in the activity of his intellect. He did very well in the examinations that closed the term. Mr. Perkins made only one remark. He was talking to him about an essay he had written, and, after the usual criticism, said, "'So you've made up your mind to stop playing the fool for a bit, have you?' He smiled at him with his shining teeth and Philip, looking down, gave an embarrassed smile. The half-dozen boys who expected to divide between them the various prizes which were given at the end of the summer term had ceased to look upon Philip as a serious rival, but now they began to regard him with some uneasiness. He told no one that he was leaving at Easter, and so was in no sense a competitor, but left them to their anxieties. He knew that Rose flattered himself on his French, for he had spent two or three holidays in France, and he expected to get the dean's prize for English essay. Philip got a good deal of satisfaction in watching his dismay when he saw how much better Philip was doing in these subjects than himself. Another fellow, Norton, could not go to Oxford unless he got one of the scholarships at the disposal of the school. He asked Philip if he was going in for them. "'Have you any objection?' asked Philip. It entertained him to think that he held someone else's future in his hand. There was something romantic in getting these various rewards actually in his grasp, and then leaving them to others because he disdained them. At last the breaking-up day came, and he went to Mr. Perkins to bid him good-bye. "'You don't mean to say you really want to leave?' Philip's face fell at the headmaster's evident surprise. "'You said you wouldn't put any objection in the way, sir,' he answered. I thought it was only a whim that I'd better humor. I know you're obstinate and headstrong. What on earth do you want to leave for now? You've only got another term in any case. You can get the Magdalen scholarship easily. You'll get half the prizes we've got to give. Philip looked at him sullenly. He felt that he had been tricked, 
but he had the promise, and Perkins would have to stand by it. You'll have a very pleasant time at Oxford. You needn't decide at once what you're going to do afterwards. I wonder if you realize how delightful a life is up there for anyone who has brains. I've made all my arrangements now to go to Germany, sir, said Philip. Are they arrangements that couldn't possibly be altered? asked Mr. Perkins, with his quizzical smile. I shall be very sorry to lose you. In schools, the rather stupid boys who work always do better than the clever boys who's idle, but when the clever boy works, why then, he does what you've done this term. Philip flushed darkly. He was unused to compliments, and no one had ever told him he was clever. The headmaster put his hand on Philip's shoulder. You know, driving things into the heads of thick-witted boys is dull work, but when now and then you have the chance of teaching a boy who comes halfway towards you, who understands almost before you've got the words out of your mouth, why, then teaching is the most exhilarating thing in the world. Philip was melted by kindness. It had never occurred to him that it mattered really to Mr. Perkins whether he went or stayed. He was touched and immensely flattered. It would be pleasant to end his school days with glory and then go to Oxford. In a flash there appeared before him the life which he had heard described from boys who came back to play in the OKS match or in letters from the university read out in one of the studies. But he was ashamed. He would look such a fool in his own eyes if he gave in now. His uncle would chuckle at the success of the headmaster's ruse. It was rather a come-down from the dramatic surrender of all these prizes which were in his reach, because he disdained to take them to the plain, ordinary winning of them. It only required a little more persuasion, just enough to save his self-respect, and Philip would have done anything that Mr. Perkins wished. But his face showed nothing of his conflicting emotions. It was placid and sullen. "'I think I'd rather go, sir,' he said." Mr. Perkins, like many men who manage things by their personal influence, grew a little impatient when his power was not immediately manifest. He had a great deal of work to do and could not waste more time on a boy who seemed to him insanely obstinate. "'Very well. I promise to let you if you really wanted it, and I keep my promise. When do you go to Germany?' Philip's heart beat violently. The battle was won, and he did not know whether he had not rather lost it. "'At the beginning of May, sir,' he answered. "'Well, you must come and see us when you get back.' He held out his hand. If he had given him one more chance, Philip would have changed his mind, but he seemed to look upon the matter as settled. Philip walked out of the house. His school days were over, and he was free. But the wild exultation to which he had looked forward at that moment was not there. He walked round the precincts slowly, and a profound depression seized him. He wished now that he had not been foolish. He did not want to go, but he knew he could never bring himself to go to the headmaster and tell him he would stay. That was a humiliation he could never put upon himself. He wondered whether he had done right. He was dissatisfied with himself and with all his circumstances. He asked himself dully whether, whenever you got your way, you wished afterwards that you hadn't. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 Philip's uncle had an old friend called Miss Wilkinson who lived in Berlin. She was the daughter of a clergyman, and it was with her father, the rector of a village in Lincolnshire, that Mr. Carey had spent his last curacy. On his death, forced to earn her living, she had taken various situations as a governess in France and Germany. She had kept up correspondence with Mrs. Carey, and two or three times had spent her holidays at Blackstable Vicarage, paying, as was usual with the Carey's unfrequent guests, a small sum for her keep. When it became clear that it was less trouble to yield to Philip's wishes than to resist them, Mrs. Carey wrote to ask her for advice. Miss Wilkinson recommended Heidelberg as an excellent place to learn German in, and the house of Frau Professor Erlen as a comfortable home. Philip might live there for thirty marks a week, and the professor himself, a teacher at the local high school, would instruct him. Philip arrived in Heidelberg one morning in May. His things were put on a barrow, and he followed the porter out of the station. 
The sky was bright blue and the trees in the avenue through which they passed were thick with leaves. There was something in the air fresh to Philip and mingled with the timidity he felt at entering on a new life among strangers was a great exhilaration. He was a little disconsolate that no one had come to meet him and felt very shy when the porter left him at the front door of a big white house. An untidy lad led him in and took him into a drawing-room. It was filled with a large suite covered in green velvet, and in the middle was a round table. On this in water stood a bouquet of flowers tightly packed together in a paper frill like the bone of a mutton-chop, and carefully spaced round it were books in leather bindings. There was a musty smell. Presently, with an odor of cooking, the Frau Professor came in, a short, very stout woman with tightly dressed hair and a red face. She had little eyes, sparkling like beads, and an effusive manner. She took both Philip's hands and asked him about Miss Wilkinson, who had twice spent a few weeks with her. She spoke in German and in broken English. Philip could not make her understand that he did not know Miss Wilkinson. Then her two daughters appeared. They seemed hardly young to Philip, but perhaps they were not more than twenty-five. The elder Tekla was as short as her mother, with the same rather shifty hair, but with a pretty face and abundant dark hair. Anna, her younger sister, was tall and plain, but since she had a pleasant smile Philip immediately preferred her. After a few minutes of polite conversation the Frau Professor took Philip to his room and left him. It was in a turret looking over the tops of the trees in the Anlaga, and the bed was in an alcove so that when you sat at the desk it had not the look of a bedroom at all. Philip unpacked his things and set out all his books. He was his own master at last. A bell summoned him to dinner at one o'clock, and he found the Frau Professor's guest assembled in the drawing-room. He was introduced to her husband, a tall man of middle age with a large fair head turning now to gray and mild blue eyes. He spoke to Philip in correct, rather archaic English, having learned it from a study of the English classics, not from conversation, and it was odd to hear him use words colloquially which Philip had only met in the plays of Shakespeare. Frau Professor Erlin called her establishment a family and not a pension, but it would have required the subtlety of a metaphysician to find out exactly where the difference lay. When they sat down to dinner in the long dark apartment that led out of the drawing-room, Philip, feeling very shy, saw that there were sixteen people. The Frau Professor sat at one end and carved. The service was conducted with a great clattering of plates by the same clumsy lout who had opened the door for him, and though he was quick it happened that the first persons to be served had finished before the last had received their appointed portions. The Frau Professor insisted that nothing but German should be spoken, so that Philip, even if his bashfulness had permitted him to be talkative, was forced to hold his tongue. He looked at the people among whom he was to live. By the Frau Professor sat several old ladies, but Philip did not give them much of his attention. There were two young girls, both fair and one of them very pretty, whom Philip heard addressed as Fräulein Hedwig and Fräulein Cassili. Fräulein Cassili had a long pigtail hanging down her back. They sat side by side and chattered to one another with smothered laughter. Now and then they glanced at Philip, and one of them said something in an undertone. They both giggled, and Philip blushed awkwardly, feeling that they were making fun of him. Near them sat a Chinaman with a yellow face and an expansive smile who was studying Western conditions at the university. He spoke so quickly with a queer accent that the girls could not always understand him, and then they burst out laughing. He laughed too good-humouredly, and his almond eyes almost closed as he did so. There were two or three American men in black coats, rather yellow and dry of skin. They were theological students. Philip heard the twang of their New England accent through their bad German, and he glanced at them with suspicion, for he had been taught to look upon Americans as wild and desperate barbarians. Afterwards, when they had sat for a little on the stiff green velvet chairs of the drawing-room, Fräulein Anna asked Philip if he would like to go for a walk with them. Philip accepted the invitation. They were quite a party. There were the two daughters of the Frau Professor, the two other girls, one of the American students, and Philip. 
Philip walked by the side of Anna and Fraulein Hedwig. He was a little fluttered. He had never known any girls. At Blackstable there were only the farmer's daughters and the girls of the local tradesmen. He knew them by name and by sight, but he was timid, and he thought they laughed at his deformity. He accepted willingly the difference which the vicar and Mrs. Carey put between their own exalted rank and that of the farmers. The doctor had two daughters, but they were both much older than Philip and had been married to successive assistants while Philip was still a small boy. At school there had been two or three girls of more boldness than modesty whom some of the boys knew, and desperate stories, due in all probability to the masculine imagination, were told of intrigues with them. But Philip had always concealed under a lofty contempt the terror with which they filled him. His imagination in the books he had read had inspired in him a desire for the bryonic attitude, and he was torn between a morbid self-consciousness and a conviction that he owed it to himself to be gallant. He felt now that he should be bright and amusing, but his brain seemed empty and he could not for the life of him think of anything to say. Fräulein Anna, the Frau Professor's daughter, addressed herself to him frequently from a sense of duty, but the other said little. She looked at him now and then with sparkling eyes, and sometimes to his confusion laughed outright. Philip felt that she thought him perfectly ridiculous. They walked along the side of a hill among pine trees, and their pleasant odor caused Philip a keen delight. The day was warm and cloudless. At last they came to an eminence from which they saw the valley of the Rhine spread out before them under the sun. It was a vast stretch of country, sparkling with golden light, with cities in the distance, and through it meandered the silver riband of the river. Wide spaces are rare in the corner of Kent, which Philip knew. The sea offers the only broad horizon, and the immense distance he saw now gave him a peculiar and indescribable thrill. He felt suddenly elated. Though he did not know it, it was the first time that he had experienced, quite undiluted with foreign emotions, the sense of beauty. They sat on a bench, the three of them, for the others had gone on, and while the girls talked in rapid German, Philip, indifferent to their proximity, feasted his eyes. "'By Jove, I am happy,' he said to himself, unconsciously. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 Philip thought occasionally of the King's School at Turcanbury and laughed to himself as he remembered what at some particular moment of the day they were doing. Now and then he dreamed that he was still there, and it gave him an extraordinary satisfaction, on awaking, to realize that he was in his little room in the turret. From his bed he could see the great cumulus clouds that hung in the blue sky. He reveled in his freedom. He could go to bed when he chose, and get up when the fancy took him. There was no one to order him about. It struck him that he need not tell any more lies. It had been arranged that Professor Erlin should teach him Latin and German. A Frenchman came every day to give him lessons in French, and the Frau Professor had recommended for mathematics an Englishman who was taking a philological degree at the university. This was a man named Wharton. Philip went to him every morning. He lived in one room on the top floor of a shabby house. It was dirty and untidy, and it was filled with a pungent odor made up of many different stinks. He was generally in bed when Philip arrived at ten o'clock, and he jumped out, put on a filthy dressing gown and felt slippers, and, while he gave instruction, ate his simple breakfast. He was a short man, stout from excessive beer drinking, with a heavy moustache and long unkempt hair. He had been in Germany for five years and was become very Teutonic. He spoke with scorn of Cambridge where he had taken his degree and with horror of the life which awaited him when, having taken his doctorate in Heidelberg, he must return to England and a pedagogic career. He adored the life of the German university with its happy freedom and its jolly companionships. He was a member of the Burschenschaft and promised to take Philip to a Kniep. He was very poor and made no secret that the lessons he was giving Philip meant the difference between meat for his dinner and bread and cheese. Sometimes after a heavy night he had such a headache that he could not drink his coffee, and he gave his lesson with heaviness of spirit. 
for these occasions he kept a few bottles of beer under the bed, and one of these and a pipe would help him to bear the burden of life. A hair of the dog that bit him, he would say as he poured out the beer carefully so that the foam should not make him wait too long to drink. Then he would talk to Philip of the university, the quarrels between rival corps, the duels, and the merits of this and that professor. Philip learnt more of life from him than of mathematics. Sometimes Warden would sit back with a laugh and say, "'Look here, we've not done anything today. You needn't pay me for the lesson.' "'Oh, it doesn't matter,' said Philip. This was something new and very interesting, and he felt that it was of greater import than trigonometry, which he never could understand. It was like a window on life that he had a chance of peeping through, and he looked with a wildly beating heart. "'No, you can keep your dirty money,' said Wharton. "'But how about your dinner?' said Philip with a smile, for he knew exactly how his master's finances stood. Wharton had even asked him to pay him the two shillings which the lesson cost once a week rather than once a month, since it made things less complicated. "'Oh, never mind my dinner. It won't be the first time I've dined off a bottle of beer, and my mind's never clearer than when I do.' He dived under the bed, the sheets were gray with want of washing, and fished out another bottle. Philip, who was young and did not know the good things of life, refused to share it with him, so he drank alone. "'How long are you going to stay here?' asked Wharton. Both he and Philip had given up with relief the pretense of mathematics. "'Oh, I don't know. I suppose about a year. Then my people want me to go to Oxford.' Wharton gave a contemptuous shrug of the shoulders. It was a new experience for Philip to learn that there were persons who did not look upon that seat of learning with awe. "'What do you want to go there for? You'll only be a glorified schoolboy. Why don't you matriculate here? A year's no good. Spend five years here. You know, there are two good things in life, freedom of thought and freedom of action. In France you get freedom of action. You can do what you like and nobody bothers, but you must think like everybody else.' In Germany you must do what everybody else does, but you may think as you choose. They're both very good things. I personally prefer freedom of thought. But in England you get neither. You're ground down by convention. You can't think as you like and you can't act as you like. That's because it's a democratic nation. I expect America's worse. He leaned back cautiously, for the chair on which he sat had a rickety leg, and it was disconcerting when a rhetorical flourish was interrupted by a sudden fall to the floor. "'I ought to go back to England this year, but if I can scrape together enough to keep body and soul on speaking terms I shall stay another twelve months. But then I shall have to go, and I must leave all this.' He waved his arm round the dirty garret with its unmade bed, the clothes lying on the floor, a row of empty beer bottles against the wall, piles of unbound ragged books in every corner, for some provincial university where I shall try and get a chair of philology, and I shall play tennis and go to tea parties. He interrupted himself and gave Philip, very neatly dressed, with a clean collar on and his hair well brushed, a quizzical look, and my God, I shall have to wash. Philip reddened, feeling his own spruceness an intolerable reproach for of late he had begun to pay some attention to his toilet, and he had come out from England with a pretty selection of ties. The summer came upon the country like a conqueror. Each day was beautiful. The sky had an arrogant blue which goaded the nerves like a spur. The green of the trees in the Anlaga was violent and crude, and the houses when the sun caught them had a dazzling white which stimulated till it hurt. Sometimes on his way back from Wharton, Philip would sit in the shade on one of the benches in the Anlaga, enjoying the coolness and watching the patterns of light which the sun, shining through the leaves, made on the ground. His soul danced with delight as gaily as the sunbeams. He reveled in those moments of idleness stolen from his work. Sometimes he sauntered through the streets of the old town. He looked with awe at the students of the corps, their cheeks gashed and red, who swaggered about in their colored caps. In the afternoons he wandered about the hills with the girls in the Frau Professor's house, and sometimes they went up the river and had tea in a leafy beer garden. In the evenings they walked round and round the Stadt garden, listening to the band. Philip soon learned the various interests of the household, 
Fraulein Tekla, the professor's elder daughter, was engaged to a man in England who had spent twelve months in the house to learn German, and their marriage was to take place at the end of the year. But the young man wrote that his father, an India rubber merchant who lived in Slough, did not approve of the union, and Fraulein Tekla was often in tears. Sometimes she and her mother might be seen with stern eyes and determined mouths looking over the letters of the reluctant lover. Tekla painted in watercolor, and occasionally she and Philip, with another of the girls to keep them company, would go out and paint little pictures. The pretty Fraulein Hedwig had amorous troubles too. She was the daughter of a merchant in Berlin, and a dashing hussar had fallen in love with her, a von if you please, but his parents opposed a marriage with a person of her condition, and she had been sent to Heidelberg to forget him. She could never, never do this, and corresponded with him continually, and he was making every effort to induce an exasperating father to change his mind. She told all this to Philip with pretty sighs and becoming blushes, and showed him the photograph of the gay lieutenant. Philip liked her best of all the girls at the Frau Professor's, and on their walks always tried to get by her side. He blushed a great deal when the others chafed him for his obvious preference. He made the first declaration in his life to Fraulein Hedwig, but unfortunately it was an accident, and it happened in this manner. In the evenings when they did not go out, the young women sang little songs in the green velvet drawing-room, while Fraulein Anna, who always made herself useful, industriously accompanied. Fraulein Hedwig's favorite song was Ich liebe dich, I love you, and one evening after she had sung this, when Philip was standing with her on the balcony looking at the stars, it occurred to him to make some remark about it. He began, Ich liebe dich. His German was halting, and he looked about for the word he wanted. The pause was infinitesimal, but before he could go on, Fraulein Hedwig said, Ach, Herr Carey, Sie müssen mir nicht du sagen. You mustn't talk to me in the second person singular. Philip felt himself grow hot all over, for he would never have dared to do anything so familiar, and he could think of nothing on earth to say. It would be ungallant to explain that he was not making an observation, but merely mentioning the title of a song. In Schultigen Sie, he said, I beg your pardon. It does not matter, she whispered. She smiled pleasantly, quietly, took his hand and pressed it, then turned back into the drawing-room. Next day he was so embarrassed that he could not speak to her, and in his shyness did all that was possible to avoid her. When he was asked to go for the usual walk he refused because he said he had work to do. But Fraulein Hedwig seized an opportunity to speak to him alone. "'Why are you behaving this way?' she said kindly. "'You know I'm not angry with you for what you said last night. You can't help it if you love me. I'm flattered. But although I'm not exactly engaged to Herman, I can never love anyone else, and I look upon myself as his bride. Philip blushed again, but he put on quite the expression of a rejected lover. I hope you'll be very happy, he said. End of chapter 23 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters twenty four through twenty eight of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter twenty four. Professor Erlin gave Philip a lesson every day. He made out a list of books which Philip was to read till he was ready for the final achievement of Faust, and meanwhile, ingeniously enough, started him on a German translation of one of the plays by Shakespeare, which Philip had studied at school. It was the period in Germany of Goethe's highest fame. Notwithstanding his rather condescending attitude towards patriotism, he had been adopted as the national poet, and seemed since the War of Seventy to be one of the most significant glories of national unity. The enthusiasm seemed in the wildness of the Valpurgisnacht to the rattle of artillery at Gravlota. But one mark of a writer's greatness is that different minds can find in him different inspirations, and Professor Erlin, who hated the Prussians, 
gave his enthusiastic to admiration to Goethe because his works, Olympian and sedate, offered the only refuge for a sane mind against the onslaughts of the present generation. There was a dramatist whose name of late had been much heard at Heidelberg, and the winter before one of his plays had been given at the theatre amid the cheers of adherents and the hisses of decent people. Philip heard discussions about it at the Frau Professor's long table, and at these Professor Erlin lost his wonted calm. He beat the table with his fist and drowned all opposition with a roar of his fine, deep voice. It was nonsense, and obscene nonsense. He forced himself to sit the play out, but he did not know whether he was more bored or nauseated. If that was what the theatre was coming to, then it was high time the police stepped in and closed the playhouses. He was no prude and could laugh as well as anyone at the witty immorality of a farce at the Palais Royal, but here was nothing but filth. With an emphatic gesture he held his nose and whistled through his teeth. It was the ruin of the family, the uprooting of morals, the destruction of Germany. Aber Adolf, said the Frau Professor from the other end of the table, calm yourself. He shook his fist at her. He was the mildest of creatures and ventured upon no action of his life without consulting her. No, Helen, I tell you this, he shouted, I would sooner my daughters were lying dead at my feet than see them listening to the garbage of that shameless fellow. The play was The Doll's House, and the author was Henrik Ibsen. Professor Erlin classed him with Richard Wagner, but of him he spoke not with anger but with good-humoured laughter. He was a charlatan, but a successful charlatan, and in that was always something for the comic spirit to rejoice in. Verruchter Karl, a madman, he said. He had seen Lohengrin and that passed muster. It was dull, but no worse. But Siegfried, when he mentioned it, Professor Erlin leaned his head on his hand and bellowed with laughter. Not a melody in it from beginning to end. He could imagine Richard Wagner sitting in his box and laughing till his sides ached at the sight of all the people who were taking it seriously. It was the greatest hoax of the nineteenth century. He lifted his glass of beer to his lips, threw back his head, and drank till the glass was empty. Then, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, he said, I tell you, young people, that before the nineteenth century is out, Wagner will be as dead as mutton. Wagner! I would give all his works for one opera by Donizetti. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 The oddest of Philip's masters was his teacher of French. Monsieur Ducrot was a citizen of Geneva. He was a tall old man with a sallow skin and hollow cheeks, his gray hair was thin and long. He wore shabby black clothes with holes at the elbows of his coat and frayed trousers. His linen was very dirty. Philip had never seen him in a clean collar. He was a man of few words who gave his lesson conscientiously but without enthusiasm, arriving as the clock struck and leaving on the minute. His charges were very small. He was taciturn, and what Philip learnt about him he learnt from others. It appeared that he had fought with Garibaldi against the Pope, but had left Italy in disgust when it was clear that all his efforts for freedom, by which he meant the establishment of a republic, tended to no more than an exchange of yokes. He had been expelled from Geneva, for it was not known what political offences. Philip looked upon him with puzzled surprise for he was very unlike his idea of the revolutionary. He spoke in a low voice and was extraordinarily polite. He never sat down till he was asked to, and, when on rare occasions he met Philip in the street, took off his hat with an elaborate gesture. He never laughed, he never even smiled. A more complete imagination than Philip's might have pictured of youth of splendid hope, for he must have been entering upon manhood in 1848 when kings, remembering their brother of France, went about with an uneasy crick in their necks, and perhaps that passion for liberty which passed through Europe, sweeping before it what of absolutism and tyranny had reared its head during the reaction from the revolution of 1789, filled no breast with a hotter fire. One might fancy him, passionate with theories of human equality and human rights, discussing, arguing, fighting behind barricades in Paris, flying before the Austrian cavalry in Milan, imprisoned here, exiled from there, hoping on and upborne ever with the word which seemed so magical 
the word liberty, till at last, broken with disease and starvation, old, without means to keep body and soul together, but such lessons as he could pick up from poor students, he found himself in that neat little town under the heel of a personal tyranny greater than any in Europe. Perhaps his taciturnity hid a contempt for the human race which had abandoned the great dreams of his youth and now wallowed in sluggish ease, or perhaps these thirty years of revolution had taught him that men are unfit for liberty, and he thought that he had spent his life in the pursuit of that which was not worth the finding, or maybe he was tired out and waited only with indifference for the release of death. One day Philip, with the bluntness of his age, asked him if it was true he had been with Garibaldi. The old man did not seem to attach any importance to the question. He answered quite quietly, in as low a voice as usual, "'Oui, monsieur. They say you were in the commune. Do they? Shall we get on with our work?' He held the book open, and Philip, intimidated, began to translate the passage he had prepared. One day Monsieur Ducrot seemed to be in great pain. He had been scarcely able to drag himself up the many stairs to Philip's room, and when he arrived he sat down heavily, his sallow face drawn, with beads of sweat on his forehead, trying to recover himself. "'I'm afraid you're ill,' said Philip. "'It's of no consequence.' But Philip saw that he was suffering, and at the end of the hour asked whether he would not prefer to give no more lessons till he was better. "'No,' said the old man, in his even low voice, "'I prefer to go on while I am able.' Philip, morbidly nervous when he had to make any reference to money, reddened. "'But it won't make any difference to you,' he said. "'I'll pay you for the lessons just the same. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to give you the money for next week in advance.' M. Ducrot charged eighteen pence an hour. Philip took a ten-mark piece out of his pocket and shyly put it on the table. He could not bring himself to offer it as if the old man were a beggar. "'In that case I think I won't come again till I'm better.' He took the coin, and without anything more than an elaborate bow with which he always took his leave, went out. "'Bonjour, monsieur.' Philip was vaguely disappointed. Thinking he had done a generous thing, he had expected that Monsieur de Croix would overwhelm him with expressions of gratitude. He was taken aback to find that the old teacher accepted the present as though it were his due. He was so young he did not realize how much less is the sense of obligation in those who receive favors than in those who grant them. M. de Croix appeared again five or six days later. He tottered a little more and was very weak, but seemed to have overcome the severity of the attack. He was no more communicative than he had been before. He remained mysterious, aloof, and dirty. He made no reference to his illness till after the lesson and then, just as he was leaving, at the door which he held open, he paused. He hesitated as though to speak were difficult. If it hadn't been for the money you gave me I should have starved. It was all I had to live on. He made his solemn, obsequious bow, and went out. Philip felt a little lump in his throat. He seemed to realize in a fashion the hopeless bitterness of the old man's struggle and how hard life was for him when to himself it was so pleasant. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Philip had spent three months in Heidelberg when one morning the Frau Professor told him that an Englishman named Hayward was coming to stay in the house, and the same evening at supper he saw a new face. For some days the family had lived in a state of excitement. First, as the result of heaven knows what scheming, by dint of humble prayers and veiled threats, the parents of the young Englishman to whom Fräulein Tekla was engaged had invited her to visit them in England, and she had set off with an album of watercolors to show how accomplished she was and a bundle of letters to prove how deeply the young man had compromised himself. A week later Fräulein Hedwig, with radiant smiles, announced that the lieutenant of her affections was coming to Heidelberg with his father and mother. Exhausted by the importunity of their son, and touched by the dowry which Fräulein Hedwig's father offered, the lieutenant's parents had consented to pass through Heidelberg to make the young woman's acquaintance. The interview was satisfactory, and Fräulein Hedwig had the satisfaction of showing her lover in the Stadtgarten to the whole of Frau Professor Erlen's household. The silent old ladies who sat at the top of the table near the Frau Professor were in a flutter, 
and when Fräulein Hedwig said she was to go home at once for the formal engagement to take place, the Frau Professor, regardless of expense, said she would give a my bola. Professor Erlin prided himself on his skill in preparing this mild intoxicant and after supper the large bowl of hock and soda, with scented herbs floating in it and wild strawberries, was placed with solemnity on the round table in the drawing-room. Fräulein Anna teased Philip about the departure of his lady love, and he felt very uncomfortable and rather melancholy. Fräulein Hedwig sang several songs, Fräulein Anna played the wedding march, and the professor sang Die Wacht am Rhein. Amid all this jollification Philip paid little attention to the new arrival. They had sat opposite one another at supper, but Philip was chattering busily with Fräulein Hedwig, and the stranger, knowing no German, had eaten his food in silence. Philip, observing that he wore a pale blue tie, had on that account taken a sudden dislike to him. He was a man of twenty-six, very fair, with long wavy hair through which he passed his hand frequently with a careless gesture. His eyes were large and blue, but the blue was very pale, and they looked rather tired already. He was clean-shaven, and his mouth, notwithstanding its thin lips, was well-shaped. Fräulein Anna took an interest in physiognomy, and she made Philip notice afterwards how finely shaped was his head and how weak was the lower part of his face. The head, she remarked, was the head of a thinker, but the jaw lacked character. Fräulein Anna for doomed to a spinster's life with her high cheekbones and large misshapen nose laid great stress upon character while they talked of him he stood a little apart from the others watching the noisy party with a good-humoured but faintly supercilious expression he was tall and slim he held himself with a deliberate grace weeks one of the american students seeing him alone went up and began to talk to him the pair were oddly contrasted the American, very neat in his black coat and pepper-and-salt trousers, thin and dried up, with something of ecclesiastical unction already in his manner, and the Englishman, in his loose tweed suit, large-limbed and slow of gesture. Philip did not speak to the newcomer till next day. They found themselves alone on the balcony of the drawing-room before dinner. Hayward addressed him. "'You're English, aren't you?' "'Yes. Is the food always as bad as it was last night?' it's always about the same. Beastly, isn't it? Beastly. Philip had found nothing wrong with the food at all, and in fact had eaten it in large quantities with appetite and enjoyment, but he did not want to show himself a person of so little discrimination as to think a dinner good, which another thought execrable. Fräulein Tekla's visit to England made it necessary for her sister to do more in the house, and she could not often spare the time for long walks and Fräulein Cassilli, with her long plait of fair hair and her little snub-nosed face, had of late shown a certain disinclination for society. Fräulein Hedwig was gone, and Weeks, the American who generally accompanied them on their rambles, had set out for a tour of South Germany. Philip was left a good deal to himself. Hayward sought his acquaintance, but Philip had an unfortunate trait. From shyness or from some atavistic inheritance of the cave-dweller, he always disliked people on first acquaintance, and it was not till he became used to them that he got over his first impression. It made him difficult of access. He received Hayward's advances very shyly, and when Hayward asked him one day to go for a walk, he accepted only because he could not think of a civil excuse. He made his usual apology angry with himself for the flushing cheeks he could not control, and trying to carry it off with a laugh. "'I'm afraid I can't walk very fast.' "'Good heavens! I don't walk for a wager. I prefer to stroll. Don't you remember the chapter in Marius when Pater talked of the gentle exercise of walking as the best incentive to conversation?' Philip was a good listener. Though he often thought of clever things to say, it was seldom till after the opportunity to say them had passed. But Hayward was communicative. Anyone more experienced than Philip might have thought he liked to hear himself talk. His supercilious attitude impressed Philip. He could not help admiring and yet being awed by a man who faintly despised so many things which Philip had looked upon as almost sacred. He cast down the fetish of exercise, damning with a contemptuous word hot hunters all those who devoted themselves to its various forms, and Philip did not realize that he was merely putting up in its stead 
the other fetish of culture. They wandered up to the castle and sat on the terrace that overlooked the town. It nestled in the valley along the pleasant Neckar with a comfortable friendliness. The smoke from the chimneys hung over it, a pale blue haze, and the tall roofs, the spires of the churches, gave it a pleasantly medieval air. There was a homeliness in it which warmed the heart. Hayward talked of Richard Feverall and Madame Bovary, of Verlaine, Dante, and Matthew Arnold. In those days Fitzgerald's translation of Omar Khayyam was known only to the elect, and Hayward repeated it to Philip. He was very fond of reciting poetry, his own and that of others, which he did in a monotonous sing-song. By the time they reached home Philip's distrust of Hayward was changed to enthusiastic admiration. They made a practice of walking together every afternoon, and Philip learned presently something of Hayward's circumstances. He was the son of a country judge on whose death some time before he had inherited three hundred a year. His record at Charter House was so brilliant that when he went to Cambridge the master of Trinity Hall went out of his way to express his satisfaction that he was going to that college. He prepared himself for a distinguished career. He moved in the most intellectual circles. He read Browning with enthusiasm and turned up his well-shaped nose at Tennyson. He knew all the details of Shelley's treatment of Harriet. He dabbled in the history of art. On the walls of his room were reproductions of pictures by G. F. Watts, Burne Jones, and Botticelli, and he wrote not without distinction verses of a pessimistic character. His friends told one another that he was a man of excellent gifts, and he listened to them willingly when they prophesied his future eminence. In course of time he became an authority on art and literature. He came under the influence of Newman's Apologia. The picturesqueness of the Roman Catholic faith appealed to his aesthetic sensibility, and it was only the fear of his father's wrath, a plain blunt man of narrow ideas who read Macaulay, which prevented him from going over. When he only got a past degree his friends were astonished, but he shrugged his shoulders and delicately insinuated that he was not the dupe of examiners. He made one feel that a first class was ever so slightly vulgar. He described one of the vivas with tolerant humor. Some fellow in an outrageous collar was asking him questions in logic. It was infinitely tedious, and suddenly he noticed that he wore elastic-sided boots. It was grotesque and ridiculous. So he withdrew his mind and thought of the Gothic beauty of the chapel at King's. But he had spent some delightful days at Cambridge. He had given better dinners than anyone he knew and the conversation in his rooms had often been memorable. He quoted to Philip the exquisite epigram. They told me, Herculetus, they told me you were dead. And now, when he related again the picturesque little anecdote about the examiner and his boots, he laughed. Of course it was folly, he said, but it was a folly in which there was something fine. Philip, with a little thrill, thought it magnificent. Then Hayward went to London to read for the bar. He had charming rooms in Clement's Inn with paneled walls, and he tried to make them look like his old rooms at the hall. He had ambitions that were vaguely political. He described himself as a Whig, and he was put up for a club which was of liberal but gentlemanly flavor. His idea was to practice at the bar. He chose the chancery side as less brutal and get a seat for some pleasant constituency as soon as the various promises made him were carried out. Meanwhile he went a great deal to the opera, and made acquaintance with a small number of charming people who admired the things that he admired. He joined a dining club of which the motto was, The Whole, The Good, and The Beautiful. He formed a platonic friendship with a lady some years older than himself, who lived in Kensington Square and nearly every afternoon he drank tea with her by the light of shaded candles and talked of George Meredith and Walter Pater. It was notorious that any fool could pass the examinations of the bar council, and he pursued his studies in a dilatory fashion. When he was ploughed for his final he looked upon it as a personal affront. At the same time the lady in Kensington Square told him that her husband was coming home from India on leave, and was a man, though worthy in every way, of a commonplace mind who would not understand a young man's frequent visits. Hayward felt that life was full of ugliness, 
His soul revolted from the thought of affronting again the cynicism of examiners, and he saw something rather splendid in kicking away the ball which lay at his feet. He was also a good deal in debt. It was difficult to live in London like a gentleman on three hundred a year, and his heart yearned for the Venice and Florence which John Ruskin had so magically described. He felt that he was unsuited to the vulgar bustle of the bar, for he had discovered that it was not sufficient to put your name on a door to get briefs, and modern politics seemed to lack nobility. He felt himself a poet. He disposed of his rooms in Clement's Inn and went to Italy. He had spent a winter in Florence and a winter in Rome, and now was passing his second summer abroad in Germany so that he might read Goethe in the original. Hayward had one gift which was very precious. He had a real feeling for literature, and he could impart his own passion with an admirable fluency. He could throw himself into sympathy with a writer and see all that was best in him, and then he could talk about him with understanding. Philip had read a great deal but he had read without discrimination everything that happened to come across, and it was very good for him now to meet someone who could guide his taste. He borrowed books from the small lending library which the town possessed, and began reading all the wonderful things that Hayward spoke of. He could not read always with enjoyment, but invariably with perseverance. He was eager for self-improvement. He felt himself very ignorant and very humble." By the end of August, when Weeks returned from South Germany, Philip was completely under Hayward's influence. Hayward did not like Weeks. He deplored the American's black coat and pepper-and-salt trousers, and spoke with a scornful shrug of his New England conscience. Philip listened complacently to the abuse of a man who had gone out of his way to be kind to him, but when Weeks in his turn made disagreeable remarks about Hayward, he lost his temper. "'Your new friend looks like a poet,' said Weeks, with a thin smile on his careworn bitter mouth. "'He is a poet. Did he tell you so? In America we should call him a pretty fair specimen of a waster.' "'Well, we're not in America,' said Philip frigidly. "'How old is he? Twenty-five? And he does nothing but stay in pensions and write poetry.' "'You don't know him,' said Philip hotly. "'Oh, yes, I do. I've met a hundred and forty-seven of him.' Wink's eyes twinkled but Philip, who did not understand American humor, pursed his lips and looked severe. Weeks, to Philip, seemed a man of middle age, but he was in point of fact little more than thirty. He had a long, thin body, and the scholar's stoop. His head was large and ugly. He had pale, scanty hair and an earthy skin. His thin mouth and thin long nose and the great protuberance of his funnel bones gave him an uncouth look. He was cold and precise in his manner, a bloodless man without passion. But he had a curious vein of frivolity which disconcerted the serious-minded among whom his instincts naturally threw him. He was studying theology in Heidelberg, but the other theological students of his own nationality looked upon him with suspicion. He was very unorthodox, which frightened them, and his freakish humor excited their disapproval. "'How can you have known a hundred and forty-seven of him?' said Philip seriously. I've met him in the Latin Quarter in Paris, and I met him in pensions in Berlin and Munich. He lives in small hotels in Perugia and Assisi. He stands by the dozen before the Botticellis in Florence, and he sits on all the benches of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. In Italy he drinks a little too much wine, and in Germany he drinks a great deal too much beer. He always admires the right thing, whatever the right thing is, and one of these days he's going to write a great work think of it. There are a hundred and forty-seven great works reposing in the bosoms of a hundred and forty-seven great men, and the tragic thing is that not one of those hundred and forty-seven great works will ever be written. And yet the world goes on. Weeks spoke seriously, but his gray eyes twinkled a little at the end of his long speech, and Philip flushed when he saw that the American was making fun of him. You do talk rot, he said crossly. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 Weeks had two little rooms at the back of Frau Erlen's house, and one of them, arranged as a parlor, was comfortable enough for him to invite people to sit in. After supper, urged perhaps by the impish humor which was the despair of his friends in Cambridge Mass, he often asked Philip and Hayward to come in for a chat. 
he received them with elaborate courtesy and insisted on their sitting in the only two comfortable chairs in the room. Though he did not drink himself, with the politeness of which Philip recognized the irony, he put a couple of bottles of beer at Hayward's elbow, and he insisted on lighting matches whenever in the heat of argument Hayward's pipe went out. At the beginning of their acquaintance Hayward, as a member of so celebrated a university, had adopted a patronizing attitude towards Weeks, who was a graduate of Harvard, and when by chance the conversation turned upon the Greek tragedians, a subject upon which Hayward felt he spoke with authority, he had assumed the air that it was his part to give information rather than to exchange ideas. Weeks had listened politely with smiling modesty till Hayward finished. Then he asked one or two insidious questions, so innocent in appearance that Hayward, not seeing into what a quandary they led him, answered blandly. Weeks made a courteous objection, then a correction of fact, after that a quotation from some little-known Latin commentator, then a reference to a German authority, and the fact was disclosed that he was a scholar. With smiling ease apologetically Weeks tore to pieces all that Hayward had said. With elaborate civility he displayed the superficiality of his attainments. He mocked him with gentle irony. Philip could not help seeing that Hayward looked a perfect fool, and Hayward had not the sense to hold his tongue. In his irritation his self-assurance undaunted, he attempted to argue. He made wild statements, and Weeks amicably corrected them. He reasoned falsely, and Weeks proved that he was absurd. Weeks confessed that he had taught Greek literature at Harvard. Hayward gave a laugh of scorn. I might have known it. Of course you read Greek like a schoolmaster, he said. I read it like a poet. And do you find it more poetic when you don't quite know what it means? I thought it was only in revealed religion that a mistranslation improved the sense. At last, having finished the beer, Hayward left Weeks' room hot and disheveled. With an angry gesture he said to Philip, Of course the man's a pendant. He has no real feeling for beauty. Accuracy is the virtue of clerks. It's the spirit of the Greeks that we aim at. Weeks is like that fellow who went to hear Rubenstein and complained that he played false notes. False notes! What did they matter when he played divinely? Philip, not knowing how many incompetent people have found solace in these false notes, was much impressed. Hayward could never resist the opportunity which Weeks offered him of regaining ground lost on the previous occasion and Weeks was able with the greatest of ease to draw him into a discussion. Though he could not help seeing how small his attainments were beside the Americans, his British pertinacity, his wounded vanity, perhaps they are the same thing, would not allow him to give up the struggle. Hayward seemed to take a delight in displaying his ignorance, self-satisfaction, and wrong-headedness. Whenever Hayward said something which was illogical, Weeks, in a few words which show the falseness of his reasoning, pause for a moment to enjoy his triumph, and then hurry on to another subject as though Christian charity impelled him to spare the vanquished foe. Philip tried sometimes to put in something to help his friend, and Weeks gently crushed him, but so kindly, differently from the way in which he answered Hayward, that even Philip, outrageously sensitive, could not feel hurt. Now and then, losing his calm as he felt himself more and more foolish, Hayward became abusive and only the American's smiling politeness prevented the argument from degenerating into a quarrel. On these occasions when Hayward left Weeks' room he muttered angrily, "'Damned Yankee!' That settled it. It was a perfect answer to an argument which had seemed unanswerable. Though they began by discussing all manner of subjects in Weeks' little room, eventually the conversation always turned to religion. The theological student took a professional interest in it, and Hayward welcomed a subject in which hard facts need not disconcert him. When feeling is the gauge you can snap your angers at logic, and when your logic is weak that is very agreeable. Hayward found it difficult to explain his beliefs to Philip without a great flow of words, but it was clear, and this fell in with Philip's idea of the natural order of things, that he had been brought up in the church by law established. Though he had now given up all idea of becoming a Roman Catholic, he still looked upon that communion with sympathy. He had much to say in its praise, and he compared favorably its gorgeous ceremonies with simple services of the Church of England. He gave Philip Newman's Apologia to read, and Philip, finding it very dull, 
nevertheless read it to the end. "'Read it for its style, not for its matter,' said Hayward. He talked enthusiastically of the music at the oratory, and said charming things about the connection between incense and the devotional spirit. Weeks listened to him with his frigid smile. "'You think it proves the truth of Roman Catholicism that John Henry Newman wrote good English, and that Cardinal Manning has a picturesque appearance?' Hayward hinted that he had gone through much trouble with his soul. For a year he had swum in a sea of darkness. He passed his fingers through his fair waving hair and told them that he would not for five hundred pounds endure again those agonies of mine. Fortunately he had reached calm waters at last. "'But what do you believe?' asked Philip, who was never satisfied with vague statements. "'I believe in the whole, the good and the beautiful.' Hayward, with his loose large limbs and the fine carriage of his head, looked very handsome when he said this, and he said it with an air. "'Is that how you would describe your religion in a census paper?' asked Weeks in mild tones. "'I hate the rigid definition. It's so ugly, so obvious. If you like I will say that I believe in the church of the Duke of Wellington and Mr. Gladstone.' "'That's the Church of England,' said Philip. "'Oh, wise young man,' retorted Hayward, with a smile which made Philip blush for he felt that in putting into plain words what the other had expressed in a paraphrase he had been guilty of vulgarity. I belong to the Church of England, but I love the gold and the silk which clothe the priest of Rome, and his celibacy, and the confessional, and purgatory, and in the darkness of an Italian cathedral, incense-laden and mysterious, I believe with all my heart in the miracle of the Mass. In Venice I have seen a fisherwoman come in, barefoot, thrown down her basket of fish by her side, fall on her knees, and pray to the Madonna. And that, I felt, was the real faith, and I prayed and believed with her. But I believe also in Aphrodite and Apollo, and the great god Pan. He had a charming voice, and he chose his words as he spoke. He uttered them almost rhythmically. He would have gone on, but Weeks opened a second bottle of beer. Let me give you something to drink." Hayward turned to Philip with a slightly condescending gesture which so impressed the youth. "'Now are you satisfied?' Philip, somewhat bewildered, confessed that he was. "'I'm disappointed that you didn't add a little Buddhism,' said Weeks, "'and I confess I have a sort of sympathy for Mohammed. I regret that you should have left him out in the cold.' Hayward laughed, for he was in a good humor with himself that evening, and the ring of his sentences still sounded pleasant in his ears. He emptied his glass. I didn't expect you to understand me, he answered. With your cold American intelligence you can only adopt the critical attitude, Emerson and all that sort of thing. But what is criticism? Criticism is purely destructive. Anyone can destroy, but not everyone can build up. You are a pendant, my dear fellow. The important thing is to construct. I am constructive. I am a poet. Weeks looked at him with eyes which seemed at the same time to be quite grave and yet to be smiling brightly. I think if you don't mind my saying so, you're a little drunk. Nothing to speak of, answered Hayward cheerfully, and not enough for me to be unable to overwhelm you in argument. But come, I have unbosomed my soul. Now tell us what your religion is. Weeks put his head on one side so that he looked like a sparrow on a perch. I've been trying to find that out for years. I think I'm a Unitarian. But that's a dissenter, said Philip. He could not imagine why they both burst into laughter, Hayward uproariously and Weeks with a funny chuckle. "'And in England dissenters aren't gentlemen, are they?' asked Weeks. "'Well, if you ask me point-blank, they're not,' replied Philip rather crossly. He hated being laughed at, and they laughed again. "'And will you tell me what a gentleman is?' asked Weeks. "'Oh, I don't know. Everyone knows what it is. Are you a gentleman?' No doubt had ever crossed Philip's mind on the subject, but he knew it was not a thing to state of oneself. "'If a man tells you he's a gentleman, you can bet your boots he isn't,' he retorted. "'Am I a gentleman?' Philip's truthfulness made it difficult for him to answer, but he was naturally polite. "'Oh, well, you're different,' he said. "'You're American, aren't you? I suppose we may take it that only Englishmen are gentlemen,' said Weeks gravely. Philip did not contradict him. "'Couldn't you give me a few more particulars?' asked Weeks. Philip reddened, but, growing angry, did not care if he made himself ridiculous. "'I can give you plenty.' He remembered his uncle's saying that it took three generations to make a gentleman. 
It was a companion proverb to the silk purse and the sow's ear. First of all, he's the son of a gentleman, and he's been to a public school and to Oxford or Cambridge. Edinburgh wouldn't do, I suppose, asked Weeks. And he talks English like a gentleman, and he wears the right sort of things, and if he's a gentleman he can always tell if another chap's a gentleman. It seemed rather lame to Philip as he went on, but there it was. That was what he meant by the word, and every one he had ever known had meant that too. "'It is evident to me that I am not a gentleman,' said Weeks. "'I don't see why you should have been so surprised because I was a dissenter. I don't quite know what a Unitarian is,' said Philip. Weeks, in his odd way, again put his head on one side. You almost expected him to twitter. A Unitarian very earnestly disbelieves in almost everything that anybody else believes, and he has a very lively sustaining faith in he doesn't know what. I don't see why you should make fun of me, said Philip. I really want to know. My dear friend, I'm not making fun of you. I have arrived at that definition after years of great labor and the most anxious, nerve-wracking study. When Philip and Hayward got up to go, Weeks handed Philip a little book in a paper cover. I suppose you can read French pretty well by now. I wonder if this would amuse you. Philip thanked him, and, taking the book, looked at the title. It was Renan's Vie de Cheveux. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 It occurred neither to Hayward nor to Weeks that the conversations which helped them to pass an idle evening were being turned over afterwards in Philip's active brain. It had never struck him before that religion was a matter upon which discussion was possible. To him it meant the Church of England, and not to believe in its tenets were a sign of willfulness which could not fail of punishment here or hereafter. There was some doubt in his mind about the chastisement of unbelievers. It was possible that a merciful judge, reserving the flames of hell for the heathen, Mohammedans, Buddhists, and the rest, would spare dissenters and Roman Catholics though at the cost of how much humiliation when they were made to realize their error. And it was also possible that he would be pitiful to those who had had no chance of learning the truth. This was reasonable enough, though such were the activities of the missionary society there could not be many in this condition. But if the chance had been theirs and they had neglected it, in which category were obviously Roman Catholics and dissenters, the punishment was sure and merited. It was clear that the miscreant was in a parlor state. Perhaps Philip had not been taught it in so many words, but certainly the impression had been given him that only members of the Church of England had any real hope of eternal happiness. One of the things that Philip had heard definitely stated was that the unbeliever was a wicked and vicious man. But Weeks, though he believed in hardly anything that Philip believed, led a life of Christian purity. Philip had received little kindness in his life, and he was touched by the American's desire to help him. Once, when a cold kept him in bed for three days, weeks nursed him like a mother. There was neither vice nor wickedness in him, but only sincerity and loving kindness. It was evidently possible to be virtuous and unbelieving. Also, Philip had been given to understand that people adhered to other faiths only from obstinacy or self-interest. In their hearts they knew they were false they deliberately sought to deceive others. Now, for the sake of his German, he had been accustomed on Sunday mornings to attend the Lutheran service, but when Hayward arrived he began instead to go with him to Mass. He noticed that, whereas the Protestant church was nearly empty and the congregation had a listless air, the Jesuit, on the other hand, was crowded, and the worshippers seemed to pray with all their hearts. They had not the look of hypocrites." He was surprised at the contrast, for he knew, of course, that the Lutherans whose faith was closer to that of the Church of England on that account were nearer the truth than the Roman Catholics. Most of the men, it was largely a masculine congregation, were South Germans, and he could not help saying to himself that if he had been born in South Germany he would certainly have been a Roman Catholic. He might just as well have been born in a Roman Catholic country as in England and in England as well in a Wesleyan, Baptist, or Methodist family as in one that fortunately belonged to the church by law established. He was a little breathless at the danger he had run. Philip was on friendly terms with the little Chinaman who sat at the table with him twice each day. His name was Sung. He was always smiling, affable, and polite. 
It seemed strange that he should frizzle in hell merely because he was a Chinaman. But if salvation was possible, whatever a man's faith was, there did not seem to be any particular advantage in belonging to the Church of England. Philip, more puzzled than he had ever been in his life, sounded weeks. He had to be careful, for he was very sensitive to ridicule, and the acidulous humor with which the American treated the Church of England disconcerted him. Weeks only puzzled him more. He made Philip acknowledge that those South Germans whom he saw in the Jesuit church were every bit as firmly convinced of the truth of Roman Catholicism as he was of that of the Church of England, and from that he led him to admit that the Mohammedan and the Buddhist were convinced also of the truth of their respective religions. It looked as though knowing that you were right meant nothing. They all knew they were right. Weeks had no intention of undermining the boy's faith, but he was deeply interested in religion and found it an absorbing topic of conversation. He had described his own views accurately when he said that he very earnestly disbelieved in almost everything that other people believed. Once Philip asked him a question, which he had heard his uncle put when the conversation at the vicarage had fallen upon some mildly rationalistic work which was then exciting discussion in the newspapers but why should you be right and all those fellows like St. Anselm and St. Augustine be wrong? You mean that they were very clever and learned men, while you have grave doubts whether I am either? asked Weeks. Yes, answered Philip uncertainly, for put in that way his question seemed impertinent. St. Augustine believed that the earth was flat and that the sun turned round it. I don't know what that proves. Why, it proves that you believe with your generation." Your saints lived in an age of faith when it was practically impossible to disbelieve what to us is positively incredible. Then how do you know that we have the truth now? I don't. Philip thought this over for a moment. Then he said, I don't see why the things we believe absolutely now shouldn't be just as wrong as what they believed in the past. Neither do I. Then how can you believe anything at all? I don't know. Phillips asked Weeks what he thought of Hayward's religion. "'Men have always formed gods in their own image,' said Weeks. "'He believes in the picturesque.' Philip paused for a little while, then he said, "'I don't see why one should believe in God at all.' The words were no sooner out of his mouth than he realized that he had ceased to do so. It took his breath away like a plunge into cold water. He looked at Weeks with startled eyes. Suddenly he felt afraid. He left Weeks as quickly as he could. He wanted to be alone. It was the most startling experience that he had ever had. He tried to think it all out. It was very exciting since his whole life seemed concerned. He thought his decision on this matter must be must profoundly affect its course, and a mistake might lead to eternal damnation. But the more he reflected, the more convinced he was. And though during the next few weeks he read books, aids the skepticism with eager interest, it was only to confirm him in what he felt instinctively. The fact was that he had ceased to believe not for this reason or the other, but because he had not the religious temperament. Faith had been forced upon him from the outside. It was a matter of environment and example. A new environment and a new example gave him the opportunity to find himself. He put off the faith of his childhood quite simply like a cloak that he no longer needed. At first life seemed strange and lonely without the belief which, though he never realized it, had been an unfailing support. He felt like a man who has leaned on a stick and finds himself forced suddenly to walk without assistance. It really seemed as though the days were colder and the nights more solitary. But he was upheld by the excitement. It seemed to make life a more thrilling adventure and in a little while the stick which he had thrown aside, the cloak which had fallen from his shoulders, seemed an intolerable burden of which he had been eased. The religious exercises which for so many years had been forced upon him were part and parcel of religion to him. He thought of the collects and epistles which he had been made to learn by heart, and the long services at the cathedral through which he had sat when every limb itched with the desire for movement and he remembered those walks at night through muddy roads to the parish church at Blackstable, and the coldness of that bleak building. He sat with his feet like ice, his fingers numb and heavy, and all around was the sickly odor of pomatum. 
oh he had been so bored his heart leaped when he saw he was free from all that he was surprised at himself because he ceased to believe so easily and not knowing that he felt as he did on account of the subtle workings of his inmost nature he ascribed the certainty he had reached to his own cleverness he was unduly pleased with himself with youth's lack of sympathy for an attitude other than its own he despised not a little weeks and hayward because they were content with the vague emotion which they called god and would not take the further step which to himself seemed so obvious one day he went alone up a certain hill so that he might see a view which he knew not why filled him always with wild exhilaration it was autumn now but often the days were cloudless still and then the sky seemed to glow with a more splendid light it was as though nature consciously sought to put a fuller vehemence into the remaining days of fair weather he looked down upon the plain a quiver with the sun stretching vastly before him in the distance were the roofs of Mannheim, and ever so far away the dimness of worms. Here and there a more piercing glitter was the Rhine. The tremendous spaciousness of it was glowing with rich gold. Philip, as he stood there, his heart beating with sheer joy, thought how the tempter had stood with Jesus on a high mountain and shown him the kingdoms of the earth. To Philip, intoxicated with the beauty of the scene, it seemed that it was the whole world which was spread before him, and he was eager to step down and enjoy it. He was free from degrading fears and free from prejudice. He could go his way without the intolerable dread of hell-fire. Suddenly he realized that he had lost also that burden of responsibility which made every action of his life a matter of urgent consequence. He could breathe more freely in a lighter air. He was responsible only to himself for the things he did. Freedom! he was his own master at last. From old habit, unconsciously, he thanked God that he no longer believed in him. Drunk with pride in his intelligence and in his fearlessness, Philip entered deliberately upon a new life. But his loss of faith made less difference in his behavior than he expected. Though he had thrown on one side the Christian dogmas, it never occurred to him to criticize the Christian ethics. He accepted the Christian virtues, and indeed thought it fine to practice them for their own sake, without a thought of reward or punishment. There was small occasion for heroism in the Frau Professor's house, but he was a little more exactly truthful than he had been, and he forced himself to be more than commonly attentive to the dull elderly ladies who sometimes engaged him in conversation. The gentle oath, the violent adjective, which are typical of our own language and which he had cultivated before as a sign of manliness, he now elaborately eschewed. Having settled the whole matter to his satisfaction, he sought to put it out of his mind, but that was more easily said than done, and he could not prevent the regrets nor stifle the misgivings which sometimes tormented him. He was so young and had so few friends that immorality had no particular attractions for him, and he was able without trouble to give up belief in it. But there was one thing which made him wretched he told himself that he was unreasonable. He tried to laugh himself out of such pathos, but the tears really came to his eyes when he thought that he would never see again the beautiful mother whose love for him had grown more precious as the years since her death passed on. And sometimes, as though the influence of innumerable ancestors, God-fearing and devout, were working in him unconsciously, there seized a panic fear that perhaps, after all, it was all true, and there was, up there behind the blue sky, a jealous God who would punish in everlasting flames the atheist. At these times his reason could offer him no help. He imagined the anguish of a physical torment which would last endlessly. He felt quite sick with fear and burst into a violent sweat. At last he would say to himself desperately, After all, it's not my fault. I can't force myself to believe if there is a God, after all, and he punishes me because I honestly don't believe in him, I can't help it. End of chapter 28 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters 29 through 32 of 
of human bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 29. Winter set in. Weeks went to Berlin to attend the lectures of Paulson, and Hayward began to think of going south. The local theater opened its doors. Philip and Hayward went to it two or three times a week with the praiseworthy intention of improving their German, and Philip found it a more diverting manner of perfecting himself in the language than listening to sermons. They found themselves in the midst of a revival of the drama. Several of Ibsen's plays were on the repertory for the winter. Suderman's De Era was then a new play, and on its production in the quiet university town caused the greatest excitement. It was extravagantly praised and bitterly attacked. Other dramatists followed with plays written under the modern influence, and Philip witnessed a series of works in which the vileness of mankind was displayed before him. He had never been to a play in his life till then, poor touring companies sometimes came to assembly rooms at Blackstable, but the vicar, partly on account of his profession, partly because he thought it would be vulgar, never went to see them. And the passion of the stage seized him. He felt a thrill the moment he got into the little shabby, ill-lit theatre. Soon he came to know the peculiarities of the small company, and by the casting he could tell at once what were the characterizations of the persons in the drama but this made no difference to him. To him it was real life. It was a strange life, dark and tortured, in which men and women showed to remorseless eyes the evil that was in their hearts. A fair face concealed a depraved mind. The virtuous used virtue as a mask to hide their secret vice. The seeming strong fainted within their weaknesses. The honest were corrupt. The chaste were lewd. You seemed to dwell in a room where the night before an orgy had taken place. The windows had not been opened in the morning. The air was foul with the dregs of beer and stale smoke and flaring gas. There was no laughter. At most you snickered at the hypocrite or the fool. The characters expressed themselves in cruel words that seemed wrung out of their hearts by shame and anguish. Philip was carried away by the sordid intensity of it. He seemed to see the world again in another fashion, and this world, too, he was anxious to know. After the play was over he went to the tavern and sat in the bright warmth with Hayward to eat a sandwich and drink a glass of beer. All round were little groups of students, talking and laughing, and here and there was a family, father and mother, a couple of sons and a girl, and sometimes the girl said a sharp thing and the father leaned back in his chair and laughed, laughed heartily. It was very friendly and innocent. There was a pleasant homeliness in the scene, but for this Philip had no eyes. His thoughts ran on the play he had just come from. "'You do feel it's life, don't you?' he said excitedly. "'You know, I don't think I can stay here much longer. I want to get to London so that I can really begin. I want to have experiences. I'm so tired of preparing for life. I want to live it now.' Sometimes. Hayward left Philip to go home by himself. He would never exactly reply to Philip's eager questioning, but with a merry, rather stupid laugh, hinted at a romantic amour. He quoted a few lines of Rossetti, and once showed Philip a sonnet in which passion and purple, pessimism and pathos, were packed together on the subject of a young lady called Trudy. Hayward surrounded his sordid and vulgar little adventures with a glow of poetry, and thought he touched hands with Pericles and Phidias because to describe the object of his attentions he used the word hetaira instead of one of those, more blunt and apt, provided by the English language. Philip in the daytime had been led by curiosity to pass through the little street near the old bridge, with its neat white houses and green shutters, in which, according to Hayward, the Fräulein Trudy lived but the women with brutal faces and painted cheeks who came out of their doors and cried out to him filled him with fear, and he fled in horror from the rough hands that sought to detain him. He yearned above all things for experience and felt himself ridiculous because at his age he had not enjoyed that which all fiction taught him was the most important thing in life. But he had the unfortunate gift of seeing things as they were and the reality which was offered him differed too terribly from the ideal of his dreams. 
he did not know how wide a country, arid and precipitous, must be crossed before the traveller through life comes to an acceptance of reality. It is an illusion that youth is happy, an illusion of those who have lost it, but the young know they are wretched, for they are full of the truthless ideals which have been instilled into them, and each time they come in contact with the real they are bruised and wounded. It looks as if they were victims of a conspiracy, for the books they read, ideal by the necessity of selection, and the conversation of their elders, who look back upon the past through a rosy haze of forgetfulness, prepare them for an unreal life. They must discover for themselves that all they have read and all they have been told are lies, 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 and each discovery is another nail driven into the body on the cross of life. The strange thing is that each one who has gone through that bitter disillusionment adds to it in his turn unconsciously by the power within him which is stronger than himself. The companionship of Hayward was the worst possible thing for Philip. He was a man who saw nothing for himself but only through a literary atmosphere, and he was dangerous because he had deceived himself into sincerity. He honestly mistook his sensuality for romantic emotion, his vacillation for the artistic temperament, and his idleness for the philosophic calm. His mind, vulgar in its effort at refinement, saw everything a little larger than life-size, with the outlines blurred in a gold mist of sentimentality. He lied and never knew that he lied, and when it was pointed out to him said that lies were beautiful. He was an idealist. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 Philip was restless and dissatisfied. Hayward's poetic allusions troubled his imagination and his soul yearned for romance. At least that was how he put it to himself and it happened that an incident was taking place in Frau Erlein's house which increased Philip's preoccupation with the matter of sex. Two or three times on his walks among the hills he had met Fräulein Cassilli wandering by herself. He had passed her with a bow, and a few yards further on had seen the Chinaman. He thought nothing of it, but one evening on his way home, when night had already fallen, he passed two people walking very close together. Hearing his footstep, they separated quickly, and though he could not see well in the darkness, he was almost certain they were Cassilli and Herr Sung. Their rapid movement apart suggested that they had been walking arm in arm. Philip was puzzled and surprised. He had never paid much attention to Fräulein Cassilli. She was a plain girl, with a square face and blunt features. She could not have been more than sixteen, since she still wore her long fair hair in a plait. That evening at supper he looked at her curiously, and though of late she had talked little at meals, she addressed him. "'Where did you go for your walk today, Herr Carey?' she asked. "'Oh, I walked up towards the Königstuhl. I didn't go out,' she volunteered. "'I had a headache.' The Chinaman who sat next to her turned round. "'I'm so sorry,' he said. "'I hope it's better now.' Fräulein Cassilli was evidently uneasy, for she spoke again to Philip. "'Did you meet many people on the way?' Philip could not help reddening when he told a downright lie. No, I don't think I saw a living soul. He fancied that a look of relief passed across her eyes. Soon, however, there could be no doubt that there was something between the pair, and other people in the Frau Professor's house saw them lurking in dark places. The elderly ladies who sat at the head of the table began to discuss what was now a scandal. The Frau Professor was angry and harassed. She had done her best to see nothing. The winter was at hand, and it was not as easy a matter then as in the summer to keep her house full. Herr Sung was a good customer. He had two rooms on the ground floor, and he drank a bottle of Moselle at each meal. The Frau Professor charged him three marks a bottle and made a good profit. None of her other guests drank wine, and some of them did not even drink beer. Neither did she wish to lose Fräulein Cassilli whose parents were in business in South America and paid well for the Frau Professor's motherly care, and she knew that if she wrote to the girl's uncle who lived in Berlin he would immediately take her away. The Frau Professor contented herself with giving them both severe looks at table, and, though she dared not be rude to the Chinaman, got a certain satisfaction out of incivility to Cassilli. 
but the three elderly ladies were not content. Two were widows and one, a Dutchwoman, was a spinster of masculine appearance. They paid the smallest possible sum for their pension and gave a good deal of trouble, but they were permanent and therefore had to be put up with. They went to the Frau Professor and said that something must be done. It was disgraceful and the house was ceasing to be respectable. The Frau Professor tried obstinacy, anger, tears, but the three old ladies routed her, and with a sudden assumption of virtuous indignation she said that she would put a stop to the whole thing. After luncheon she took Cassili into her bedroom and began to talk very seriously to her, but to her amazement the girl adopted a brazen attitude. She proposed to go on about as she liked, and if she chose to walk with the Chinaman she could not see it was anybody's business but her own. The Frau Professor threatened to write to her uncle. Then Uncle Heinrich will put me in a family in Berlin for the winter, and that will be much nicer for me, and her son will come to Berlin too. The Frau Professor began to cry. The tears rolled down her coarse red, fat cheeks, and Cassili laughed at her. That will mean three rooms empty all through the winter, she said. Then the Frau Professor tried another plan. She appealed to Fraulein Cassili's better nature. She was kind, sensible, tolerant. She treated her no longer as a child but as a grown woman. She said that it wouldn't be so dreadful but a Chinaman with his yellow skin and flat nose and his little pig's eyes. That's what made it so horrible. It filled one with disgust to think of it. Bitte, bitte, said Cassili with a rapid intake of breath. I won't listen to anything against him. But it's not serious? gasped Frau Erlen. I love him, I love him, I love him. Gott in Himmel! The Frau Professor stared at her with horrified surprise. She had thought it was no more than naughtiness on the child's part, an innocent folly, but the passion in her voice revealed everything. Cassili looked at her for a moment with flaming eyes, and then with a shrug of her shoulders went out of the room. Frau Erlen kept the details of the interview to herself, and a day or two later altered the arrangement of the table. She asked Herr Sung if he would not come and sit at her end, and he, with his unfailing politeness, accepted with alacrity. Cassili took the charge indifferently. But, as if the discovery that the relations between them were known to the whole household made them more shameless, they made no secret now of their walks together, and every afternoon quite openly set out to wander about the hills. It was plain that they did not care what was said of them. At last even the placidity of Professor Erlin was moved, and he insisted that his wife should speak to the Chinaman. She took him aside in his turn and expostulated. He was ruining the girl's reputation. He was doing harm to the house. He must see how wrong and wicked his conduct was. But she was met with smiling denials. Herr Sung did not know what she was talking about. He was not paying any attention to Fraulein Cassili. He never walked with her. It was all untrue, every word of it. Ach, Herr Sung, how can you say such things? You've been seen again and again. No, you're mistaken, it's untrue. He looked at her with an unceasing smile which showed his even little white teeth. He was quite calm. He denied everything. He denied with bland effrontery. At last the Frau Professor lost her temper and said the girl had confessed she loved him. He was not moved. He continued to smile. Nonsense, nonsense, it's all untrue. She could get nothing out of him. The weather grew very bad. There was snow and frost, and then a thaw with a long succession of cheerless days on which walking was a poor amusement. One evening when Philip had just finished his German lesson with the Herr Professor and was standing for a moment in the drawing-room talking to Frau Erlin, Anna came quickly in. Mama, where is Cassili? she said. I suppose she's in her room. There's no light in it. The Frau Professor gave an exclamation, and she looked at her daughter in dismay. The thought which was in Anna's head had flashed across hers. "'Ring for Emil,' she said hoarsely. This was the stupid lout who waited at table and did most of the housework. He came in. "'Emil, go down to her son's room and enter without knocking. If anyone is there, say you came in to see about the stove.' No sign of astonishment appeared on Emil's phlegmatic face. He went slowly downstairs. The Frau Professor and Anna left the door open and listened. Presently they heard Emil come up again, and they called him. "'Was anyone there?' asked the Frau Professor. "'Yes, Herr Sung was there.' 
Was he alone? The beginning of a cunning smile narrowed his mouth. No, Frau Cassilli was there. Oh, it's disgraceful, cried the Frau Professor. Now he smiled broadly. Fräulein Cassilli is there every evening. She spends hours at a time there. Frau Professor began to wring her hands. Oh, how abominable! But why didn't you tell me? It was no business of mine, he answered, slowly shrugging his shoulders. I suppose they paid you well. Go away, go! He lurched clumsily to the door. They must go away, Mamma, said Anna. And who is going to pay the rent? And the taxes are falling due. It's all very well for you to say they must go away. If they go away, I can't pay the bills. She turned to Philip, with tears streaming down her face. Ah, Herr Carey, you will not say what you have heard. If Fräulein Forster, this was the Dutch spinster, if Fräulein Forster knew she would leave at once, and if they all go, we must close the house. I cannot afford to keep it. Of course I won't say anything. If she stays, I will not speak to her, said Anna. That evening at supper, Fräulein Cassilli, redder than usual, with a look of obstinacy on her face, took her place punctually. But Herr Sung did not appear, and for a while Philip thought he was going to shirk the ordeal. At last he came, very smiling, his little eyes dancing with the apologies he made for his late arrival. He insisted, as usual, on pouring out the Frau Professor a glass of his Moselle, and he offered a glass to Fräulein Forster. The room was very hot, for the stove had been alight all day, and the windows were seldom opened. Emil blundered about, but succeeded somehow in serving everyone quickly and with order. The three old ladies sat in silence, visibly disapproving. The Frau Professor had scarcely recovered from her tears. Her husband was silent and oppressed. Conversation languished. It seemed to Philip that there was something dreadful in that gathering which he had sat with so often. They looked different under the light of the two hanging lamps from what they had ever looked before. He was vaguely uneasy. Once he caught Cassilli's eye, and he thought she looked at him with hatred and contempt. The room was stifling. It was as though the beastly passion of that pair troubled them all. There was a feeling of oriental depravity. A faint savor of joss-sticks, a mystery of hidden voices, seemed to make their breath heavy. Philip could feel the beating of the arteries in his forehead. He could not understand what strange emotion distracted him. He seemed to feel something infinitely attractive, and yet he was repelled and horrified. For several days things went on. The air was sickly with the unnatural passion which all felt about them, and the nerves of the little household seemed to grow exasperated. Only Herr Sung remained unaffected. He was no less smiling, affable, and polite than he had been before. One could not tell whether his manner was a triumph of civilization or an expression of contempt on the part of the Oriental for the vanquished West. Cassilli was flaunting and cynical. At last even the Frau Professor could bear the position no longer. Suddenly panic seized her, for Professor Erlin with brutal frankness had suggested the possible consequences of an intrigue which was now manifest to everyone, and he saw her good name in Heidelberg and the repute of her house ruined by a scandal which could not possibly be hidden. For some reason, blinded perhaps by her interest, this possibility had never occurred to her, and now, her wits muddled by a terrible fear, she could hardly be prevented from turning the girl out of the house at once. It was due to Anna's good sense that a cautious letter was written to the uncle in Berlin, suggesting that Cassilli should be taken away but having made up her mind to lose the two lodgers, the Frau Professor could not resist the satisfaction of giving rein to the ill temper she had curbed so long. She was free now to say anything she liked to Cassilli. "'I have written to your uncle, Cassilli, to take you away. I cannot have you in my house any longer.' Her little round eyes sparkled when she noticed the sudden whiteness of the girl's face. "'You're shameless, shameless,' she went on. She called her foul names. "'What did you say to my Uncle Heinrich, Frau Professor?' the girl asked, suddenly falling from her attitude of flaunting independence. "'Oh, he'll tell you himself. I expect to get a letter from him tomorrow.' Next day, in order to make the humiliation more public, at supper she called down the table to Cassilli. "'I have had a letter from your Uncle Cassilli. You are to pack your things tonight, and we will put you in the train tomorrow morning.' 
he will meet you himself in Berlin at the Central Bahnhof. Very good, Frau Professor. Herr Sung smiled in the Frau Professor's eyes, and notwithstanding her protest insisted on pouring out a glass of wine for her. The Frau Professor ate her supper with a good appetite, but she had triumphed unwisely. Just before going to bed she called the servant. Emil, if Fräulein Cassilli's box is ready you had better take it downstairs to-night. The porter will fetch it before breakfast. The servant went away, and in a moment came back. Fräulein Cassilli is not in her room, and her bag has gone. With a cry the Frau Professor hurried along. The box was on the floor, strapped and locked, but there was no bag and neither hat nor cloak. The dressing-table was empty. Breathing heavily the Frau Professor ran downstairs to the Chinaman's rooms, she had not moved so quickly for twenty years, and Emil called out after her to beware she did not fall. She did not trouble to knock, but burst in. The rooms were empty. The luggage had gone, and the door into the garden, still open, showed how it had been got away. In an envelope on the table were notes for the money due on the month's board and an approximate sum for extras. Groaning, suddenly overcome by her haste, the Frau Professor sank obesely onto a sofa. There could be no doubt. The pair had gone off together. Emil remained stolid and unmoved. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 Hayward, after saying for a month that he was going south next day, and delaying from week to week out of inability to make up his mind to the bother of packing and the tedium of a journey, had at last been driven off just before Christmas by the preparations for that festival. He could not support the thought of a Teutonic merrymaking. It gave him goose-flesh to think of the season's aggressive cheerfulness, and in his desire to avoid the obvious he determined to travel on Christmas Day. Philip was not sorry to see him off, for he was a downright person and it irritated him that anybody should not know his own mind. Though much under Hayward's influence, he would not grant that indecision pointed to a charming sensitiveness, and he resented the shadow of a sneer with which Hayward looked upon his straight ways. They corresponded. Hayward was an admirable letter-writer, and knowing his talent took pains with his letters. His temperament was receptive to the beautiful influences with which he came in contact, and he was able in his letters from Rome to put a subtle fragrance of Italy. He thought the city of the ancient Romans a little vulgar, finding distinction only in the decadence of the empire. But the Rome of the popes appealed to his sympathy, and in his chosen words, quite exquisitely, there appeared a rococo beauty. He wrote of old church music and the Alban hills, and of the languor of incense and the charm of the streets by night, in the rain when the pavement shone and the light of the street lamps was mysterious. Perhaps he repeated these admirable letters to various friends. He did not know what a troubling effect they had upon Philip. They seemed to make his life very humdrum. With the spring Hayward grew dithyrambic. He proposed that Philip should come down to Italy. He was wasting his time at Heidelberg. The Germans were gross, and life there was common. How could the soul come to her own in that prim landscape? In Tuscany this spring was scattering flowers through the land, and Philip was nineteen. Let him come, and they could wander through the mountain towns of Umbria. Their names sang in Philip's heart, and Cassilli too, with her lover, had gone to Italy. When he thought of them, Philip was seized with a restlessness he could not account for. He cursed his fate because he had no money to travel, and he knew his uncle would not send him more than the fifteen pounds a month which had been agreed upon. He had not managed his allowance very well. His pension and the price of his lessons left him very little over, and he had found going about with Hayward expensive. Hayward had often suggested excursions, a visit to the play, or a bottle of wine, when Philip had come to the end of his month's money, and with the folly of his age he had been unwilling to confess he could not afford an extravagance. Luckily Hayward's letters came seldom, and in the intervals Philip settled down again to his industrious life. He had matriculated at the university and attended one or two courses of lectures. Kuno Fischer was then at the height of his fame, 
and during the winter had been lecturing brilliantly on Schopenhauer. It was Philip's introduction to philosophy. He had a practical mind and moved easily amid the abstract, but he found an unexpected fascination in listening to metaphysical disquisitions. They made him breathless. It was a little like watching a tightrope dancer doing perilous feats over an abyss, but it was very exciting. The pessimism of the subject attracted his youth, and he believed that the world he was about to enter was a place of pitiless woe and of darkness. That made him none the less eager to enter it, and when, in due course, Mrs. Carey, acting as the correspondent for his guardian's views, suggested that it was time for him to come back to England, he agreed with enthusiasm. He must make up his mind now what he meant to do. If he left Heidelberg at the end of July they could talk things over during August, and it would be a good time to make arrangements. The date of his departure was settled, and Mrs. Carey wrote to him again. She reminded him of Miss Wilkinson, through whose kindness he had gone to Frau Erlen's house at Heidelberg, and told him that she had arranged to spend a few weeks with them at Blackstable. She would be crossing from Flushing on such and such a day, and if he travelled at the same time he could look after her and come on to Blackstable in her company. Philip's shyness immediately made him write to say that he could not leave till a day or two afterwards. He pictured himself looking out for Miss Wilkinson, the embarrassment of going up to her and asking if it were she, and he might so easily address the wrong person and be snubbed and then the difficulty of knowing whether in the train he ought to talk to her or whether he could ignore her and read his book. At last he left Heidelberg. For three months he had been thinking of nothing but the future, and he went without regret. He never knew that he had been happy there. Fraulein Anna gave him a copy of Der Trompeter von Sackingen, and in return he presented her with a volume of William Morris. Very wisely neither of them ever read the others present. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 Philip was surprised when he saw his uncle and aunt. He had never noticed before that they were quite old people. The vicar received him with his usual not unamiable indifference. He was a little stouter, a little balder, a little grayer. Philip saw how insignificant he was. His face was weak and self-indulgent. Aunt Louisa took him in her arms and kissed him, and tears of happiness flowed down her cheeks. Philip was touched and embarrassed. He did not know with what a hungry love she cared for him. "'Oh, the time has seemed so long since you've been away, Philip,' she cried. She stroked his hands and looked into his face with glad eyes. "'You've grown. You're quite a man now.' There was a very small moustache on his upper lip. He had bought a razor and now and then with infinite care shaved the down off his smooth chin. "'We've been so lonely without you.' And then shyly, with a little break in her voice, she asked, "'You are glad to come back to your home, aren't you?' "'Yes, rather.' She was so thin that she seemed almost transparent. The arms she put round his neck were frail bones that reminded you of chicken bones, and her faded face was, oh, so wrinkled. The gray curls which she still wore in the fashion of her youth gave her a queer pathetic look, and her little withered body was like an autumn leaf. You felt that it might be blown away by the first sharp wind. Philip realized that they had done with life these two quiet little people. They belonged to a past generation, and they were waiting there patiently, rather stupidly, for death. And he, in his figure and his youth, thirsting for excitement and adventure, was appalled at the waste. They had done nothing, and when they went it would be just as if they had never been. He felt a great pity for Aunt Louisa, and he loved her suddenly because she loved him. Then Miss Wilkinson, who had kept discreetly out of the way till the Carries had had a chance of welcoming their nephew, came into the room. "'This is Miss Wilkinson, Philip,' said Mrs. Carey. "'The prodigal has returned,' she said, holding out her hand. I have brought a rose for the prodigal's buttonhole. With a gay smile she pinned to Philip's coat the flower she had just picked in the garden. He blushed and felt foolish. He knew that Miss Wilkinson was the daughter of his uncle William's last rector, and he had a wide acquaintance with the daughters of clergymen. They wore ill-cut clothes and stout boots, 
They were generally dressed in black, for in Philip's early years at Blackstable homespuns had not reached East Anglia, and the ladies of the clergy did not favor colors. Their hair was done very untidily, and they smelt aggressively of starched linen. They considered the feminine graces unbecoming and looked the same whether they were old or young. They bore their religion arrogantly. The closeness of their connection with the church made them adopt a slightly dictatorial attitude to the rest of mankind. Miss Wilkinson was very different. She wore a white muslin gown stamped with gay little bunches of flowers and pointed high heels with open-work stockings. To Philip's inexperience it seemed that she was wonderfully dressed. He did not see that her frock was cheap and showy. Her hair was elaborately dressed with a neat curl in the middle of her forehead. It was very black, shiny, and hard, and it looked as though it could never be in the least disarranged. She had large black eyes, and her nose was slightly aquiline. In profile she had somewhat the look of a bird of prey, but full face she was prepossessing. She smiled a great deal, but her mouth was large, and when she smiled she tried to hide her teeth which were big and rather yellow. But what embarrassed Philip most was that she was heavily powdered. He had very strict views on feminine behavior and did not think a lady ever powdered. But, of course, Miss Wilkinson was a lady because she was a clergyman's daughter, and a clergyman was a gentleman. Philip made up his mind to dislike her thoroughly. She spoke with a slight French accent, and he did not know why she should, since she had been born and bred in the heart of England. He thought her smile affected, and the coy sprightliness of her manner irritated him. For two or three days he remained silent and hostile, but Miss Wilkinson apparently did not notice it. She was very affable. She addressed her conversation almost exclusively to him, and there was something flattering in the way she appealed constantly to his sane judgment. She made him laugh, too, and Philip could never resist people who amused him. He had a gift now and then of saying neat things, and it was pleasant to have an appreciative listener. Neither the vicar nor Mrs. Carey had a sense of humor, and they never laughed at anything he said. As he grew used to Miss Wilkinson and his shyness left him, he began to like her better. He found the French accent picturesque, and at a garden party which the doctor gave she was very much better dressed than anyone else. She wore a blue foulard with large white spots, and Philip was tickled at the sensation it caused. "'I'm certain they think you're no better than you should be,' he told her, laughing. "'It's the dream of my life to be taken for an abandoned hussy,' she answered. One day, when Miss Wilkinson was in her room, he asked Aunt Louisa how old she was. "'Oh, my dear, you should never ask a lady's age, but she's certainly too old for you to marry.' The vicar gave his slow, obese smile. "'She's no chicken, Louisa,' he said. "'She was nearly grown up when we were in Lincolnshire, and that was twenty years ago. She wore a pigtail hanging down her back.' "'She may not have been more than ten, said Philip. "'She was older than that,' said Aunt Louisa. "'I think she was near twenty, said the vicar. "'Oh, no, William, sixteen or seventeen at the outside. "'That would make her well over thirty, said Philip. At that moment Miss Wilkinson tripped downstairs, singing a song by Benjamin Goddard. She had put her hat on, for she and Philip were going for a walk, and she held out her hand for him to button her glove. He did it awkwardly. He felt embarrassed but gallant. Conversation went easily between them now, and as they strolled along they talked of all manner of things. She told Philip about Berlin, and he told her of his year in Heidelberg. As he spoke, things which had appeared of no importance gained a new interest. He described the people at Frau Erlen's house, and to the conversations between Hayward and Weeks, which at the time seemed so significant, he gave a little twist so that they looked absurd. He was flattered at Miss Wilkinson's laughter. "'I'm quite frightened of you,' she said. "'You're so sarcastic.' Then she asked him, playfully, whether he had any love affairs at Heidelberg. Without thinking, he frankly answered that he had not but she refused to believe him. "'How secretive you are,' she said. "'At your age is it likely?' He blushed and laughed. "'You want to know too much,' he said. "'Ah, I thought so,' she laughed triumphantly. "'Look at him blushing.' He was pleased that she should think he had been a sad dog, and he changed the conversation so as to make her believe he had all sorts of romantic things to conceal. 
he was angry with himself that he had not. There had been no opportunity. Miss Wilkinson was dissatisfied with her lot. She resented having to earn her living and told Philip a long story of an uncle of her mother's who had been expected to leave her a fortune but had married his cook and changed his will. She hinted at the luxury of her home and compared her life in Lincolnshire, with horses to ride and carriages to drive in, with the mean dependence of her present state. Philip was a little puzzled when he mentioned this afterwards to Aunt Louisa, and she told him that when she knew the Wilkinsons they had never had anything more than a pony and a dog-cart. Aunt Louisa had heard of the rich uncle, but as he was married and had children before Emily was born she could never have had much hope of inheriting his fortune. Miss Wilkinson had little good to say of Berlin, where she was now in a situation. She complained of the vulgarity of German life, and compared it bitterly with the brilliance of Paris, where she had spent a number of years. She did not say how many. She had been governess in the family of a fashionable portrait painter who had married a Jewish wife of means, and in their house she had met many distinguished people. She dazzled Philip with their names. Actors from the Comédie Française had come to the house frequently, and Coughlin, sitting next to her at dinner, had told her he had never met a foreigner who spoke such perfect French. Alpha Duday had come also, and he had given her a copy of Sappho. He had promised to write her name in it, but she had forgotten to remind him. She treasured the volume none the less, and she would lend it to Philip. Then there was Maupassant. Miss Wilkinson, with a rippling laugh, looked at Philip knowingly. What a man, but what a writer! Hayward had talked of Maupassant, and his reputation was not unknown to Philip. Did he make love to you? he asked. The words seemed to stick funnily in his throat, but he asked them nevertheless. He liked Miss Wilkinson very much now and was thrilled by her conversation, but he could not imagine anyone making love to her. "'What a question!' she cried. "'Poor Guy, he made love to every woman he met. It was a habit he could not break himself of.' She sighed a little and seemed to look back tenderly on the past. "'He was a charming man,' she murmured. A greater experience than Phillips would have guessed from these words the probabilities of the encounter. The distinguished writer invited to luncheon en famille, the governess coming in sedately with the two tall girls she was teaching. The introduction. Notre Miss Anglaise? Mademoiselle? And the luncheon during which the Miss Anglaise sat silent while the distinguished writer talked to his host and hostess. But to Philip, her words called up much more romantic fancies. "'Do tell me about him,' he said excitedly. "'There's nothing to tell,' she said truthfully, but in such a manner as to convey that three volumes would scarcely have contained the lurid facts. "'You mustn't be curious.' She began to talk of Paris. She loved the boulevards and the bois. There was grace in every street, and the trees in the Champs-Élysées had a distinction which trees had not elsewhere. They were sitting on the stile now by the high road, and Miss Wilkinson looked with disdain upon the stately elms in front of them. And the theatres, the plays were brilliant, and the acting was incomparable. She often went with Madame Foyer, the mother of the girls she was educating when she was trying on clothes. "'Oh, what a misery to be poor!' she cried. "'These beautiful things, it's only in Paris they know how to dress, and not to be able to afford them poor Madame Foyer. She had no figure. Sometimes the dressmaker used to whisper to me, "'Ah, mademoiselle, if she only had your figure!' Philip noticed then that Miss Wilkinson had a robust form and was proud of it. "'Men are so stupid in England. They think only of the face. The French, who are a nation of lovers, know how much more important the figure is.' Philip had never thought of such things before, but he observed now that Miss Wilkinson's ankles were thick and ungainly. He withdrew his eyes quickly. "'You should go to France. Why don't you go to Paris for a year? You would learn French, and it would dénaiser you.' "'What is that?' asked Philip. She laughed slyly. "'You must look it out in the dictionary. Englishmen do not know how to treat women. They are so shy. Shyness is ridiculous in a man. They don't know how to make love.' They can't even tell a woman she is charming without looking foolish. Philip 
felt himself absurd. Miss Wilkinson evidently expected him to behave very differently, and he would have been delighted to say gallant and witty things. But they never occurred to him, and when they did he was too much afraid of making a fool of himself to say them. "'Oh, I love Paris,' sighed Miss Wilkinson. "'But I had to go to Berlin. I was with the foyers till the girls married, and then I could get nothing to do, and I had the chance of this post in Berlin.' their relations of madame foyer and i accepted i had a tiny apartment in the rue broda on saint renaud it wasn't at all respectable you know about the rue broda ces dames you know philip nodded not knowing at all what she meant but vaguely suspecting and anxious she should not think him too ignorant but i didn't care Je suis libre n'est-ce pas she was very fond of speaking french which indeed she spoke well once i had such a curious adventure there she paused a little and philip pressed her to tell it you wouldn't tell me yours in heidelberg she said they were so unadventurous he retorted i don't know what mrs carey would say if she knew the sort of things we talk about together you don't imagine i shall tell her will you promise when he had done this she told him how an art student who had a room on the floor above her but she interrupted herself why don't you go in for art you paint so prettily not well enough for that that is for others to judge je me connais and i believe you have the making of a great artist can't you see uncle william's face if i suddenly told him i wanted to go to paris and study art you're your own master aren't you you're trying to put me off please go on with the story miss wilkinson with a little laugh went on the art student had passed her several times on the stairs, and she had paid no particular attention. She saw that he had fine eyes, and he took off his hat very politely. And one day she found the letter slipped under her door. It was from him. He told her that he had adored her for months, and that he waited about the stairs for her to pass. Oh, it was a charming letter. Of course she did not reply, but what woman could help being flattered? And next day there was another letter. It was wonderful, passionate, and touching. When next she met him on the stairs she did not know which way to look, and every day the letters came, and now he begged to see her. He said he would come in the evening, Vernever, and she did not know what to do. Of course it was impossible, and he might ring and ring, but she would never open the door. And then, while she was waiting for the tinkling of the bell, all nerves, suddenly he stood before her. She had forgotten to shut the door when she came in. C'était un fatelli? And what happened then? asked Philip. That is the end of the story, she replied with a ripple of laughter. Philip was silent for a moment. His heart beat quickly, and strange emotions seemed to be hustling one another in his heart. He saw the dark staircase and the chance meetings, and he admired the boldness of the letters. Oh, he would never have dared to do that. And then the silent almost mysterious entrance. It seemed to him the very soul of romance. What was he like? Oh, he was handsome. Charmant Gercon. Do you know him still? Philip felt a slight feeling of irritation as he asked this. He treated me abominably. Men are always the same. You're heartless, all of you. I don't know about that, said Philip, not without embarrassment. Let us go home, said Miss Wilkinson. End of chapter 32. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapters 33 through 35 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan Chapter 33 Philip could not get Miss Wilkinson's story out of his head. It was clear enough what she meant even though she cut it short, and he was a little shocked. That sort of thing was all very well for married women. He had read enough French novels to know that in France it was indeed the rule, but Miss Wilkinson was English and unmarried. Her father was a clergyman. Then it struck him that the art student probably was neither the first 
nor the last of her lovers, and he gasped. He had never looked upon Miss Wilkinson like that. It seemed incredible that anyone should make love to her. In his ingenuousness he doubted her story as little as he doubted what he read in books, and he was angry that such wonderful things never happened to him. It was humiliating that if Miss Wilkinson insisted upon his telling her of his adventure in Heidelberg he would have nothing to tell. It was true that he had some power of invention, but he was not sure whether he could persuade her that he was steeped in vice. Women were full of intuition, he had read that, and she might easily discover that he was fibbing. He blushed scarlet as he thought of her laughing up her sleeve. Miss Wilkinson played the piano and sang in a rather tired voice, but her songs, Massonet, Benjamin Goddard, and Augusta Holmes, were new to Philip, and together they spent many hours at the piano. One day she wondered if he had a voice and insisted on trying it. She told him he had a pleasant baritone and offered to give him lessons. At first, with his usual bashfulness, he refused, but she insisted and then every morning at a convenient time after breakfast she gave him an hour's lesson. She had a natural gift for teaching, and it was clear that she was an excellent governess. She had method and firmness. Though her French accent was so much a part of her that it remained, all the mellifluousness of her manner left her when she was engaged in teaching. She put up with no nonsense. Her voice became a little peremptory, and instinctively she suppressed inattention and corrected slovenliness. She knew what she was about and put Philip to scales and exercises. When the lesson was over she resumed without effort her seductive smiles, her voice became again soft and winning, but Philip could not so easily put away the pupil as she the pedagogue, and this impression convicted with the feelings her stories had aroused in him. He looked at her more narrowly. He liked her much better in the evening than in the morning. In the morning she was rather lined and the skin of her neck was just a little rough. He wished she would hide it, but the weather was very warm just then, and she wore blouses which were cut low. She was very fond of white. In the morning it did not suit her. At night she often looked very attractive. She put on a gown which was almost a dinner dress and she wore a chain of garnets round her neck. The lace about her bosom and at her elbows gave her a pleasant softness, and the scent she wore at Blackstable no one used anything but eau de cologne, and that only on Sundays or when suffering from a sick headache was troubling and exotic. She really looked very young then. Philip was much exercised over her age. He added twenty and seventeen together and could not bring them to a satisfactory total. He asked Aunt Louisa more than once why she thought Miss Wilkinson was thirty-seven. She didn't look more than thirty, and everyone knew that foreigners aged more rapidly than English women. Miss Wilkinson had lived so long abroad that she might almost be called a foreigner. He personally wouldn't have thought her more than twenty-six. "'She's more than that,' said Aunt Louisa. Philip did not believe in the accuracy of the Carey's statements. All they distinctly remembered was that Miss Wilkinson had not got her hair up the last time they saw her in Lincolnshire. Well, she might have been twelve then. It was so long ago, and the vicar was always so unreliable. They said it was twenty years ago, but people used round figures, and it was just as likely to be eighteen years, or seventeen. Seventeen and twelve were only twenty-nine, and hang it all, that wasn't old, was it? Cleopatra was forty-eight when Antony threw away the world for her sake. It was a fine summer. Day after day was hot and cloudless, but the heat was tempered by the neighborhood of the sea, and there was a pleasant exhilaration in the air, so that one was excited and not oppressed by the August sunshine. There was a pond in the garden in which a fountain played. Water lilies grew in it, and goldfish sunned themselves on the surface. Philip and Miss Wilkinson used to take rugs and cushions there after dinner, and lie on the lawn in the shade of a tall hedge of roses. They talked and read all the afternoon. They smoked cigarettes, which the vicar did not allow in the house. He thought smoking a disgusting habit, and used frequently to say that it was disgraceful for anyone to grow a slave to a habit. He forgot that he was himself 
a slave to afternoon tea. One day Miss Wilkinson gave Philip La Vie de Bon. She had found it by accident when she was rummaging among the books in the vicar's study. It had been bought in a lot with something Mr. Carey wanted, and had remained undiscovered for ten years. Philip began to read Murger's fascinating, ill-written, absurd masterpiece, and fell at once under its spell. His soul danced with joy at that picture of starvation which is so good-humoured, of squalor which is so picturesque, of sordid love which is so romantic, of bathos which is so moving. Rodolphe and Mimi, Musset and Chouinard, they wander through the grey streets of the Latin Quarter, finding refuge now in one attic, now in another, in their quaint costume of Louis Philippe, with their tears and their smiles, happy-go-lucky and reckless. Who can resist them? It is only when you return to the book with a sounder judgment that you find how gross their pleasures were, how vulgar their minds, and you feel the utter worthlessness as artists and as human beings of that gay procession. Philip was enraptured. "'Don't you wish you were going to Paris instead of London?' asked Miss Wilkinson, smiling at his enthusiasm. "'It's too late now, even if I did,' he answered. During the fortnight he had been back from Germany there had been much discussion between himself and his uncle about his future. He had refused definitely to go to Oxford, and now that there was no chance of his getting scholarships, even Mr. Carey came to the conclusion that he could not afford it. His entire fortune had consisted of only two thousand pounds, and though it had been invested in mortgages at five per cent, he had not been able to live on the interest. It was now a little reduced. It would be absurd to spend two hundred a year, the least he could live on at a university, for three years at Oxford which would lead him no nearer to earn his living. He was anxious to go straight to London. Mrs. Carey thought there were only four professions for a gentleman the army, the navy, the law, and the church. She had added medicine because her brother-in-law practiced it, but did not forget that in her young days no one ever considered the doctor a gentleman. The first two were out of the question, and Philip was firm in his refusal to be ordained. Only the law remained. The local doctor had suggested that many gentlemen now went in for engineering, but Mrs. Carey opposed the idea at once. I shouldn't like Philip to go into trade, she said. No, he must have a profession, answered the vicar. Why not make him a doctor like his father? I should hate it, said Philip. Mrs. Carey was not sorry. The bar seemed out of the question, since he was not going to Oxford, for the Careys were under the impression that a degree was still necessary for success in that calling. And finally it was suggested that he should become articled to a solicitor. They wrote to the family lawyer Albert Nixon, who was co-executor of the vicar of Blackstable for the late Henry Carey's estate, and asked him whether he would take Philip. In a day or two the answer came back that he had not a vacancy, and was very much opposed to the whole scheme. The profession was greatly overcrowded, and without capital or connections a man had small chance of becoming more than a managing clerk. He suggested, however, that Philip should become a chartered accountant. Neither the vicar nor his wife knew in the least what this was, and Philip had never heard of any one being a chartered accountant. But another letter from the solicitor explained that the growth of modern businesses and the increase of companies had led to the formation of many firms of accountants to examine the books and put into the financial affairs of their clients an order which old-fashioned methods had lacked. Some years before a royal charter had been obtained, and the profession was becoming every year more respectable, lucrative, and important. The chartered accountants whom Albert Nixon had employed for thirty years happened to have a vacancy for an articled pupil, and would take Philip for a fee of three hundred pounds. Half of this would be returned during the five years the articles lasted in the form of salary. The prospect was not exciting, but Philip felt that he must decide on something and the thought of living in London overbalanced the slight shrinking he felt. The vicar of Blackstable wrote to ask Mr. Nixon whether it was a profession suited to a gentleman, and Mr. Nixon replied that, since the charter, men were going into it who had been to public schools and a university. Moreover, 
If Philip disliked the work and after a year wished to leave, Herbert Carter, for that was the accountant's name, would return half the money paid for the articles. This settled it, and it was arranged that Philip should start work on the 15th of September. "'I have a full month before me,' said Philip. "'And then you go to freedom and I to bondage,' returned Miss Wilkinson. Her holidays were to last six weeks, and she would be leaving Blackstable only a day or two before Philip. "'I wonder if we shall ever meet again,' she said. "'I don't know why not. Oh, don't speak in that practical way. I never knew anyone so unsentimental.' Philip reddened. He was afraid that Miss Wilkinson would think him a milksop. After all, she was a young woman, sometimes quite pretty, and he was getting on for twenty. It was absurd that they should talk of nothing but art and literature. He ought to make love to her. They had talked a good deal of love. There was the art student in the Rue Broda, and then there was the painter in whose family she had lived so long in Paris. He had asked her to sit for him, and had started to make love to her so violently that she was forced to invent excuses not to sit to him again. It was clear enough that Miss Wilkinson was used to attentions of that sort. She looked very nice now in a large straw hat. It was hot that afternoon, the hottest day they had had, and beads of sweat stood in a line on her upper lip. He called to mind Fräulein Cassilli and Herr Sung. He had never thought of Cassilli in an amorous way. She was exceedingly plain. But now, looking back, the affair seemed very romantic. He had a chance of romance, too. Miss Wilkinson was practically French and that added zest to a possible adventure. When he thought of it at night in bed, or when he sat by himself in the garden reading a book, he was thrilled by it. But when he saw Miss Wilkinson it seemed less picturesque. At all events, after what she had told him, she would not be surprised if he made love to her. He had a feeling that she must think it odd of him to make no sign. Perhaps it was only his fancy, but once or twice in the last day or two he had imagined that there was a suspicion of contempt in her eyes. "'A penny for your thoughts,' said Miss Wilkinson, looking at him with a smile. "'I'm not going to tell you,' he answered. He was thinking that he ought to kiss her, there and then. He wondered if she expected him to do it. But, after all, he didn't see how he could without any preliminary business at all. She would just think him mad, or she might slap his face, and perhaps she would complain to his uncle. He wondered how Herr Sung had started with Fräulein Cassilli. It would be beastly if she told his uncle. He knew what his uncle was. He would tell the doctor and Josiah Graves, and he would look a perfect fool. Aunt Louisa kept on saying that Miss Wilkinson was thirty-seven if she was a day. He shuddered at the thought of the ridicule he would be exposed to. They would say she was old enough to be his mother. Two pence for your thoughts, smiled Miss Wilkinson. I was thinking about you, he answered boldly. That, at all events, committed him to nothing. What were you thinking? Ah, now you want to know too much. Naughty boy, said Miss Wilkinson. There it was again. Whenever he had succeeded in working himself up, she said something which reminded him of the governess. She called him playfully a naughty boy when he did not sing his exercises to her satisfaction. This time he grew quite sulky. I wish you wouldn't treat me as if I were a child. Are you cross? Very. I didn't mean to. She put out her hand and he took it. Once or twice lately when they shook hands at night he had fancied she slightly pressed his hand, but this time there was no doubt about it. He did not quite know what he ought to say next. Here at last was his chance of an adventure, and he would be a fool not to take it. But it was a little ordinary, and he had expected more glamour. He had read many descriptions of love, and he felt in himself none of that uprush of emotion which novelists described. He was not carried off his feet in wave upon wave of passion. Nor was Miss Wilkinson the ideal. He had often pictured to himself the great violet eyes and the alabaster skin of some lovely girl, and he had thought of himself burying his face in the rippling masses of her auburn hair. He could not imagine himself burying his face in Miss Wilkinson's hair. It always struck him as a little sticky. 
all the same it would be very satisfactory to have an intrigue, and he thrilled with the legitimate pride he would enjoy in his conquest. He owed it to himself to seduce her. He made up his mind to kiss Miss Wilkinson, not then, but in the evening. It would be easier in the dark, and after he had kissed her the rest would follow. He would kiss her that very evening. He swore an oath to that effect. He laid his plans. After supper he suggested they should take a stroll in the garden. Miss Wilkinson accepted, and they sauntered side by side. Philip was very nervous. He did not know why, but the conversation would not lead in the right direction. He had decided that the first thing to do was to put his arm round her waist, but he could not suddenly put his arm round her waist when she was talking of the regatta which was to be held next week. He led her artfully into the darkest parts of the garden, but having arrived there his courage failed him. They sat on a bench, and he had really made up his mind that here was his opportunity when Miss Wilkinson said she was sure there were earwigs, and insisted on moving. They walked round the garden once more, and Philip promised himself he would take the plunge before they arrived at that bench again, but as they passed the house they saw Mrs. Carey standing at the door. "'Hadn't you young people better come in? I'm sure the night air isn't good for you.' "'Perhaps we had better go in,' said Philip. "'I don't want you to catch cold.' He said it with a sigh of relief. He could attempt nothing more that night. But afterwards, when he was alone in his room, he was furious with himself. He had been a perfect fool. He was certain that Miss Wilkinson expected him to kiss her, otherwise she wouldn't have come into the garden. She was always saying that only Frenchmen knew how to treat women. Philip had read French novels. If he had been a Frenchman he would have seized her in his arms and told her passionately that he adored her. He would have kissed her lips on her nook. He did not know why Frenchmen always kissed ladies on the nook. He did not himself see anything so very attractive in the nape of the neck. Of course it was much easier for a Frenchman to do these things. The language was such an aid. Philip could never help feeling that to say passionate things in English sounded a little absurd. He wished now that he had never undertaken the siege of Miss Wilkinson's virtue. The first fortnight had been so jolly, and now he was wretched. But he was determined not to give in, he would never respect himself again if he did, and he made up his mind irrevocably that the next night he would kiss her without fail. Next day when he got up he saw it was raining, and his first thought was that they would not be able to go into the garden that evening. He was in high spirits at breakfast. Miss Wilkinson sent Mary Ann in to say that she had a headache and would remain in bed. She did not come down till tea-time, when she appeared in a becoming wrapper and a pale face. But she was quite recovered by supper, and the meal was very cheerful. After prayers she said she would go straight to bed, and she kissed Mrs. Carey. Then she turned to Philip. "'Good gracious!' she cried. "'I was just going to kiss you, too.' "'Why don't you?' he said. She laughed and held out her hand. She distinctly pressed his. The following day there was not a cloud in the sky, and the garden was sweet and fresh after the rain. Philip went down to the beach to bathe, and when he came home ate a magnificent dinner. They were having a tennis party at the vicarage in the afternoon, and Miss Wilkinson put on her best dress. She certainly knew how to wear clothes, and Philip could not help noticing how elegant she looked beside the curate's wife and the doctor's married daughter. There were two roses in her waistband. She sat in a garden chair by the side of the lawn, holding a red parasol over herself, and the light on her face was very becoming. Philip was fond of tennis. He served well, and as he ran clumsily played close to the net. Notwithstanding his club foot he was quick, and it was difficult to get a ball past him. He was pleased because he won all his sets. At tea he lay down at Miss Wilkins's feet, hot and panting. "'Flannel suits you,' she said. "'You look very nice this afternoon.' He blushed with delight. "'I can honestly return the compliment. You look perfectly ravishing.' She smiled and gave him a long look with her black eyes. After supper he insisted that she should come out. "'Haven't you had enough exercise for one day?' It'll be lovely in the garden tonight. The stars are all out. 
he was in high spirits. "'Do you know Mrs. Carey has been scolding me on your account?' said Miss Wilkinson when they were sauntering through the kitchen garden. "'She says I mustn't flirt with you.' "'Have you been flirting with me? I hadn't noticed it. She was only joking. It was very unkind of you to refuse to kiss me last night. If you saw the look your uncle gave me when I said what I did! Was that all that prevented you? I prefer to kiss people without witnesses. There are no witnesses now. Philip put his arm round her waist and kissed her lips. She only laughed a little and made no attempt to withdraw. It had come quite naturally. Philip was very proud of himself. He said he would, and he had. It was the easiest thing in the world. He wished he had done it before. He did it again. "'Oh, you mustn't,' she said. "'Why not?' "'Because I like it,' she laughed. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 Next day, after dinner, they took their rugs and cushions to the fountain and their books, but they did not read. Miss Wilkinson made herself comfortable, and she opened the red sunshade. Philip was not at all shy now, but at first she would not let him kiss her. "'It was very wrong of me last night,' she said. "'I couldn't sleep. I felt I'd done so wrong.' "'What nonsense!' he cried. "'I'm sure you slept like a top. What do you think your uncle would say if he knew?' "'There's no reason why he should know.' He leaned over her, and his heart went pit-a-pat. "'Why do you want to kiss me?' He knew he ought to reply, because I love you, but he could not bring himself to say it. Why do you think? he asked instead. She looked at him with smiling eyes and touched his face with the tips of her fingers. How smooth your face is, she murmured. I want shaving awfully, he said. It was astonishing how difficult he found it to make romantic speeches. He found that silence helped him much more than words. He could look inexpressible things. Miss Wilkinson sighed. "'Do you like me at all?' "'Yes, awfully.' And when he tried to kiss her again, she did not resist. He pretended to be much more passionate than he really was, and he succeeded in playing a part which looked very well in his own eyes. "'I'm beginning to be rather frightened of you,' said Miss Wilkinson. "'You'll come out after supper, won't you?' he begged. "'Not unless you promise to behave yourself.' "'I'll promise anything.' He was catching fire from the flame he was partly simulating, and at tea-time he was obstreperously merry. Miss Wilkinson looked at him nervously. "'You mustn't have those shining eyes,' she said to him afterwards. "'What will your Aunt Louisa thinks? I don't care what she thinks.' Miss Wilkinson gave a little laugh of pleasure. They had no sooner finished supper than he said to her, "'Are you going to keep me company while I smoke a cigarette?' "'Why don't you let Miss Wilkinson rest?' said Mrs. Carey. You must remember she's not as young as you. Oh, I'd like to go out, Mrs. Carey, she said rather acidly. After dinner, walk a mile. After supper, rest a while, said the vicar. Your aunt is very nice, but she gets on my nerves some time, said Miss Wilkinson as soon as they closed the side door behind them. Philip threw away the cigarette he had just lighted and flung his arms round her. She tried to push him away. You promised you'd be good, Philip. You didn't think I was going to keep a promise like that. Not so near the house, Philip, she said. Supposing someone should come out suddenly. He led her to the kitchen garden where no one was likely to come, and this time Miss Wilkinson did not think of earwigs. He kissed her passionately. It was one of the things that puzzled him that he did not like her at all in the morning, and only moderately in the afternoon. But at night the touch of her hand thrilled him. He said things that he would never have thought himself capable of saying. He could certainly never have said them in the broad light of day. And he listened to himself with wonder and satisfaction. "'How beautifully you make love,' she said. That was what he thought himself. "'Oh, if I could only say all the things that burn my heart,' he murmured passionately. It was splendid. It was the most thrilling game he had ever played, and the wonderful thing was that he felt almost all he said. It was only that he exaggerated a little. He was tremendously interested and exciting in the effect he could see it had on her. It was obviously with an effort that at last she suggested going in. "'Oh, don't go yet,' he cried. "'I must,' she muttered. "'I'm frightened.' He had a sudden intuition what was the right thing to do then. 
I can't go in yet. I shall stay here and think. My cheeks are burning. I want the night air. Good night. He held out his hand seriously, and she took it in silence. He thought she stifled a sob. Oh, it was magnificent. When, after a decent interval during which he had been rather bored in the dark garden by himself, he went in, he found that Miss Wilkinson had already gone to bed. After that things were different between them. The next day and the day after Philip showed himself an eager lover. He was deliciously flattered to discover that Miss Wilkinson was in love with him. She told him so in English, and she told him so in French. She paid him compliments. No one had ever informed him before that his eyes were charming and that he had a sensual mouth. He had never bothered much about his personal appearance, but now, when occasion presented, he looked at himself in the glass with satisfaction. When he kissed her it was wonderful to feel the passion that seemed to thrill her soul. He kissed her a good deal, for he found it easier to do that than to say the things he instinctively felt she expected of him. It still made him feel a fool to say he worshipped her. He wished there were someone to whom he could boast a little, and he would willingly have discussed minute points of his conduct. Sometimes she said things that were enigmatic, and he was puzzled. He wished Hayward had been there so that he could ask him what he thought she meant and what he had better do next. He could not make up his mind whether he ought to rush things or let them take their time. There were only three weeks more. "'I can't bear to think of that,' she said. "'It breaks my heart, and then perhaps we shall never see one another again. "'If you cared for me at all, you wouldn't be so unkind to me,' he whispered. "'Oh, why can't you be content to let it go on as it is? "'Men are always the same. They're never satisfied.' And when he pressed her, she said, "'But don't you see it's impossible? How can we hear?' He proposed all sorts of schemes, but she would not have anything to do with them. I daren't take the risk. It would be too dreadful if your aunt found out. A day or two later he had an idea which seemed brilliant. Look here. If you had a headache on Sunday evening and offered to stay at home and look after the house, Aunt Louisa would go to church. Generally Mrs. Carey remained in on Sunday evening in order to allow Mary Ann to go to church, but she would welcome the opportunity of attending Evensong. Philip had not found it necessary to impart to his relations the change in his views on Christianity which had occurred in Germany. They could not be expected to understand, and it seemed less trouble to go to church quietly. But he only went in the morning. He regarded this as a graceful concession to the prejudices of society, and his refusal to go a second time as an adequate assertion of free thought. When he made a suggestion, Miss Wilkinson did not speak for a moment then shook her head. "'No, I won't,' she said. But on Sunday at tea-time she surprised Philip. "'I don't think I'll come to church this evening,' she said suddenly. "'I've really got a dreadful headache.' Mrs. Carey, much concerned, insisted on giving her some drops which she was herself in the habit of using. Miss Wilkinson thanked her, and immediately after tea announced that she would go to her room and lie down. "'Are you sure there's nothing you'll want?' asked Mrs. Carey anxiously. "'Quite sure, thank you. Because if there isn't, I think I'll go to church. I don't often have the chance of going in the evening.' "'Oh, yes, do go.' "'I shall be in,' said Philip. "'If Miss Wilkinson wants anything, she can always call me. You'd better leave the drawing-room door open, Philip, so that if Miss Wilkinson rings you'll hear.' "'Certainly,' said Philip. So, after six o'clock, Philip was left alone in the house with Miss Wilkinson. He felt sick with apprehension. He wished with all his heart that he had not suggested the plan. But it was too late now. He must take the opportunity which he had made. What would Miss Wilkinson think of him if he did not? He went into the hall and listened. There was not a sound. He wondered if Miss Wilkinson really had a headache. Perhaps she had forgotten his suggestion. His heart beat painfully. He crept up the stairs as softly as he could, and he stopped with a start when they creaked. He stood outside Miss Wilkinson's room and listened. He put his hand on the knob of the door-handle. He waited. It seemed to him that he waited for at least five minutes, trying to make up his mind, and his hand trembled. 
he would willingly have bolted, but he was afraid of the remorse which he knew would seize him. It was like getting on the highest diving board in a swimming bath. It looked nothing from below, but when you got up there and stared down at the water your heart sank, and the only thing that forced you to dive was the shame of coming down meekly by the steps you had climbed up. Philip screwed up his courage. He turned the handle softly and walked in. He seemed to himself to be trembling like a leaf. Miss Wilkinson was standing at the dressing-table with her back to the door, and she turned round quickly when she heard it open. "'Oh, it's you. What do you want?' She had taken off her skirt and blouse, and was standing in her petticoat. It was short and only came down to the top of her boots. The upper part of it was black, of some shiny material, and there was a red flounce. She wore a camisole of white calico with short arms. She looked grotesque. Philip's heart sank as he stared at her. She had never seemed so unattractive. But it was too late now. He closed the door behind him and locked it. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 Philip woke up early next morning. His sleep had been restless, but when he stretched his legs and looked at the sunshine that slid through the Venetian blinds making patterns on the floor, he sighed with satisfaction. He was delighted with himself. He began to think of Miss Wilkinson. She had asked him to call her Emily, but he knew not why he could not. He had always thought of her as Miss Wilkinson. Since she chid him for so addressing her, he avoided using her name at all. During his childhood he had often heard a sister of Aunt Louisa, the widow of a naval officer, spoken of as Aunt Emily. It made him uncomfortable to call Miss Wilkinson by that name, nor could he think of any that would have suited her better. She had begun as Miss Wilkinson, and it seemed inseparable from his impression of her. He frowned a little. Somehow or other he saw her now at her worst. He could not forget his dismay when she turned round, and he saw her in her camisole and the short petticoat. He remembered the slight roughness of her skin and the sharp long lines on the side of the neck. His triumph was short-lived. He reckoned out her age again, and he did not see how she could be less than forty. It made the affair ridiculous. She was plain and old. His quick fancy showed her to him, wrinkled, haggard, made up in those frocks which were too showy for her position and too young for her years. He shuddered. He felt suddenly that he never wanted to see her again. He could not bear the thought of kissing her. He was horrified with himself. Was that love? He took as long as he could over dressing in order to put back the moment of seeing her, and when at last he went into the dining-room it was with a sinking heart. Prayers were over, and they were sitting down at breakfast. "'Lazy bones!' Miss Wilkinson cried gaily. He looked at her and gave a little gasp of relief. She was sitting with her back to the window. She was really quite nice. He wondered why he had thought such things about her. His self-satisfaction returned to him. He was taken aback by the change in her. She told him in a voice thrilling with emotion immediately after breakfast that she loved him. And when a little later they went into the drawing-room for his singing lesson and she sat down on the music-stool, she put up her face in the middle of a scale and said, "'Embrafi, what?' When he bent down she flung her arms round his neck. It was slightly uncomfortable, for she held him in such a position that he felt rather choked. "'Je t'aime, je t'aime, je t'aime,' she cried, with her extravagantly French accent. Philip wished she would speak English. "'I say, I don't know if it struck you that the gardener's quite likely to pass the window any minute. "'Ah, je me fiche du chai d'imir.' Je me rufiche, et ze mo contrefiche. Philip thought it was very like a French novel, and he did not know why it slightly irritated him. At last he said, Well, I think I'll tootle along to the beach and have a dip. Oh, you're not going to leave me this morning, of all mornings? Philip did not quite know why he should not, but it did not matter. Would you like me to stay? he smiled. Oh, you darling, but no, go, go. I want to think of you mastering the salt sea waves, bathing your limbs in the broad ocean. He got his hat and sauntered off. What rot women talk, he thought to himself. 
but he was pleased and happy and flattered. She was evidently frightfully gone on him. As he limped along the high street of Blackstable he looked with a tinge of superciliousness at the people he passed. He knew a good many to nod to, and as he gave them a smile of recognition he thought to himself, if they only knew. He did want someone to know very badly. He thought he would write to Hayward, and in his mind composed a letter. He would talk of the garden and the roses and the little French governess, like an exotic flower amongst them, scented and perverse. He would say she was French because, well, she had lived in France so long that she almost was, and besides it would be shabby to give the whole thing way too exactly, don't you know? And he would tell Hayward how he had seen her first in her pretty muslin dress and of the flowers she had given him. He made a delicate idol of it. The sunshine and the sea gave it passion and magic, and the stars added poetry, and the old vicarage garden was a fit and exquisite setting. There was something Meredithian about it. It was not quite Lucy Feverell and not quite Clara Middleton, but it was inexpressibly charming. Philip's heart beat quickly. He was so delighted with his fancies that he began thinking of them again as soon as he crawled back, dripping and cold, into his bathing machine. He thought of the object of his affections. She had the most adorable little nose and large brown eyes. He would describe her to Hayward, and masses of soft brown hair, the sort of hair it was delicious to bury your face in, and a skin which was like ivory and sunshine, and her cheek was like a red, red rose. How old was she? Eighteen, perhaps? And he called her Musette. Her laughter was like a rippling brook, and her voice was so soft, so low, it was the sweetest music he had ever heard. "'What are you thinking about?' Philip stopped suddenly. He was walking slowly home. "'I've been waving at you for the last quarter of a mile. You are absent-minded.' Miss Wilkinson was standing in front of him, laughing at his surprise. I thought I'd come and meet you. That's awfully nice of you, he said. Did I startle you? You did a bit, he admitted. He wrote his letter to Hayward all the same. There were eight pages of it. The fortnight that remained passed quickly, and though each evening when they went into the garden after supper Miss Wilkinson remarked that one day more had gone. Philip was in too cheerful spirits to let the thought depress him. One night, Miss Wilkinson suggested that it would be delightful if she could exchange her situation in Berlin for one in London. Then they could see one another constantly. Philip said it would be very jolly, but the prospect aroused no enthusiasm in him. He was looking forward to a wonderful life in London, and he preferred not to be hampered. He spoke a little too freely of all he meant to do, and allowed Miss Wilkinson to see that already he was longing to be off. "'You wouldn't talk like that if you loved me,' she cried. He was taken aback and remained silent. "'What a fool I've been!' she muttered. To his surprise he saw that she was crying. He had a tender heart and hated to see anyone miserable. "'Oh, I'm awfully sorry. What have I done? Don't cry.' "'Oh, Philip, don't leave me. You don't know what you mean to me. I have such a wretched life, and you've made me so happy.' He kissed her silently. There really was anguish in her tone, and he was frightened. It had never occurred to him that she meant what she said quite, quite seriously. "'I'm awfully sorry. You know I'm frightfully fond of you. I wish you would come to London. You know I can't. Places are almost impossible to get, and I hate English life.' Almost unconscious that he was acting a part, moved by her distress, he pressed her more and more. Her tears vainly flattered him and he kissed her with real passion. But a day or two later she made a real scene. There was a tennis party at the vicarage, and two girls came, daughters of a retired major in an Indian regiment who had lately settled in Blackstable. They were very pretty. One was Philip's age and the other was a year or two younger. Being used to the society of young men, they were full of stories of hill stations in India and at that time the stories of Rudyard Kipling were in every hand, they began to chaff Philip gaily, and he, pleased with the novelty, the young ladies at Blackstable treated the vicar's nephew with a certain seriousness, was gay and jolly. Some devil within him prompted him to start a violent flirtation with them both, 
and as he was the only young man there they were quite willing to meet him halfway. It happened that they played tennis quite well, and Philip was tired of pat-ball with Miss Wilkinson. She had only begun to play when she came to Blackstable. So when he arranged the sets after tea he suggested that Miss Wilkinson should play against the curate's wife, with the curate as her partner, and he would play later with the newcomers. He sat down with the elder Miss O'Connor and said to her in an undertone, We'll get the duffers out of the way first, and then we'll have a jolly set afterwards. Apparently Miss Wilkinson overheard him, for she threw down her racket and, saying she had a headache, went away. It was plain to everyone that she was offended. Philip was annoyed that she should make the fact public. The set was arranged without her, but presently Mrs. Carey called him. Philip, you've hurt Emily's feelings. She's gone to her room and she's crying. What about? Oh, something about a duffer set. Do go to her and say you didn't mean to be unkind. There's a good boy. All right. He knocked at Miss Wilkinson's door, but receiving no answer, went in. He found her lying face downwards on her bed, weeping. He touched her on the shoulder. I say, what on earth's the matter? Leave me alone. I never want to speak to you again. What have I done? I'm awfully sorry if I've hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to. I say, do get up. Oh, I'm so unhappy. How could you be cruel to me? You know I hate that stupid game. I only play because I want to play with you. She got up and walked towards the dressing table, but after a quick look in the glass sank into a chair. She made her handkerchief into a ball and dabbed her eyes with it. I've given you the greatest thing a woman can give a man. Oh, what a fool I was! And you have no gratitude. You must be quite heartless. How could you be so cruel as to torment me by flirting with those vulgar girls? We've only got just over a week. Can't you even give me that?" Philip stood over her rather sulkily. He thought her behavior childish. He was vexed with her for having shown her ill temper before strangers. But you know I don't care twopence about either of the O'Connors. Why on earth should you think I do? Miss Wilkinson put away her handkerchief. Her tears had made marks on her powdered face, and her hair was somewhat disarranged. Her white dress did not suit her very well just then. She looked at Philip with hungry, passionate eyes. "'Because you're twenty, and so she,' she said hoarsely. "'And I'm old.' Philip reddened and looked away. The anguish of her tone made him feel strangely uneasy. He wished with all his heart that he had never had anything to do with Miss Wilkinson. I don't want to make you unhappy, he said awkwardly. You'd better go down and look after your friends. They'll wonder what has become of you. All right. He was glad to leave her. The quarrel was quickly followed by a reconciliation, but the few days that remained were sometimes irksome to Philip. He wanted to talk of nothing but the future, and the future invariably reduced Miss Wilkinson to tears. At first her weeping affected him, and feeling himself a beast he redoubled his protestations of undying passion. But now it irritated him. It would have been all very well if she had been a girl, but it was silly of a grown-up woman to cry so much. She never ceased reminding him that he was under a debt of gratitude to her which he could never repay. He was willing to acknowledge this since she made a point of it, but he did not really know why he should be any more grateful to her than she to him. He was expected to show his sense of obligation in ways which were rather a nuisance. He had been a good deal used to solitude, and it was a necessity to him sometimes. But Miss Wilkinson looked upon it as an unkindness if he was not always at her beck and call. The Miss O'Connors asked them both to tea, and Philip would have liked to go, but Miss Wilkinson said she only had five days more and wanted him entirely to himself. It was flattering, but a bore. Miss Wilkinson told him stories of the exquisite delicacy of Frenchmen when they stood in the same relation to fair ladies as he to Miss Wilkinson. She praised their courtesy, their passion for self-sacrifice, their perfect tact. Miss Wilkinson seemed to want a great deal. Philip listened to her enumeration of the qualities which must be possessed by the perfect lover, and he could not help feeling a certain satisfaction that she lived in Berlin. You will write to me, won't you? Write to me every day. I want to know everything you're doing. You must keep nothing from me. 
I shall be awfully busy, he answered. I'll write as often as I can. She flung her arms passionately round his neck. He was embarrassed sometimes by the demonstrations of her affection. He would have preferred her to be more passive. It shocked him a little that she should give him so marked a lead. It did not tally altogether with his prepossessions about the modesty of the feminine temperament. At length the day came on which Miss Wilkinson was to go, and she came down to breakfast pale and subdued in a serviceable travelling dress of black and white check. She looked a very competent governess. Philip was silent too, for he did not quite know what to say that would fit the circumstance, and he was terribly afraid that, if he said something flippant, Miss Wilkinson would break down before his uncle and make a scene. They had said their last good-bye to one another in the garden the night before, and Philip was relieved that there was now no opportunity for them to be alone. He remained in the dining-room after breakfast in case Miss Wilkinson should insist on kissing him on the stairs. He did not want Mary Ann, now a woman hard upon middle age with a sharp tongue, to catch them in a compromising position. Mary Ann did not like Miss Wilkinson and called her an old cat. Aunt Louisa was not very well and could not come to the station, but the vicar and Philip saw her off. Just as the train was leaving she leaned out and kissed Mr. Carey. "'I must kiss you too, Philip,' she said. "'All right,' he said, blushing. He stood on the step and she kissed him quickly. The train started and Miss Wilkinson sank into the corner of her carriage and wept disconsolately. Philip, as he walked back to the vicarage, felt a distinct sensation of relief. "'Well, did you see her safely off?' asked Aunt Louisa when they got in. "'Yes, she seemed rather weepy. She insisted on kissing me and Philip.' "'Oh, well, at her age it's not dangerous,' Mrs. Carey pointed to the sideboard. "'There's a letter for you, Philip. It came by the second post.' It was from Hayward, and ran as follows. "'My dear boy, I answer your letter at once. I ventured to read it to a great friend of mine, a charming woman whose help and sympathy have been very precious to me, a woman withal with a real feeling for art and literature.' and we agreed that it was charming. You wrote from your heart, and you do not know the delightful naivete which is in every line, and because you love you write like a poet. Ah, dear boy, that is the real thing. I felt the glow of your young passion, and your prose was musical from the sincerity of your emotion. You must be happy. I wish I could have been present unseen in that enchanted garden while you wandered hand in hand, like Daphne and Chloe amid the flowers. I can see you, my Daphnis, with a light of young love in your eyes, tender and raptured and ardent, while Chloe in your arms, so young and soft and fresh, vowing she would ne'er consent, consented. Roses and violets and honeysuckle, oh, my friend, I envy you. It is so good to think that your first love should have been pure poetry. Treasure the moments, for the immortal gods have given you the greatest gift of all, and it will be a sweet, sad memory till your dying day. You will never again enjoy that careless rapture. First love is best love, and she is beautiful, and you are young, and all the world is yours. I felt my pulse go faster when, with your adorable simplicity, you told me that you buried your face in her long hair. I am sure that it is that exquisite chestnut which seems just touched with gold. I would have you sit under a leafy tree side by side, and read together Romeo and Juliet and then I would have you fall on your knees, and on my behalf kiss the ground on which her foot has left its imprint, then tell her it is the homage of a poet to her radiant youth, and to your love for her. Yours always, G. Etheridge Hayward. What damned rot! said Philip when he finished the letter. Miss Wilkinson, oddly enough, had suggested that they should read Romeo and Juliet together, but Philip, had firmly declined. Then, as he put the letter in his pocket, he felt a queer little pang of bitterness, because reality seemed so different from the ideal. End of chapter 35 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks.com Chapters thirty six through thirty nine of 
of human bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. Chapter 36. A few days later Philip went to London. The curate had recommended rooms in Barnes, and these Philip engaged by letter at fourteen shillings a week. He reached them in the evening, and the landlady, a funny little old woman with a shriveled body and a deeply wrinkled face, had prepared high tea for him. Most of the sitting-room was taken up by the sideboard and a square table. Against one wall was a sofa covered with horsehair, and by the fireplace an armchair to match. There was a white antimacassar over the back of it, and on the seat, because the springs were broken, a hard cushion. After having his tea he unpacked and arranged his books, then he sat down and tried to read. But he was depressed. The silence in the street made him slightly uncomfortable, and he felt very much alone. Next day he got up early. He put on his tailcoat and the tall hat which he had worn at school, but it was very shabby and he had made up his mind to stop at the stores on his way to the office and buy a new one. When he had done this he found himself in plenty of time, and so walked along the Strand. The office of Messrs. Herbert Carter and Company was in a little street off Chancery Lane, and he had to ask his way two or three times. He felt that people were staring at him a great deal, and once he took off his hat to see whether by chance the label had been left on. When he arrived he knocked at the door, but no one answered, and looking at his watch he found it was barely half-past nine. He supposed he was too early. He went away and ten minutes later returned to find an office boy with a long nose, pimply face, and a Scotch accent opening the door. Philip asked for Mr. Herbert Carter. He had not come yet. When will he be here? Between ten and half-past. I'd better wait, said Philip. What are you wanting? asked the office boy. Philip was nervous, but tried to hide the fact by a jocose manner. Well, I'm going to work here, if you have no objection. Oh, you're the new articled clerk. You'd better come in. Mr. Goodworthy'll be here in a while. Philip walked in, and as he did so, saw the office boy, he was about the same age as Philip and called himself a junior clerk, look at his foot. He flushed and, sitting down, hid it behind the other. He looked round the room. It was dark and very dingy. It was lit by a skylight. There were three rows of desks in it and against them high stools. Over the chimney-piece was a dirty engraving of a prize-fight. Presently a clerk came in, and then another. They glanced at Philip and in an undertone asked the office-boy, Philip found his name was MacDougall, who he was. A whistle blew and MacDougall got up. Mr. Godworthy's come. He's the managing clerk. Shall I tell him you're here? Yes, please, said Philip. The office boy went out and in a moment returned. Will you come this way? Philip followed him across the passage and was shown into a room, small and barely furnished, in which a little thin man was standing with his back to the fireplace. He was much below the middle height, but his large head, which seemed to hang loosely on his body, gave him an odd ungainliness. His features were wide and flattened, and he had prominent pale eyes. His thin hair was sandy. He wore whiskers that grew unevenly on his face, and in places where you would have expected the hair to grow thickly there was no hair at all. His skin was pasty and yellow. He held out his hand to Philip, and when he smiled showed badly decayed teeth. He spoke with a patronizing and at the same time a timid air as though he sought to assume an importance which he did not feel. He said he hoped Philip would like the work. There was a good deal of drudgery about it, but when you got used to it it was interesting, and one made money, that was the chief thing, wasn't it? He laughed with his odd mixture of superiority and shyness. Mr. Carter will be here presently, he said. He's a little late on Monday morning sometimes. I'll call you when he comes. In the meantime I must give you something to do. Do you know anything about bookkeeping or accounts? I'm afraid not, answered Philip. I didn't suppose you would. They don't teach you things at school that are much use in business, I'm afraid. He considered for a moment. I think I can find you something to do. He went into the next room and after a little while came out with a large cardboard box. 
It contained a vast number of letters in great disorder, and he told Philip to sort them out and arrange them alphabetically according to the names of the writers. "'I'll take you to the room in which the article clerk generally sits. There's a very nice fellow in it. His name is Watson. He's a son of Watson, Cragg, and Thompson, you know, the brewers. He's spending a year with us to learn business.' Mr. Goodworthy led Philip through the dingy office where now six or eight clerks were working into a narrow room behind. It had been made into a separate apartment by a glass partition, and here they found Watson sitting back in a chair reading the sportsman. He was a large, stout young man, elegantly dressed, and he looked up as Mr. Goodworthy entered. He asserted his position by calling the managing clerk Goodworthy. The managing clerk objected to the familiarity and pointedly called him Mr. Watson, but Watson, instead of seeing it was a rebuke, accepted the title as a tribute to his gentlemanliness. "'I see they've scratched Rigoletto,' he said to Philip, as soon as they were left alone. "'Have they?' said Philip, who knew nothing about horse-racing. He looked with awe upon Watson's beautiful clothes. His tail-coat fitted him perfectly, and there was a valuable pin artfully stuck in the middle of an enormous tie. On the chimney-piece rested his tall hat. It was saucy and bell-shaped and shiny. Philip felt himself very shabby. Watson began to talk of hunting. It was such an infernal bore having to waste one's time in an infernal office. He would only be able to hunt on Saturdays and shooting. He had ripping invitations all over the country, and of course he had to refuse them. It was infernal luck, but he wasn't going to put up with it long. He was only in this internal hole for a year, and then he was going into the business, and he would hunt four days a week and get all the shooting there was. "'You've got five years of it, haven't you?' he said, waving his arm round the tiny room. "'I suppose so,' said Philip. "'I dare say I shall see something of you. Carter does our accounts, you know.' Philip was somewhat overpowered by the young gentleman's condescension. At Blackstable they had always looked upon brewing with civil contempt. The vicar made little jokes about the beerage, and it was a surprising experience for Philip to discover that Watson was such an important and magnificent fellow. He had been to Winchester and to Oxford, and his conversation impressed the fact upon one with frequency. When he discovered the details of Philip's education, his manner became more patronizing still. Of course, if one doesn't go to a public school, those sort of schools are the next best thing, aren't they? Philip asked about the other men in the office. "'Oh, I don't bother about them much, you know,' said Watson. "'Carter's not a bad sort. We have him to dine now and then. All the rest are awful bounders.' Presently Watson applied himself to some work he had in hand, and Philip set about sorting his letters. Then Mr. Goodworthy came in to say that Mr. Carter had arrived. He took Philip into a large room next door to his own. There was a big desk in it and a couple of big armchairs. A turkey carpet adorned the floor, and the walls were decorated with sporting prints. Mr. Carter was sitting at the desk and got up to shake hands with Philip. He was dressed in a long frock coat. He looked like a military man. His moustache was waxed, his grey hair was short and neat. He held himself upright. He talked in a breezy way. He lived at Enfield. He was very keen on games and the good of the country. He was an officer in the Hertfordshire Yeomanry and chairman of the Conservative Association. When he was told that a local magnate had said no one would take him for a city man, he felt that he had not lived in vain. He talked to Philip in a pleasant off-hand fashion. Mr. Goodworthy would look after him. Watson was a nice fellow, perfect gentleman, good sportsman. Did Philip hunt? Pity the sport for gentlemen. Didn't have much chance of hunting now, had to leave that to his son. His son was at Cambridge, he'd sent him to rugby, fine school rugby, nice class of boys there. In a couple of years his son would be articled, that would be nice for Philip, he'd like his son, thorough sportsman. He hoped Philip would get on well and like the work, he mustn't miss his lectures, they were getting up on the tone of the profession, they wanted gentlemen in it. Well, well, Mr. Goodworthy was there. If he wanted to know anything, Mr. Goodworthy would tell him. What was his handwriting like? Ah, well, Mr. Goodworthy would see about that. Philip was overwhelmed by so much gentlemanliness. In East Anglia 
They knew who gentlemen were and who weren't, but the gentlemen didn't talk about it. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 At first the novelty of the work kept Philip interested. Mr. Carter dictated letters to him, and he had to make fair copies of statements of accounts. Mr. Carter preferred to conduct the office on gentlemanly lines. He would have nothing to do with typewriting, and looked upon shorthand with disfavor. The office boy knew shorthand, but it was only Mr. Goodworthy who made use of his accomplishment. Now and then Philip, with one of the more experienced clerks, went out to audit the accounts of some firm. He came to know which of the clients must be treated with respect, and which were in low water. Now and then long lists of figures were given him to add up. He attended lectures for his first examination. Mr. Goodworthy repeated to him that the work was dull at first, but he would grow used to it. Philip left the office at six and walked across the river to Waterloo. His supper was waiting for him when he reached his lodgings and he spent the evening reading. On Saturday afternoons he went on to the National Gallery. Hayward had recommended to him a guide which had been compiled out of Ruskin's works, and with this in hand he went industriously through room after room. He read carefully what the critic had said about a picture, and then in a determined fashion set himself to see the same things in it. His Sundays were difficult to get through. He knew no one in London and spent them by himself. Mr. Nixon, the solicitor, asked him to spend a Sunday at Hampstead and Philip passed a happy day with a set of exuberant strangers. He ate and drank a great deal, took a walk on the heath, and came away with a general invitation to come again whenever he liked. But he was morbidly afraid of being in the way, so waited for a formal invitation. Naturally enough, it never came, for with numbers of friends of their own the Nixons did not think of the lonely silent boy whose claim upon their hospitality was so small. So on Sundays he got up late and took a walk along the towpath. At Barnes the river is muddy, dingy, and tidal. It has neither the graceful charm of the Thames above the locks nor the romance of the crowded stream below London Bridge. In the afternoon he walked about the common, and that is gray and dingy too. It is neither country nor town. The gorse is stunted, and all about is the litter of civilization. He went to a play every Saturday night and stood cheerfully for an hour or more at the gallery door. It was not worth while to go back to Barnes for the interval between the closing of the museum and his meal in an ABC shop, and the time hung heavily on his hands. He strolled up Mond Street or through the Burlington Arcade, and when he was tired went and sat down in the park or in wet weather in the public library in St. Martin's Lane. He looked at the people walking about and envied them because they had friends. Sometimes his envy turned to hatred because they were happy and he was miserable. He had never imagined that it was possible to be so lonely in a great city. Sometimes when he was standing at the gallery door the man next to him would attempt a conversation, but Philip had the country boy's suspicion of strangers and answered in such a way as to prevent any further acquaintance. After the play was over, obliged to keep to himself all he thought about it, he hurried across the bridge to Waterloo. When he got back to his rooms, in which for economy no fire had been lit, his heart sank. It was horribly cheerless. He began to loathe his lodgings in the long solitary evenings he spent in them. Sometimes he felt so lonely that he could not read, and then he sat looking into the fire hour after hour in bitter wretchedness. He had spent three months in London now, and except for that one Sunday at Hampstead, had never talked to anyone but his fellow clerks. One evening Watson asked him to dinner at a restaurant, and they went to a music hall together, but he felt shy and uncomfortable. Watson talked all the time of things he did not care about, and while he looked upon Watson as a Philistine, he could not help admiring him. He was angry because Watson obviously set no store on his culture, and with his way of taking himself at the estimate at which he saw others held him he began to despise the acquirements which till then had seemed to him not unimportant. 
he felt for the first time the humiliation of poverty. His uncle sent him fourteen pounds a month, and he had had to buy a good many clothes. His evening suit cost him five guineas. He had not dared tell Watson that it was bought in the Strand. Watson said there was only one tailor in London. "'I suppose you don't dance,' said Watson one day, with a glance at Philip's club foot. "'No,' said Philip. "'Pity. I've been asked to bring some dancing men to a ball. I could have introduced you to some jolly girls.' Once or twice hating the thought of going back to Barnes, Philip had remained in town, and late in the evening wandered through the West End till he found some house at which there was a party. He stood among the little group of shabby people, behind the footman, watching the guests arrive, and he listened to the music that floated through the window. Sometimes, notwithstanding the cold, a couple came on to the balcony and stood for a moment to get some fresh air, and Philip, imagining that they were in love with one another, turned away and limped along the street with a heavy hurt. He would never be able to stand in that man's place. He felt that no woman could ever really look upon him without distaste for his deformity. That reminded him of Miss Wilkinson. He thought of her without satisfaction. Before parting they had made an arrangement that she should write to Charing Cross Post Office till he was able to send her an address, and when he went there he found three letters from her. She wrote on blue paper with violet ink, and she wrote in French. Philip wondered why she could not write in English like a sensible woman, and her passionate expressions, because they reminded him of a French novel, left him cold. She upbraided him for not having written, and when he answered he excused himself by saying that he had been busy. He did not quite know how to start the letter. He could not bring himself to use dearest or darling, and he hated to address her as Emily, so finally he began with the word dear. It looked odd, standing by itself, and rather silly, but he made it do. It was the first love letter he had ever written, and he was conscious of its tameness. He felt that he should say all sorts of vehement things, how he thought of her every minute of the day, and how he longed to kiss her beautiful hands, and how he trembled at the thought of her red lips. But some inexplicable modesty prevented him, and instead he told her of his new rooms and his office. The answer came by return of post, angry, heartbroken, reproachful. How could he be so cold? Did he not know that she hung on his letters? She had given him all that a woman could give, and this was her reward? Was he tired of her already? Then, because he did not reply for several days, Miss Wilkinson bombarded him with letters. She could not bear his unkindness. She waited for the post, and it never brought her his letter. She cried herself to sleep night after night. She was looking so ill that everyone remarked on it. If he did not love her, why did he not say so? She added that she could not live without him, and the only thing was for her to commit suicide. She told him he was cold and selfish and ungrateful. It was all in French, and Philip knew that she wrote in that language to show off, but he was worried all the same. He did not want to make her unhappy. In a little while she wrote that she could not bear the separation any longer, she would arrange to come over to London for Christmas. Philip wrote back that he would like nothing better, only he had already an engagement to spend Christmas with friends in the country, and he did not see how he could break it. She answered that she did not wish to force herself on him, it was quite evident that he did not wish to see her. She was deeply hurt, and she never thought he would repay with such cruelty all her kindness. Her letter was touching, and Philip thought he saw marks of her tears on the paper. He wrote an impulsive reply, saying that he was dreadfully sorry, and imploring her to come. But it was with relief that he received her answer, in which she said that she found it would be impossible for her to get away. Presently, when her letters came, his heart sank. He delayed opening them, for he knew what they would contain, angry reproaches and pathetic appeals. They would make him feel a perfect beast, and yet he did not see with what he had to blame himself. He put off his answer from day to day, and then another letter would come, saying she was ill and lonely and miserable. I wish to God I'd never had anything to do with her, he said. He admired Watson because he had arranged these things so easily. 
the young man had been engaged in an intrigue with a girl who played in touring companies, and his account of the affair filled Philip with envious amazement. But after a time Watson's young affections changed, and one day he described the rupture to Philip. I thought it was no good making any bones about it, so I just told her I'd had enough of her, he said. Didn't she make an awful scene? asked Philip. The usual thing, you know, but I told her it was no good trying on that sort of thing with me. Did she cry? She began to, but I can't stand women when they cry, so I said she'd better hook it. Philip's sense of humor was growing keener with advancing years. And did she hook it? he asked, smiling. Well, there wasn't anything else for her to do, was there? Meanwhile, the Christmas holidays approached. Mrs. Carey had been ill all through November, and the doctor suggested that she and the vicar should go to Cornwall for a couple of weeks round Christmas so that she should get back her strength. The result was that Philip had nowhere to go, and he spent Christmas Day in his lodgings. Under Hayward's influence he had persuaded himself that the festivities that attend this season were vulgar and barbaric, and he made up his mind that he would take no notice of the day. But when it came the jollity of all around affected him strangely. His landlady and her husband were spending the day with a married daughter, and to save trouble Philip announced that he would take his meals out. He went up to London towards midday and ate a slice of turkey and some Christmas pudding by himself at Gaddy's, and since he had nothing to do afterwards went to Westminster Abbey for the afternoon service. The streets were almost empty, and the people who went along had a preoccupied look. They did not saunter but walked with some definite goal in view, and hardly any one was alone. To Philip they all seemed happy. He felt himself more solitary than he had ever done in his life. His intention had been to kill the day somehow in the streets, and then dine at a restaurant, but he could not face again the sight of cheerful people talking, laughing, and making merry. So he went back to Waterloo and on his way through the Westminster Bridge Road bought some ham and a couple of mince pies and went back to Barnes. He ate his food in his lonely little room and spent the evening with a book. His depression was almost intolerable. When he was back at the office it made him very sore to listen to Watson's account of the short holiday. They had had some jolly girls staying with them, and after dinner they had cleared out the drawing-room and had a dance. I didn't get to bed till three, and I don't know how I got there then. By George, I was squiffy. At last Philip asked desperately, How does one get to know people in London? Watson looked at him with surprise, and with a slightly contemptuous amusement. Oh, I don't know, one just knows them. If you go to dances you soon get to know as many people as you can do with. Philip hated Watson, and yet he would have given anything to change places with him. The old feeling that he had had at school came back to him, and he tried to throw himself into the other's skin, imagining what life would be if he were Watson. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 At the end of the year there was a great deal to do. Philip went to various places with a clerk named Thompson and spent the day monotonously calling out items of expenditure which the other checked and sometimes he was given long pages of figures to add up. He had never had a head for figures, and he could only do this slowly. Thompson grew irritated at his mistakes. His fellow clerk was a long, lean man of forty, sallow with black hair and a ragged moustache. He had hollow cheeks and deep lines on each side of his nose. He took a dislike to Philip because he was an articled clerk, because he could put down three hundred guineas and keep himself for five years, Philip had the chance of a career, while he, with his experience and ability, had no possibility of ever being more than a clerk at thirty-five shillings a week. He was a cross-grained man, oppressed by a large family, and he resented the superciliousness which he fancied he saw in Philip. He sneered at Philip because he was better educated than himself, and he mocked at Philip's pronunciation. He could not forgive him because he spoke without a cockney accent and when he talked to him sarcastically exaggerated his H's. At first his manner was merely gruff and repellent, but as he discovered that Philip had no gift for accountancy he took pleasure in humiliating him, 
His attacks were gross and silly, but they wounded Philip, and in self-defense he assumed an attitude of superiority which he did not feel. "'At a bath this morning?' Thompson said when Philip came into the office late, for his early punctuality had not lasted. "'Yes, haven't you?' "'No, I'm not a gentleman. I'm only a clerk. I have a bath on Saturday night. I suppose that's why you're more than usually disagreeable on Monday. Will you condescend to do a few sums in simple addition today? I'm afraid it's asking a great deal from a gentleman who knows Latin and Greek. Your attempts at sarcasm are not very happy. But Philip could not conceal from himself that the other clerks, ill-paid and uncouth, were more useful than himself. Once or twice Mr. Goodworthy grew impatient with him. "'You really ought to be able to do better than this by now,' he said. "'You're not even as smart as the office boy.' Philip listened sulkily. He did not like being blamed, and it humiliated him when, having been given accounts to make fair copies of, Mr. Goodworthy was not satisfied and gave them to another clerk to do. At first the work had been tolerable from its novelty, but now it grew irksome, and when he discovered that he had no aptitude for it he began to hate it. Often, when he should have been doing something that was given him, he wasted his time drawing little pictures on the office notepaper. He made sketches of Watson in every conceivable attitude, and Watson was impressed by his talent. It occurred to him to take the drawings home, and he came back next day with the praises of his family. "'I wonder you didn't become a painter,' he said. "'Only, of course, there's no money in it. It chanced that Mr. Carter, two or three days later, was dining with the Watsons, and the sketches were shown him. The following morning he sent for Philip. Philip saw him seldom and stood in some awe of him. "'Look here, young fellow. I don't care what you do out of office hours, but I've seen those sketches of yours, and they're on office paper, and Mr. Goodworthy tells me you're slack. You won't do any good as a chartered accountant unless you look alive. It's a fine profession and we're getting a very good class of men in it, but it's a profession in which you have to... He looked for the termination of the phrase but could not find exactly what he wanted, so finished rather tamely. In which you have to look alive. Perhaps Philip would have settled down but for the agreement that if he did not like the work he could leave after a year and get back half the money paid for his articles. He felt that he was fit for something better than to add up accounts, and it was humiliating that he did so ill something which seemed contemptible. The vulgar scenes with Thompson got on his nerves. In March Watson ended his year at the office and Philip, though he did not care for him, saw him go with regret. The fact that the other clerks disliked them equally, because they belonged to a class a little higher than their own, was a bond of union. When Philip thought that he must spend over four years more with that dreary set of fellows, his heart sank. He had expected wonderful things from London, and it had given him nothing. He hated it now. He did not know a soul, and he had no idea how he was going to get to know anyone. He was tired of going everywhere by himself. He began to feel that he could not stand much more of such a life. He would lie in bed at night and think of the joy of never seeing again that dingy office or any of the men in it, and of getting away from those drab lodgings. A great disappointment befell him in the spring. Hayward had announced his intention of coming to London for the season, and Philip had looked forward very much to seeing him again. He had read so much lately and thought so much that his mind was full of ideas which he wanted to discuss, and he knew nobody who was willing to interest himself in abstract things. He was quite excited at the thought of talking his fill with someone, and he was wretched when Hayward wrote to say that the spring was lovelier than ever he had known it in Italy, and he could not bear to tear himself away. He went on to ask why Philip did not come. What was the use of squandering the days of his youth in an office when the world was beautiful? The letter proceeded, I wonder you can bear it. I think of Fleet Street and Lincoln's Inn now with a shudder of disgust. There are only two things in the world that make life worth living, love and art. I cannot imagine you sitting in an office over a ledger, and do you wear a tall hat and an umbrella and a little black bag? My feeling is that one should look upon life as an adventure, one should burn with a hard, gem-like flame, and one should take risks, 
one should expose oneself to danger. Why do you not go to Paris and study art? I always thought you had talent. The suggestion fell in with the possibility that Philip for some time had been vaguely turning over in his mind. It startled him at first, but he could not help thinking of it, and in the constant rumination over it he found his only escape from the wretchedness of his present state. They all thought he had talent. At Heidelberg they had admired his watercolors. Miss Wilkinson had told him over and over again that they were chasing. Even strangers like the Watsons had been struck by his sketches. La Vie de Baume had made a deep impression on him. He had brought it to London, and when he was most depressed he had only to read a few pages to be transported into those chasing attics where Rudolphi and the rest of them danced and loved and sang. He began to think of Paris as before he had thought of London, but he had no fear of a second dissolution. He yearned for romance and beauty and love, and Paris seemed to offer them all. He had a passion for pictures, and why should he not be able to paint as well as anybody else? He wrote to Miss Wilkinson and asked her how much she thought he could live on in Paris. She told him that he could manage easily on eighty pounds a year, and she enthusiastically approved of his project. She told him he was too good to be wasted in an office. Who would be a clerk when he might be a great artist? She asked dramatically, and she besought Philip to believe in himself. That was the great thing. But Philip had a cautious nature. It was all very well for Hayward to talk of taking risks. He had three hundred a year in gilt-edged securities. Philip's entire fortune amounted to no more than eighteen hundred pounds. He hesitated. Then it chanced that one day Mr. Goodworthy asked him suddenly if he would like to go to Paris. The firm did the accounts for a hotel in the Faubourg saint Henri, which was owned by an English company, and twice a year Mr. Goodworthy and a clerk went over. The clerk, who generally went, happened to be ill, and oppressive work prevented any of the others from getting away. Mr. Goodworthy thought of Philip because he could best be spared, and his articles gave him some claim upon a job which was one of the pleasures of the business. Philip was delighted. "'You'll have to work all day,' said Mr. Goodworthy, "'but we get our evenings to ourselves, and Paris is Paris.' He smiled in a knowing way. "'They do us very well at the hotel, and they give us all our meals, so it don't cost one anything. That's the way I like going to Paris, at other people's expense.' When they arrived at Calais and Philip saw the crowd of gesticulating porters, his heart leaped. "'This is the real thing,' he said to himself. He was all eyes as the train sped through the country. He adored the sand dunes, their colors seemed to him more lovely than anything he had ever seen, and he was enchanted with the canals and the long lines of poplars. When they got out of the Gare d'Anneau and trundled along the cobbled streets in a ramshackle noisy cab, it seemed to him that he was breathing a new air so intoxicating that he could hardly restrain himself from shouting aloud. They were met at the door of the hotel by the manager, a stout pleasant man who spoke tolerable English. Mr. Goodworthy was an old friend, and he greeted them effusively. They dined in his private room with his wife, and to Philip it seemed that he had never eaten anything so delicious as the beefsteak au pain nor drunk such nectar as the Vendorinaire which were set before them. To Mr. Goodworthy, a respectable householder with excellent principles, the capital of France was a paradise of the joyously obscene. He asked the manager next morning what there was to be seen that was thick. He thoroughly enjoyed these visits of his to Paris. He said they kept you from growing rusty. In the evenings after their work was over and they had dined, he took Philip to the Moulin Rouge and to the Folet Bizière. His little eyes twinkled and his face wore a sly, sensual smile as he sought out the pornographic. He went into all the haunts which were specially arranged for the foreigner, and afterwards said that a nation could come to no good which permitted that sort of thing. He nudged Philip when at some review a woman appeared with practically nothing on and pointed out to him the most strapping of the courtesans who walked about the hall. It was a vulgar Paris that he showed Philip, but Philip saw it with eyes blinded with illusion. In the early morning he would rush out of the hotel and go to the Champs-Élysées and stand at the Place du la Concorde. It was June, 
and Paris was silvery with the delicacy of the air. Philip felt his heart go out to the people. Here, he thought, at last, was romance. They spent the inside of a week there, leaving on Sunday, and when Philip late at night reached his dingy rooms in Barnes, his mind was made up. He would surrender his articles and go to Paris to study art. But so that no one should think him unreasonable, he determined to stay at the office till his year was up. He was to have his holiday during the last fortnight in August, and when he went away he would tell Herbert Carter that he had no intention of returning. But though Philip could force himself to go to the office every day, he could not even pretend to show any interest in the work. His mind was occupied with the future. After the middle of July there was nothing much to do, and he escaped a good deal by pretending he had to go to lectures for his first examination. The time he got in this way he spent in the National Gallery. He read books about Paris and books about painting. He was steeped in Ruskin. He read many of Vasari's lives of the painters. He liked that story of Correggio, and he fancied himself standing before some great masterpiece and crying, Anch'io so, Pottore. His hesitation had left him now, and he was convinced that he had in him the makings of a great painter. After all, I can only try, he said to himself. The great thing in life is to take risks. At last came the middle of August. Mr. Carter was spending the month in Scotland, and the managing clerk was in charge of the office. Mr. Goodworthy had seemed pleasantly disposed to Philip since their trip to Paris, and now that Philip knew he was so soon to be free, he could look upon the funny little man with tolerance. "'You're going for your holiday tomorrow, Carrie?' he said to him in the evening. All day Philip had been telling himself that this was the last time he would ever sit in that hateful office. "'Yes, this is the end of my year. I'm afraid you've not done very well. Mr. Carter's very dissatisfied with you.' "'Not nearly so dissatisfied as I am with Mr. Carter.' returned Philip cheerfully. I don't think you should speak like that, Carrie. I'm not coming back. I made the arrangement that, if I didn't like accountancy, Mr. Carter would return me half the money I paid for my articles, and I could chuck it at the end of the year. You shouldn't come to such a decision hastily. For ten months I've loathed it all. I've loathed the work, I've loathed the office, I loathed London. I'd rather sweep a crossing than spend my days here. Well, I must say, I don't think you're very fitted for accountancy. Good-bye, said Philip, holding out his hand. I want to thank you for your kindness to me. I'm sorry if I've been troublesome. I knew almost from the beginning I was no good. Well, if you really do make up your mind, it is good-bye. I don't know what you're going to do, but if you're in the neighborhood at any time, come in and see us. Philip gave a little laugh. I'm afraid it sounds very rude, but I hope from the bottom of my heart that I shall never set eyes on any of you again. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 The vicar of Blackstable would have nothing to do with the scheme which Philip laid before him. He had a great idea that one should stick to whatever one had begun. Like all weak men he laid an exaggerated stress on not changing one's mind. You chose to be an accountant of your own free will, he said. I just took that because it was the only chance I saw of getting up to town. I hate London, I hate the work, and nothing will induce me to go back to it. Mr. and Mrs. Carey were frankly shocked at Philip's idea of being an artist. He should not forget, they said, that his father and mother were gentlefolk, and painting wasn't a serious profession. It was bohemian, disreputable, immoral. And then Paris? So long as I have anything to say in the matter, I shall not allow you to live in Paris said the vicar firmly. It was a sink of iniquity. The scarlet woman and she of Babylon flaunted their vileness there. The cities of the plain were not more wicked. You've been brought up like a gentleman and Christian, and I should be false to the trust laid upon me by your dead father and mother if I allowed you to expose yourself to such temptation. Well, I know I'm not a Christian, and I'm beginning to doubt whether I'm a gentleman, said Philip. The dispute grew more violent. There was another year before Philip took possession of his small inheritance, and during that time Mr. Carey proposed only to give him an allowance if he remained at the office. It was clear to Philip that if he meant not to continue with accountancy he must leave it while he could still get back half the money that had been paid for his articles. The vicar would not listen. 
Philip, losing all reserve, said things to wound and irritate. "'You've got no right to waste my money,' he said at last. "'After all, it's my money, isn't it? I'm not a child. You can't prevent me from going to Paris if I make up my mind to. You can't force me to go back to London. All I can do is to refuse you money unless you do what I think fit. Well, I don't care. I've made up my mind to go to Paris. I shall sell my clothes and my books and my father's jewelry. Aunt Louisa sat by in silence, anxious and unhappy. She saw that Philip was beside himself, and anything she said then would but increase his anger. Finally the vicar announced that he wished to hear nothing more about it, and with dignity left the room. For the next two or three days neither Philip nor he spoke to one another. Philip wrote to Hayward for information about Paris, and made up his mind to set out as soon as he got a reply. Mrs. Carey turned the matter over in her head incessantly. She felt that Philip included her in the hatred he bore her husband, and the thought tortured her. She loved him with all her heart. At length she spoke to him. She listened attentively while he poured out all his disillusionment of London and his eager ambition for the future. I may be no good, but at least let me have a try. I can't be a worse failure than I was in that beastly office, and I feel that I can paint. I know I've got it in me. She was not so sure as her husband that they did right in thwarting so strong an inclination. She had read of great painters whose parents had opposed their wish to study. The event had shown with what folly, and after all it was just as possible for a painter to lead a virtuous life to the glory of God as for a chartered accountant. "'I'm so afraid of your going to Paris,' she said piteously. "'It wouldn't be so bad if you studied in London. If I'm going in for painting I must do it thoroughly, and it's only in Paris that you can get the real thing.' At his suggestion Mrs. Carey wrote to the solicitor, saying that Philip was discontented with his work in London, and asking what he thought of a change. Mr. Nixon answered as follows. Dear Mrs. Carey, I have seen Mr. Herbert Carter, and I am afraid I must tell you that Philip has not done so well as one could have wished. If he is very strongly set against the work, perhaps it is better that he should take the opportunity there is now to break his articles. I am naturally very disappointed, but as you know, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. Yours very sincerely, Albert Nixon. The letter was shown to the vicar but served only to increase his obstinacy. He was willing enough that Philip should take up some other profession. He suggested his father's calling, medicine, but nothing would induce him to pay an allowance if Philip went to Paris. It's a mere excuse for self-indulgence and sensuality, he said. I'm interested to hear you blame self-indulgence in others, retorted Philip acidly. But by this time an answer had come from Hayward giving the name of a hotel where Philip could get a room for thirty francs a month and enclosing a note of introduction to the monsieur of a school. Philip read the letter to Mrs. Carey and told her he proposed to start on the first of September. "'But you haven't got any money,' she said. "'I'm going into Turcanbury this afternoon to sell the jewelry.' He had inherited from his father a gold watch and chain, two or three rings, some links, and two pins. One of them was a pearl and might fetch a considerable sum. "'It's a very different thing what a thing's worth and what it'll fetch,' said Aunt Louisa. Philip smiled, for this was one of his uncle's stock phrases. "'I know, but at the worst I think I can get a hundred pounds on the lot, and that'll keep me till I'm twenty-one. Mrs. Carey did not answer, but she went upstairs, put on her little black bonnet, and went to the bank. In an hour she came back. She went to Philip, who was reading in the drawing-room, and handed him an envelope. "'What's this?' he asked. "'It's a little present for you,' she answered, smiling shyly. He opened it and found eleven five-pound notes and a little paper sack bulging with sovereigns. "'I couldn't bear to let you sell your father's jewelry. It's the money I had in the bank. It comes to very nearly a hundred pounds.' Philip blushed, and he knew not why. Tears suddenly filled his eyes. "'Oh, my dear, I can't take it,' he said. "'It's most awfully good of you, but I couldn't bear to take it.' When Mrs. Carey was married she had three hundred pounds, and this money, carefully watched, had been used by her to meet any unforeseen expense, any urgent charity, or to buy Christmas and birthday presents for her husband and for Philip. 
In the course of years it had diminished sadly, but it was still with the vicar a subject for jesting. He talked of his wife as a rich woman, and he constantly spoke of the nest egg. "'Oh, please take it, Philip. I'm so sorry I've been extravagant, and there's only that left but it'll make me so happy if you'll accept it. But you'll want it, said Philip. No, I don't think I shall. I was keeping it in case your uncle died before me. I thought it would be useful to have a little something I could get at immediately if I wanted it. But I don't think I shall live very much longer now. Oh, my dear, don't say that. Why, of course you're going to live forever. I can't possibly spare you. Oh, I'm not sorry. Her voice broke, and she hid her eyes, but in a moment, drying them, she smiled bravely. "'At first I used to pray to God that he might not take me first, because I didn't want your uncle to be left alone. I didn't want him to have all the suffering. But now I know that it wouldn't mean so much to your uncle as it would to me. He wants to live more than I do. I've never been the wife he wanted, and I dare say he'd marry again if anything happened to me. So I should like to go first. You don't think it's selfish of me, Philip, do you? But I couldn't bear it if he went. Philip kissed her wrinkled thin cheek. He did not know why the sight he had of that overwhelming love made him feel so strangely ashamed. It was incomprehensible that she should care so much for a man who was so indifferent, so selfish, so grossly self-indulgent, and he divined dimly that in her heart she knew his indifference and his selfishness, knew them, and loved him humbly all the same. "'You will take the money, Philip,' she said, gently stroking his hand. "'I know you can do without it, but it'll give me so much happiness. I've always wanted to do something for you. You see, I never had a child of my own, and I loved you as if you were my son. When you were a little boy, though I knew it was wicked, I used to wish almost that you might be ill, so that I could nurse you day and night. But you were only ill once, and then it was at school. I should so like to help you. It's the only chance I shall ever have. And perhaps some day, when you're a great artist, you won't forget me, but you'll remember that I gave you your start. It's very good of you, said Philip. I'm very grateful. A smile came into her tired eyes, a smile of pure happiness. Oh, I'm so glad. End of chapter 39. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapters 40 through 42 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 40. A few days later Mrs. Carey went to the station to see Philip off. She stood at the door of the carriage, trying to keep back her tears. Philip was restless and eager. He wanted to be gone. "'Kiss me once more,' she said. He leaned out of the window and kissed her. The train started and she stood on the wooden platform of the little station waving her handkerchief till it was out of sight. Her heart was dreadfully heavy and the few hundred yards to the vicarage seemed very, very long. It was natural enough that he should be eager to go, she thought. He was a boy and the future beckoned to him. But she, she clenched her teeth so that she should not cry. She uttered a little inward prayer that God would guard him and keep him out of temptation, and give him happiness and good fortune. But Philip ceased to think of her a moment after he had settled down in his carriage. He thought only of the future. He had written to Mrs. Otter, the monsieur to whom Hayward had given him an introduction, and had in his pocket an invitation to tea on the following day. When he arrived in Paris he had his luggage put on a cab and trundled off slowly through the gay streets, over the bridge, and along the narrow ways of the Latin Quarter. He had taken a room at the Hotel des Deux Echos, which was in a shabby street off the Boulevard du Montparsal. It was convenient for Armatrano's school at which he was going to work. A waiter took his box up five flights of stairs, 
and Philip was shown into a little room, fusty from unopened windows, the greater part of which was taken up by a large wooden bed with a canopy over it of red rep. There were heavy curtains on the windows of the same dingy material. The chest of drawers served also as a washing-stand, and there was a massive wardrobe of the style which is connected with the good King Louis Philippe. The wallpaper was discolored with age, it was dark gray, and there could be vaguely seen on it garlands of brown leaves. To Philip the room seemed quaint and charming. Though it was late he felt too excited to sleep, and, going out, made his way into the boulevard and walked towards the light. This led him to the station, and the square in front of it, vivid with arc lamps, noisy with the yellow trams that seemed to cross it in all directions, made him laugh aloud with joy. There were cafés all round, and by chance, thirsty and eager to get a nearer sight of the crowd, Philip installed himself at a little table outside the Café de Versailles. Every other table was taken, for it was a fine night, and Philip looked curiously at the people, here little family groups, there a knot of men with odd-shaped hats and beards, talking loudly and gesticulating. Next to him were two men who looked like painters with women who Philip hoped were not their lawful wives. Behind him he heard Americans loudly arguing on art. His soul was thrilled. He sat till very late, tired out but too happy to move, and when at last he went to bed he was wide awake. He listened to the manifold noise of Paris. Next day, about tea-time, he made his way to Lyon de Beaufort, and, in a new street that led out of the boulevard Raspail, found Mrs. Otter. She was an insignificant woman of thirty, with a provincial air and a deliberately ladylike manner. She introduced him to her mother. He discovered presently that she had been studying in Paris for three years, and later that she was separated from her husband. She had in her small drawing-room one or two portraits which she had painted, and to Philip's inexperience they seemed extremely accomplished. "'I wonder if I shall ever be able to paint as well as that,' he said to her. "'Oh, I expect so,' she replied, not without self-satisfaction. "'You can't expect to do everything all at once, of course.' She was very kind. She gave him the address of a shop where he could get a portfolio, drawing paper, and charcoal. I shall be going to Armatrano's about nine tomorrow, and if you'll be there then I'll see that you get a good place and all that sort of thing. She asked him what he wanted to do, and Philip felt that he should not let her see how vague he was about the whole matter. Well, first I want to learn to draw, he said. I'm so glad to hear you say that. People always want to do things in such a hurry. I never touched oils till I'd been here for two years, and look at the result. She gave a glance at the portrait of her mother, a sticky piece of painting that hung over the piano. And if I were you, I would be very careful about the people you get to know. I wouldn't mix myself up with any foreigners. I'm very careful myself. Philip thanked her for the suggestion, but it seemed to him odd. He did not know that he particularly wanted to be careful. We live just as we would if we were in England, said Mrs. Otter's mother, who till then had spoken little. When we came here we brought all our own furniture over. Philip looked round the room. It was filled with a massive suite, and at the window were the same sort of white lace curtains which Aunt Louisa put up at the vicarage in summer. The piano was draped in liberty silk, and so was the chimney piece. Mrs. Otter followed his wandering eye. In the evening, when we close the shutters, one might really feel one was in England. And we have our meals just as if we were at home, added her mother, a meat breakfast in the morning and dinner in the middle of the day. When he left Mrs. Otter, Philip went to buy drawing materials, and next morning at the stroke of nine, trying to seem self-assured, he presented himself at the school. Mrs. Otter was already there, and she came forward with a friendly smile. He had been anxious about the reception he would have as a nouveau, for he had read a good deal of the rough joking to which a newcomer was exposed at some of the studios. But Mrs. Otter had reassured him. "'Oh, there's nothing like that here,' she said. "'You see, about half our students are ladies, and they set a tone to the place.' The studio was large and bare, with gray walls 
on which were pinned the studies that had received prizes. A model was sitting in a chair with a loose wrap thrown over her, and about a dozen men and women were standing about, some talking and others still working on their sketch. It was the first rest of the model. "'You'd better not try anything too difficult at first, said Mrs. Otter. "'Put your easel here. You'll find that's the easiest pose.' Philip placed an easel where she indicated, and Mrs. Otter introduced him to a young woman who sat next to him. "'Mr. Carey, Miss Price. Mr. Carey's never studied before. You won't mind helping him a little just at first, will you?' Then she turned to the model. "'Le Pau. The model threw aside the paper she had been reading, La Petite Republique, and sulkily throwing off her gown, got onto the stand. She stood squarely on both feet with her hands clasped behind her head. "'It's a stupid pose,' said Miss Price. "'I can't imagine why they chose it.' When Philip entered, the people in the studio had looked at him curiously, and the model gave him an indifferent glance. But now they ceased to pay attention to him. Philip, with his beautiful sheet of paper in front of him, stared awkwardly at the model. He did not know how to begin. He had never seen a naked woman before. She was not young, and her breasts were shriveled. She had colorless, fair hair that fell over her forehead untidily, and her face was covered with large freckles. He glanced at Miss Price's work. She had only been working on it two days, and it looked as though she had had trouble. Her paper was in a mess from constant rubbing out, and to Philip's eyes the figure looked strangely distorted. I should have thought I could do as well as that, he said to himself. He began on the head, thinking that he would work slowly downwards, but he could not understand why he found it infinitely more difficult to draw a head from the model than to draw one from his imagination. He got into difficulties. He glanced at Miss Price. She was working with vehement gravity. Her brow was wrinkled with eagerness, and there was an anxious look in her eyes. It was hot in the studio, and drops of sweat stood on her forehead. She was a girl of twenty-six, with a great deal of dull gold hair. It was handsome hair, but it was carelessly done, dragged back from her forehead, and tied in a hurried knot. She had a large face, with broad flat features and small eyes. Her skin was pasty, with a singular unhealthiness of tone, and there was no color in the cheeks. She had an unwashed air, and you could not help wondering if she slept in her clothes. She was serious and silent. When the next pause came, she stepped back to look at her work. "'I don't know why I'm having so much bother,' she said, "'but I mean to get it right.' She turned to Philip. "'How are you getting on?' "'Not at all,' he answered with a rueful smile. She looked at what he had done. "'You can't expect to do anything that way. You must take measurements, and you must square out your paper.' She showed him rapidly how to set about the business. Philip was impressed by her earnestness, but repelled by her want of charm. He was grateful for the hint she gave him, and set to work again. Meanwhile other people had come in, mostly men, for the women always arrived first, and the studio for the time of year, it was early yet, was fairly full. Presently there came in a young man with thin black hair, an enormous nose, and a face so long that it reminded you of a horse. He sat down next to Philip and nodded across him to Miss Price. "'You're very late,' she said. "'Are you only just up? It was such a splendid day I thought I'd lie in bed and think how beautiful it was out.' Philip smiled, but Miss Price took the remark seriously. "'That seems a funny thing to do. I should have thought it would be more to the point to get up and enjoy it. The way of the humorous is very hard, said the young man gravely. He did not seem inclined to work. He looked at his canvas, he was working in color, and had sketched in the day before the model who was posing. He turned to Philip. Have you just come out from England? Yes. How did you find your way to Armatrano's? It was the only school I knew of. I hope you haven't come with the idea that you will learn anything here which will be of the smallest use to you. It's the best school in Paris, said Miss Price. It's the only one where they take art seriously. Should art be taken seriously? the young man asked, and since Miss Price replied only with a scornful shrug, he added, But the point is, 
all schools are bad. They are academical, obviously. Why this is less injurious than most is that the teaching is more incompetent than elsewhere, because you learn nothing. But why'd you come here, then? interrupted Philip. I see the better course, but do not follow it. Miss Price, who is cultured, will remember the Latin of that. I wish you would leave me out of your conversation, Mr. Clutton, said Miss Price brusquely. The only way to learn to paint, he went on imperturbable, is to take a studio, hire a model, and just fight it out for yourself. That seems a simple thing to do, said Philip. It only needs money, replied Clutton. He began to paint, and Philip looked at him from the corner of his eye. He was long and desperately thin, his huge bones seemed to protrude from his body, his elbows were so sharp that they appeared to jut out through the arms of his shabby coat, his trousers were frayed at the bottom, and on each of his boots was a clumsy patch. Miss Price got up and went over to Philip's easel. "'If Mr. Clutton will hold his tongue for a moment, I'll just help you a little,' she said. "'Miss Price dislikes me because I have humor,' said Clutton looking meditatively at his canvas, but she detests me because I have genius. He spoke with solemnity, and his colossal misshapen nose made what he said very quaint. Philip was obliged to laugh, but Miss Price grew darkly red with anger. You're the only person who has ever accused you of genius. Also, I am the only person whose opinion is of the least value to me. Miss Price began to criticize what Philip had done. She talked glibly of anatomy and construction, planes and lines, and of much else which Philip did not understand. She had been at the studio a long time and knew the main points which the masters insisted upon, but though she could show what was wrong with Philip's work, she could not tell him how to put it right. "'It's awfully kind of you to take so much trouble with me,' said Philip. "'Oh, it's nothing,' she answered, flushing awkwardly. People did the same for me when I first came. I'll do it for anyone. Miss Price wants to indicate that she is giving you the advantage of her knowledge from a sense of duty rather than on account of any charms of your person, said Clutton. Miss Price gave him a furious look and went back to her own drawing. The clock struck twelve, and the model, with a cry of relief, stepped down from the stand. Miss Price gathered up her things. Some of us go to Gravier's for lunch, she said to Philip, with a look at Clutton. I always go home myself. I'll take you to Gravier's if you like, said Clutton. Philip thanked him and made ready to go. On his way out Mrs. Otter asked him how he had been getting on. Did Fanny Price help you? she asked. I put you there because I know she can do it if she likes. She's a disagreeable, ill-natured girl, and she can't draw herself at all but she knows the ropes and she can be useful to a newcomer if she cares to take the trouble. On the way down the street Clutton said to him, "'You've made an impression on Fanny Price. You'd better look out.' Philip laughed. He had never seen anyone on whom he wished less to make an impression. They came to the cheap little restaurant at which several of the students ate, and Clutton sat down at a table at which three or four men were already seated. For a franc they got an egg, a plate of meat, cheese, and a small bottle of wine. Coffee was extra. They sat on the pavement and yellow trams passed up and down the boulevard with a ceaseless ringing of bells. "'By the way, what's your name?' said Clutton, as they took their seats. "'Carrie. "'Allow me to introduce an old and trusted friend, Carrie by name,' said Clutton gravely. "'Mr. Flanagan? Mr. Lawson.' They laughed and went on with their conversation. They talked of a thousand things, and they all talked at once. No one paid the smallest attention to anyone else. They talked of the places they had been in the summer, of studios, of the various schools. They mentioned names which were unfamiliar to Philip. Monet, Manet, Renoir, Pizarro, Degas. Philip listened with all his ears, and though he felt a little out of it, his heart leaped with exultation. The time flew. When Clutton got up he said, I expect you'll find me here this evening if you care to come. You'll find this is about the best place for getting dyspepsia at the lowest cost in the quarter. End of chapter 40 Chapter 41 Philip 
walked down the boulevard de Montpersol. It was not at all like the Paris he had seen in the spring during his visit to do the accounts of the Hotel St. Georges. He thought already of that part of his life with a shudder, but it reminded him of what he thought a provincial town must be. There was an easy-going air about it and a sunny spaciousness which invited the mind to daydreaming. The trimness of the trees, the vivid whiteness of the houses, the breadth were very agreeable, and he felt himself already thoroughly at home. He sauntered along, staring at the people. There seemed an elegance about the most ordinary, workmen with their broad red sashes and their wide trousers, little soldiers in dingy, charming uniforms. He came presently to the Avenue de l'Observatoire, and he gave a sigh of pleasure at the magnificent yet so graceful vista. He came to the gardens of the Luxembourg. Children were playing, nurses with long ribbons walked slowly two by two, busy men passed through with satchels under their arms, youths strangely dressed. The scene was formal and dainty, nature was arranged and ordered, but so exquisitely that nature unordered and unarranged seemed barbaric. Philip was enchanted. It excited him to stand on that spot of which he had read so much. It was classic ground to him, and he felt the awe and the delight which some old don might feel when for the first time he looked on the smiling plain of Sparta. As he wandered he chanced to see Miss Price sitting by herself on a bench. He hesitated, for he did not at that moment want to see anyone, and her uncouth way seemed out of place amid the happiness he felt around him but he had divined her sensitiveness to a front, and since she had seen him thought it would be polite to speak to her. "'What are you doing here?' she said as he came up. "'Enjoying myself, aren't you?' "'Oh, I come here every day from four to five. I don't think one does any good if one works straight through. May I sit down for a minute?' he said. "'If you want to.' "'That doesn't sound very cordial,' he laughed. "'I'm not much of a one for saying pretty things.' Philip a little disconcerted, was silent as he lit a cigarette. "'Did Clutton say anything about my work?' she asked suddenly. "'No, I don't think he did,' said Philip. "'He's no good, you know. He thinks he's a genius, but he isn't. He's too lazy for one thing. Genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains. The only thing is to peg away. If one only makes up one's mind badly enough to do a thing, one can't help doing it. She spoke with a passionate strenuousness which was rather striking. She wore a sailor hat of black straw, a white blouse which was not quite clean, and a brown skirt. She had no gloves on and her hands wanted washing. She was so unattractive that Philip wished he had not begun to talk to her. He could not make out whether she wanted him to stay or go. "'I'll do anything I can for you,' she said all at once, without reference to anything that had gone before. I know how hard it is. Thank you very much, said Philip. Then, in a moment, won't you come and have tea with me somewhere? She looked at him quickly and flushed. When she reddened, her pasty skin acquired a curiously mottled look, like strawberries and cream that had gone bad. No, thanks. What do you think I want tea for? I've only just had lunch. I thought it would pass the time, said Philip. If you find it long, you needn't bother about me, you know. I don't mind being left alone." At that moment two men passed in brown velveteens, enormous trousers, and basque caps. They were young, but both wore beards. "'I say, are those art students?' said Philip. "'They might have stepped out of the Vie de Baume. "'They're Americans,' said Miss Price scornfully. "'Frenchmen haven't worn things like that for thirty years, but the Americans from the far west buy those clothes and have themselves photographed the day after they arrive in Paris. That's about as near as art as they ever get. But it doesn't matter to them. They've all got money. Philip liked the daring picturesqueness of the American's costume. He thought it showed the romantic spirit. Miss Price asked him the time. "'I must be getting along to the studio,' she said. "'Are you going to the sketch classes?' Philip did not know anything about them and she told him that from five to six every evening a model sat from whom anyone who liked could go and draw at the cost of fifty centimes. They had a different model every day, and it was very good practice. "'I don't suppose you're good enough yet for that. You'd better wait a bit.' 
I don't see why I shouldn't try. I haven't got anything else to do. They got up and walked to the studio. Philip could not tell from her manner whether Miss Price wished him to walk with her or preferred to walk alone. He remained from sheer embarrassment, not knowing how to leave her. But she would not talk. She answered his questions in an ungracious manner. A man was standing at the studio door with a large dish into which each person, as he went in, dropped his half-franc. The studio was much fuller than it had been in the morning, and there was not the preponderance of English and Americans, nor were women there in so large a proportion. Philip felt the assemblage was more the sort of thing he had expected. It was very warm and the air quickly grew fetid. It was an old man who sat this time with a vast gray beard and Philip tried to put into practice the little he had learned in the morning. But he made a poor job of it. He realized that he could not draw nearly as well as he thought. He glanced enviously at one or two sketches of men who sat near him, and wondered whether he would ever be able to use the charcoal with that mastery. The hour passed quickly. Not wishing to press himself upon Miss Price, he sat down at some distance from her, and at the end, as he passed her on his way out, she asked him brusquely how he had got on. Not very well, he smiled. If you'd condescended to come and sit near me, I could have given you some hints. I suppose you thought yourself too grand. No, it wasn't that. I was afraid you'd think me a nuisance. When I do that, I'll tell you sharp enough. Philip saw that in her uncouth way she was offering him help. Well, tomorrow I'll just force myself upon you. I don't mind she answered. Philip went out and wondered what he should do with himself till dinner. He was eager to do something characteristic. Absinthe, of course, it was indicated, and so, sauntering towards the station, he seated himself outside a café and ordered it. He drank with nausea and satisfaction. He found the taste disgusting, but the moral effect magnificent. He felt every inch an art student and since he drank on an empty stomach his spirits presently grew very high. He watched the crowds and felt all men were his brothers. He was happy. When he reached Gravier's, the table at which Clutton sat was full, but as soon as he saw Philip limping along he called out to him. They made room. The dinner was frugal, a plate of soup, a dish of meat, fruit, cheese, and half a bottle of wine. But Philip paid no attention to what he ate. He took note of the men at the table. Flanagan was there again. He was an American, a short, snub-nosed youth with a jolly face and a laughing mouth. He wore a Norfolk jacket of bold pattern, a blue stock round his neck, and a tweed cap of fantastic shape. At that time Impressionism reigned in the Latin Quarter, but its victory over the older schools was still recent, and Carolus Duran, Bougro, and their like were set up against Manet, Monet, and Degas. To appreciate these was still a sign of grace. Whistler was an influence strong with the English and his compatriots, and the discerning collected Japanese prints. The old masters were tested by new standards. The esteem in which Raphael had been for centuries held was a matter of derision to wise young men. They offered to give all his works for Velasquez, head of Philip the Fourth, in the National Gallery. Philip found that a discussion on art was raging. Lawson, whom he had met at luncheon, sat opposite to him. He was a thin youth with a freckled face and red hair. He had very bright green eyes. As Philip sat down he fixed them on him and remarked suddenly. Raphael was only tolerable when he painted other people's pictures. When he painted Perugino's or Pentorichio's he was charming. When he painted Raphael's he was, with a scornful shrug, Raphael. Lawson spoke so aggressively that Philip was taken aback, but he was not obliged to answer because Flanagan broke in impatiently. Oh, to hell with art, he cried. Let's get Jinny. You were Jinny last night, Flanagan, said Lawson. Nothing to what I mean to be tonight, he answered. Fancy being in Paris and thinking of nothing but art all the time. He spoke with a broad western accent. My, it is good to be alive. He gathered himself together and then banged his fist on the table. To hell with art, I say. 
"'You not only say it, but you say it with tiresome iteration,' said Clutton severely. There was another American at the table. He was dressed like those fine fellows whom Philip had seen that afternoon in the Luxembourg. He had a handsome face, thin, ascetic, with dark eyes. He wore his fantastic garb with the dashing air of a buccaneer. He had a vast quantity of dark hair which fell constantly over his eyes, and his most frequent gesture was to throw back his head dramatically to get some long wisp out of the way. He began to talk of the Olympia by Manet, which then hung in the Luxembourg. I stood in front of it for an hour today, and I tell you, it's not a good picture. Lawson put down his knife and fork. His green eyes flashed fire, he gasped with rage, but he could be seen imposing calm upon himself. It's very interesting to hear the mind of the untutored savage, he said. Will you tell us why it isn't a good picture? Before the American could answer, someone else broke in vehemently. Do you mean to say you can look at the painting of that flesh and say it's not good? I don't say that. I think the right breast is very well painted. The right breast be damned, shouted Lawson. The whole thing's a miracle of painting. He began to describe in detail the beauties of the picture, but at this table at Gravier's they who spoke at length spoke for their own edification. No one listened to him. The American interrupted angrily. You don't mean to say you think the head's good. Lawson, white with passion now, began to defend the head, but Clutton, who had been sitting in silence with a look on his face of good-humored scorn, broke in. Give him the head. We don't want the head. It doesn't affect the picture. All right, I'll give you the head, cried Lawson. Take the head and be damned to you. What about the black line? cried the American, triumphantly pushing back a wisp of hair which nearly fell in his soup. You don't see a black line round objects in nature. Oh, God, send down fire from heaven to consume the blasphemer, said Lawson. What has nature got to do with it? No one knows what's in nature and what isn't. The world sees nature through the eyes of the artist. Why, for centuries it saw horses jumping a fence with all their legs extended, and by heaven, sir, they were extended. It saw shadows black until Monet discovered they were colored, and by heaven, sir, they were black. If we choose to surround objects with a black line, the world will see the black line, and there will be a black line. And if we paint grass red and cows blue, it'll see them red and blue, and by heaven they will be red and blue. To hell with art, murmured Flanagan. I want to get Jenny. Lawson took no notice of the interruption. Now look here. When Olympia was shown at the Salon, Zola, amid the jeers of the Philistines and the hisses of the pompiers, the academicians, and the public, Zola said, I look forward to the day when Manet's picture will hang in the Louvre opposite the odalisk of Angra, and it will not be the odalisk which will gain by comparison. It'll be there. Every day I see the time grow nearer. In ten years the Olympia will be in the Louvre. Never, shouted the American, using both hands now with a sudden desperate attempt to get his hair once for all out of the way. In ten years that picture will be dead. It's only a fashion of the moment. No picture can live that hasn't got something which that picture misses by a million miles. And what is that? Great art can't exist without a moral element. Oh, God, cried Lawson furiously. I knew it was that. He wants morality. He joined his hands and held them towards heaven in supplication. Oh, Christopher Columbus, Christopher Columbus, what did you do when you discovered America? Ruskin says, but before he could add another word, Clutton rapped with the handle of his knife imperiously on the table. Gentlemen, he said in a stern voice, and his huge nose positively wrinkled with passion, a name has been mentioned which I never thought to hear again in decent society. Freedom of speech is all very well, but we must observe the limits of common propriety. You may talk of Bougro, if you will. There is a cheerful disgustingness in the sound which excites laughter, but let us not sully our chaste lips with the names of J. Ruskin, G. F. Watts, or E. B. Jones. Who was Ruskin, anyway? asked Flanagan. He was one of the great Victorians. He was a master of English style. Ruskin style, a thing of shreds and purple patches, said Lawson. 
Besides, damn the great Victorians. Whenever I open a paper and see death of a great Victorian, I thank heaven there's one more of them gone. Their only talent was longevity, and no artist should be allowed to live after he's forty. By then a man has done his best work. All he does after that is repetition. Don't you think it was the greatest luck in the world for them that Keats, Shelley, Bonington, and Byron died early? What a genius we should think Swinburne if he had perished on the day the first series of poems and ballads were published. The suggestion pleased, for no one at the table was more than twenty-four, and they threw themselves upon it with gusto. They were unanimous for once. They elaborated. Someone proposed a vast bonfire made out of the work of the forty academicians into which the great Victorians might be hurled on their fortieth birthday. The idea was received with acclamation. Carlyle and Ruskin, Tennyson, Browning, G. F. Watts, E. B. Jones, Dickens, Thackeray, they were hurried into the flames. Mr. Gladstone, John Bright, and Cobden. There was a moment's discussion about George Meredith, but Matthew Arnold and Emerson were given up cheerfully. At last came Walter Pater. Not Walter Pater, murmured Philip. Lawson stared at him for a moment with his green eyes and then nodded. You're quite right. Walter Pater is the only justification for Mona Lisa. Do you know Cronshaw? He used to know Pater. Who's Cronshaw? asked Philip. Cronshaw's a poet. He lives here. Let's go to the Lila. La Closière de Lila was a café to which they often went in the evening after dinner, and here Cronshaw was invariably to be found between the hours of nine at night and two in the morning. But Flanagan had had enough of intellectual conversation for one evening, and when Lawson made his suggestion, turned to Philip. "'Oh, gee, let's go where there are girls,' he said. "'Come to the gate Montpersal and we'll get Ginny.' "'I'd rather go and see Cronshaw and keep sober,' laughed Philip. End of chapter 41 Chapter 42 There was a general disturbance. Flanagan and two or three more went on to the music hall, while Philip walked slowly with Clutton and Lawson to the Closerie de Lila. "'You must go to the Gate Montpassant, said Lawson to him. "'It's one of the loveliest things in Paris. I'm going to paint it one of these days.' Philip, influenced by Hayward, looked upon music halls with scornful eyes, but he had reached Paris at a time when their artistic possibilities were just discovered. The peculiarities of lighting, the masses of dingy red and tarnished gold, the heaviness of the shadows and the decorative lines, offered a new theme, and half the studios in the quarter contained sketches made in one or other of the local theatres. Men of letters, following in the painter's wake, conspired suddenly to find artistic value in the turns, and red-nosed comedians were lauded to the skies for their sense of character. Fat, female singers who had bawled obscurely for twenty years were discovered to possess inimitable drollery. There were those who found an aesthetic delight in performing dogs, while others exhausted their vocabulary to extol the distinction of conjurers and trick cyclists. The crowd, too, under another influence, was become an object of sympathetic interest. With Hayward Philip had disdained humanity in the mass he adopted the attitude of one who wraps himself in solitariness and watches with disgust the antics of the vulgar. But Clutton and Lawson talked of the multitude with enthusiasm. They described the seething throng that filled the various fairs of Paris, the sea of faces half seen in the glare of acetylene, half hidden in the darkness, and the blare of trumpets, the hooting of whistles, the hum of voices. What they said was new and strange to Philip. They told him about Cronshaw. "'Have you ever read any of his work?' "'No,' said Philip. "'It came out in the Yellow Book.' They looked upon him, as painters often do writers, with contempt because he was a layman, with tolerance because he practiced an art, and awe because he used a medium in which themselves felt ill at ease. "'He's an extraordinary fellow. You'll find him a bit disappointing at first, he only comes out at his best when he's drunk. And the nuisance is, added Clutton, that it takes him a devil of a time to get drunk. When they arrived at the café, Lawson told Philip 
that they would have to go in. There was hardly a bite in the autumn air, but Cronshaw had a morbid fear of draughts, and, even in the warmest weather, sat inside. He knows everyone worth knowing, Lawson explained. He knew Pater and Oscar Wilde, and he knows Marlamé and all those fellows. The object of their search sat in the most sheltered corner of the café, with his coat on and the collar turned up. He wore his hat pressed well down on his forehead so that he should avoid cold air. He was a big man, stout but not obese, with a round face, a small moustache, and little, rather stupid eyes. His head did not seem quite big enough for his body. It looked like a pea uneasily poised on an egg. He was playing dominoes with a Frenchman and greeted the newcomers with a quiet smile. He did not speak, but, as if to make room for them, pushed away the little pile of saucers on the table, which indicated the number of drinks he had already consumed. He nodded to Philip when he was introduced to him, and went on with the game. Philip's knowledge of the language was small, but he knew enough to tell that Cronshaw, although he had lived in Paris for several years, spoke French execrably. At last he leaned back with a smile of triumph. Je vais et battu, he said with an abominable accent. Gracon. He called the waiter and turned to Philip. Just out from England, see any cricket? Philip was a little confused at the unexpected question. Cronshaw knows the averages of every first-class cricketer for the last twenty years, said Lawson, smiling. The Frenchman left them for friends at another table, and Cronshaw, with a lazy enunciation which was one of his peculiarities, began to discourse on the relative merits of Kent and Lancashire. He told them of the last test match he had seen, and described the course of the game, wicket by wicket. "'That's the only thing I miss in Paris,' he said, as he finished the bock which the waiter had brought. "'You don't get any cricket.' Philip was disappointed, and Lawson, pardonably anxious to show off one of the celebrities of the quarter, grew impatient. Cronshaw was taking his time to wake up that evening, though the saucers at his side indicated that he had at least made an honest attempt to get drunk. Clutton watched the scene with amusement. He fancied there was something of affectation in Cronshaw's minute knowledge of cricket. He liked to tantalize people by talking to them of things that obviously bored them. Clutton threw in a question. "'Have you seen Marlamé lately?' Cronshaw looked at him slowly, as if he were turning the inquiry over in his mind, and before he answered, rapped on the marble table with one of the saucers. "'Bring my bottle of whiskey," he called out. He turned again to Philip. "'I keep my own bottle of whiskey. I can't afford to pay fifty centimes for every thimbleful.' The waiter brought the bottle, and Cronshaw held it up to the light. "'They've been drinking it. Waiter, who's been helping himself to my whiskey?' "'Mais personne, Monsieur Cronshaw. I made a mark on it last night, and look at it. Monsieur made a mark, but he kept on drinking after that. At that rate Monsieur wastes his time in making marks. The waiter was a jovial fellow, and knew Cronshaw intimately. Cronshaw gazed at him. "'If you give me your word of honor as a nobleman and a gentleman that nobody but I has been drinking my whiskey, I'll accept your statement.' This remark, translated literally into the crudest French, sounded very funny and the lady at the compotere could not help laughing. "'Il est impayable, she murmured. Cronshaw, hearing her, turned a sheepish eye upon her. She was stout, matronly, and middle-aged, and solemnly kissed his hand to her. She shrugged her shoulders. "'Fear not, madam,' he said heavily. "'I have passed the age when I am tempted by forty-five and gratitude.' He poured himself out some whiskey and water, and slowly drank it. He wiped his mouth, at the back of his hand. He talked very well. Lawson and Clutton knew that Cronshaw's remark was an answer to the question about Marla May. Cronshaw often went to the gatherings on Tuesday evenings when the poet received men of letters and painters and discoursed with subtle oratory on any subject that was suggested to him. Cronshaw had evidently been there lately. He talked very well, but he talked nonsense. He talked about art as though it were the most important thing in the world. "'If it isn't, what are we here for?' asked Philip. "'What you're here for, I don't know. It is no business of mine. But art is a luxury. 
men attach importance only to self-preservation and the propagation of their species. It is only when these instincts are satisfied that they consent to occupy themselves with the entertainment which is provided for them by writers, painters, and poets. Cronshaw stopped for a moment to drink. He had pondered for twenty years the problem whether he loved liquor because it made him talk, or whether he loved conversation because it made him thirsty. Then he said, I wrote a poem yesterday. Without being asked, he began to recite it very slowly, marking the rhythm with an extended forefinger. It was possibly a very fine poem, but at that moment a young woman came in. She had scarlet lips, and it was plain that the vivid color of her cheeks was not due to the vulgarity of nature. She had blackened her eyelashes and eyebrows, and painted both eyelids a bold blue, which was continued to a triangle at the corner of the eyes. It was fantastic and amusing. Her dark hair was done over her ears in the fashion made popular by Mademoiselle Claude de Merode. Philip's eyes wandered to her, and Cronshaw, having finished the recitation of his verses, smiled upon him indulgently. "'You are not listening,' he said. "'Oh, yes, I was. I do not blame you, for you have given an apt illustration of the statement I just made. What is art beside love? I respect and applaud your indifference to fine poetry when you can contemplate the meretricious charms of this young person. She passed by the table at which they were sitting, and he took her arm. Come and sit by my side, dear child, and let us play the divine comedy of love. Fiche moi la paix, she said, and pushing him on one side, continued her perambulation. Art, he continued, with a wave of the hand, is merely the refuge which the ingenious have invented when they were supplied with food and women, to escape the tediousness of life. Cronshaw filled his glass again, and began to talk at length. He spoke with rotund delivery. He chose his words carefully. He mingled wisdom and nonsense in the most astounding manner, gravely making fun of his hearers at one moment, and at the next playfully giving them sound advice. He talked of art and literature and life. He was by turns devout and obscene, merry and lachrymose he grew remarkably drunk and then he began to recite poetry his own and milton's his own and shelley's his own and kit marlowe's at last lawson exhausted got up to go home i shall go too said philip clutton the most silent of them all remained behind listening with a sardonic smile on his lips to cronshaw's maunderings lawson accompanied philip to his hotel and then bade him good night. But when Philip got to bed he could not sleep. All these new ideas that had been flung before him carelessly seethed in his brain. He was tremendously excited. He felt in himself great powers. He had never before been so self-confident. I know I shall be a great artist, he said to himself. I can feel it in me. A thrill passed through him as another thought came, but even to himself he would not put it into words. By George, I believe I've got genius. He was, in fact, very drunk. But as he had not taken more than one glass of beer, it could have been due only to a more dangerous intoxicant than alcohol. End of chapter 42. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com. Chapters 43 through 45 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 43. On Tuesdays and Fridays, masters spent the morning at Amitrano's criticizing the work done. In France, the painter earns little unless he paints portraits and is patronized by rich Americans, and men of reputation are glad to increase their incomes by spending two or three hours once a week at one of the numerous studios where art is taught. Tuesday was the day upon which Michel Roland came to Amitrano's. He was an elderly man with a white beard and a florid complexion who had painted a number of decorations for the state. 
but these were an object of derision to the students he instructed. He was a disciple of Ingres, impervious to the progress of art, and angrily impatient with that tarifacer whose names were Manet, Degas, Monet, and Sisley. But he was an excellent teacher, helpful, polite, and encouraging. Foinet, on the other hand, who visited the studio on Fridays, was a difficult man to get on with. He was a small, shriveled person with bad teeth and a bilious air, an untidy gray beard, and savage eyes. His voice was high and his tone sarcastic. He had pictures bought by the Luxembourg, and at twenty-five looked forward to a great career. But his talent was due to youth rather than to personality, and for twenty years he had done nothing but repeat the landscape which had brought him his early success. When he was reproached with monotony, he answered, Corot only painted one thing, why should I? He was envious of everyone else's success and had a peculiar personal loathing of the Impressionist, for he looked upon his own failure as due to the mad fashion which had attracted the public sebete to their works. The genial disdain of Michel Rollin, who called them impostors, was answered by him with vituperation, of which Crapule and Cunet were the least violent items. He amused himself with abuse of their private lives, and with sardonic humor with blasphemous and obscene detail, attacked the legitimacy of their births and the purity of their conjugal relations. He used an oriental imagery and an oriental emphasis to accentuate his ribald scorn nor did he conceal his contempt for the students whose work he examined. By them he was hated and feared. The women by his brutal sarcasm he reduced often to tears, which again aroused his ridicule, and he remained at the studio, notwithstanding the protests of those who suffered too bitterly from his attacks, because there could be no doubt that he was one of the best masters in Paris." Sometimes the old model who kept the school ventured to remonstrate with him, but his expostulations quickly gave way before the violent insolence of the painter to abject apologies. It was Foinet with whom Philip first came in contact. He was already in the studio when Philip arrived. He went round from easel to easel with Mrs. Otter the Monsieur by his side to interpret his remarks for the benefit of those who could not understand French. Fanny Price, sitting next to Philip, was working feverishly. Her face was sallow with nervousness, and every now and then she stopped to wipe her hands on her blouse, for they were hot with anxiety. Suddenly she turned to Philip with an anxious look which she tried to hide by a sullen frown. "'Do you think it's good?' she asked, nodding at her drawing. Philip got up and looked at it. He was astounded. He felt she must have no eye at all. The thing was hopelessly out of drawing. I wish I could draw half as well myself, he answered. You can't expect to, you've only just come. It's a bit too much to expect that you should draw as well as I do. I've been here two years. Fanny Price puzzled Philip. Her conceit was stupendous. Philip had already discovered that everyone in the studio cordially disliked her, and it was no wonder, for she seemed to go out of her way to wound people. I complained to Mrs. Otter about Foinet, she said now. The last two weeks he hasn't looked at my drawings. He spends about half an hour on Mrs. Otter because she's the monsieur. After all, I pay as much as anybody else, and I suppose my money's as good as theirs. I don't see why I shouldn't get as much attention as anybody else. She took up her charcoal again, but in a moment put it down with a groan. I can't do any more now. I'm so frightfully nervous. She looked at Foinet, who was coming towards them with Mrs. Otter. Mrs. Otter, meek, mediocre, and self-satisfied, wore an air of importance. Foinet sat down at the easel of an untidy little Englishwoman called Beth Chalice. She had the fine black eyes, languid but passionate, the thin face, ascetic but sensual, the skin like old ivory, which under the influence of Burne Jones were cultivated at that time by young ladies in Chelsea. Foinet seemed in a pleasant mood. He did not say much to her, but with quick determined stroke of her charcoal pointed out her errors. Miss Chalice beamed with pleasure when he rose. He came to Clutton, and by this time Philip was nervous too, but Mrs. Otter had promised to make things easy for him. 
Quanet stood for a moment in front of Clutton's work, biting his thumb silently, then absent-mindedly spat out upon the canvas the little piece of skin which he had bitten off. "'That's a fine line,' he said at last, indicating with his thumb what pleased him. "'You're beginning to learn to draw.' Clutton did not answer, but looked at the master with his usual air of sardonic indifference to the world's opinion. "'I'm beginning to think you have at least a trace of talent.' Mrs. Otter, who did not like Clutton, pursed her lips. She did not see anything out of the way in his work. Foinet sat down and went into technical details. Mrs. Otter grew rather tired of standing. Clutton did not say anything, but nodded now and then, and Foinet felt with satisfaction that he grasped what he said and the reasons of it. Most of them listened to him, but it was clear they never understood. Then Foinet got up and came to Philip. He only arrived two days ago, Mrs. Otter hurried to explain. He's a beginner. He's never studied before. Que c'est moi, the master said. One sees that. He passed on, and Mrs. Otter murmured to him, This is the young lady I told you about. He looked at her as though she were some repulsive animal, and his voice grew more rasping. It appears that you do not think I pay enough attention to you. You have been complaining to the monsieur. Well, show me this work to which you wish me to give attention. Fanny Price colored. The blood under her unhealthy skin seemed to be of a strange purple. Without answering she pointed to the drawing on which she had been at work since the beginning of the week. Foinet sat down. Well, what do you wish me to say to you? Do you wish me to tell you it is good? It isn't. Do you wish me to tell you it is well drawn? It isn't. Do you wish me to say it has merit? It hasn't. Do you wish me to show you what is wrong with it? It is all wrong. Do you wish me to tell you what to do with it? Tear it up. Are you satisfied now? Miss Price became very white. She was furious because he had said all this before Mrs. Otter. Though she had been in France so long and could understand French well enough, she could hardly speak two words. He's got no right to treat me like that. My money's as good as anyone else's. I pay him to teach me. That's not teaching me. What does she say? What does she say? asked Foinet. Mrs. Otter hesitated to translate, and Miss Price repeated in execrable French. Je vais pay how ma poix. His eyes flashed with rage. He raised his voice and shook his fist. Mais, nom de Dieu, I can't teach you. I could more easily teach a camel. He turned to Mrs. Otter. Ask her, does she do this for amusement, or does she expect to earn money by it? I'm going to learn my living as an artist, Miss Price answered. Then it is my duty to tell you that you are wasting your time. It would not matter that you have no talent. Talent does not run about the streets in these days, but you have not the beginning of an aptitude. How long have you been here? A child of five after two lessons would draw better than you do. I only say one thing to you. Give up this hopeless attempt. You're more likely to earn your living as a Bernet to fair than as a painter. Look, he seized the piece of charcoal, and it broke as he applied it to the paper. He cursed, and with a stump drew great firm lines. He drew rapidly and spoke at the same time, spitting out the words with venom. Look, those arms are not the same length. That knee, it's grotesque. I tell you, a child of five. You see, she's not standing on her legs. That foot! With each word the angry pencil made a mark, and in a moment the drawing upon which Fanny Price had spent so much time and eager trouble was unrecognizable, a confusion of lines and smudges. At last he flung down the charcoal and stood up. "'Take my advice, mademoiselle. Try dressmaking.' He looked at his watch. "'It's twelve. À la semaine. Prochaine, messieurs.' Miss Price gathered up her things slowly. Philip waited behind after the others to say to her something consolatory. He could think of nothing but, I say, I'm awfully sorry. What a beast that man is. She turned on him savagely. Is that what you're waiting about for? When I want your sympathy I'll ask for it. Please get out of my way. She walked past him out of the studio, and Philip, with a shrug of the shoulders, limped along to Gravier's for luncheon. It served her right said Lawson, when Philip told him what had happened. Ill-tempered slut. Lawson was very sensitive to criticism, and in order to avoid it 
never went to the studio when Foinet was coming. "'I don't want other people's opinion of my work,' he said. "'I know myself if it's good or bad.' "'You mean you don't want other people's bad opinion of your work,' answered Clutton dryly. In the afternoon Philip thought he would go to the Luxembourg to see the pictures, and walking through the garden he saw Fanny Price sitting in her accustomed seat. He was sore at the rudeness with which she had met his well-meant attempt to say something pleasant, and passed as though he had not caught sight of her. But she got up at once and came towards him. "'Are you trying to cut me?' she said. "'No, of course not. I thought perhaps you didn't want to be spoken to. Where are you going?' "'I wanted to have a look at the Manet. I've heard so much about it. Would you like me to come with you? I know the Luxembourg rather well. I could show you one or two good things.' He understood that, unable to bring herself to apologize directly, she made this offer as amends. "'It's awfully kind of you. I should like it very much. You needn't say yes if you'd rather go along,' she said suspiciously. "'I wouldn't.' They walked towards the gallery. Kellybot's collection had lately been placed on view, and the student for the first time had the opportunity to examine at his ease the works of the Impressionist. Till then it had been possible to see them only at Durand Ruel's shop in the Rue Lafitte, and the dealer, unlike his fellows in England who adopt towards the painter an attitude of superiority, was always pleased to show the shabbiest student whatever he wanted to see. Or at his private house, to which it was not difficult to get a card of admission on Tuesdays, and where you might see pictures of worldwide reputation. Miss Price led Philip straight up to Manet's Olympia. He looked at it in astonished silence. "'Do you like it?' asked Miss Price. "'I don't know,' he answered helplessly. "'You can take it from me. It's the best thing in the gallery, except perhaps Whistler's portrait of his mother.' She gave him a certain time to contemplate the masterpiece, and then took him to a picture representing a railway station. "'Look, here's a Monet,' she said. It's the Gaeta de Lazare. But the railway lines aren't parallel, said Philip. What does that matter? she asked with a haughty air. Philip felt ashamed of himself. Fanny Price had picked up the glib chatter of the studios and had no difficulty in impressing Philip with the extent of her knowledge. She proceeded to explain the pictures to him, superciliously but not without insight, and showed him what the painters had attempted and what he must look for. She talked with much gesticulation of the thumb, and Philip, to whom all she said was new, listened with profound but bewildered interest. Till now he had worshipped Watts and Burne Jones. The pretty color of the first, the affected drawing of the second, had entirely satisfied his aesthetic sensibilities. Their vague idealism, the suspicion of a philosophical idea which underlay the titles they gave their pictures, accorded very well with the functions of art as from his diligent perusal of Ruskin he understood it. But here was something quite different. Here was no moral appeal, and the contemplation of these works could help no one to lead a purer and a higher life. He was puzzled. At last he said, "'You know, I'm simply dead. I don't think I can absorb anything more profitably. Let's go and sit down on one of the benches.' "'It's better not to take too much art at a time,' Miss Price answered. When they got outside he thanked her warmly for the trouble she had taken. "'Oh, that's all right,' she said a little ungraciously. "'I do it because I enjoy it. We'll go to the Louvre tomorrow if you like, and then I'll take you to Durand Ruel's. You're really awfully good to me. You don't think me such a beast as the most of them do.' "'I don't,' he smiled. They think they'll drive me away from the studio, but they won't. I shall stay there just exactly as long as it suits me. All that this morning it was Lucy Otter's doing, I know it was. She always has hated me. She thought after that I'd take myself off. I dare say she'd like me to go. She's afraid I know too much about her. Miss Price told a long, involved story which made out that Mrs. Otter, a humdrum and respectable little person, had scabrous intrigues. Then she talked of Ruth Chalice, the girl whom Foinet had praised that morning. "'She's been with every one of the fellows at the studio. She's nothing better than a streetwalker, and she's dirty. She hasn't had a bath for a month, I know it for a fact.' Philip listened uncomfortably. 
he had heard already that various rumors were in circulation about Miss Chalice, but it was ridiculous to suppose that Mrs. Otter, living with her mother, was anything but rigidly virtuous. The woman, walking by his side with her malignant lying, positively horrified him. "'I don't care what they say. I shall go on just the same. I know I've got it in me. I feel I'm an artist. I'd sooner kill myself than give it up. Oh, I shan't be the first they've all laughed at in the schools, and then he's turned out the only genius of the lot. Art's the only thing I care for. I'm willing to give my whole life to it. It's only a question of sticking to it and pegging away. She found discreditable motives for everyone who would not take her at her own estimate of herself. She detested Clutton. She told Philip that his friend had no talent, really. It was just flashy and superficial. He couldn't compose a figure to save his life. And Lawson. Little beast with his red hair and freckles. He's so afraid of Foinet that he won't let him see his work. After all, I don't funk it, do I? I don't care what Foinet says to me. I know I'm a real artist. They reached the street in which she lived, and with a sigh of relief, Philip left her. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 But notwithstanding when Miss Price on the following Sunday offered to take him to the Louvre, Philip accepted. She showed him Mona Lisa. He looked at it with a slight feeling of disappointment, but he had read till he knew by heart the jeweled words with which Walter Pater has added beauty to the most famous picture in the world, and these now he repeated to Miss Price. "'That's all literature,' she said a little contemptuously. "'You must get away from that.' She showed him the Rembrandts, and she said many appropriate things about them. She stood in front of the disciples at Emmaus. "'When you feel the beauty of that,' she said, "'you'll know something about painting.' She showed him the Odalisque and La Source of Angras. Fanny Price was a peremptory guide. She would not let him look at the things he wished and attempted to force his admiration for all she admired. She was desperately in earnest with her study of art, and when Philip, passing in the long gallery a window that looked out on the Tuileries, gay and sunny and urbane like a picture by Raffaelli, exclaimed, "'I say, how jolly! Do let's stop here a minute!' She said indifferently, "'Yes, it's all right, but we've come here to look at pictures.' The autumn air, blithe and vivacious, elated Philip, and when towards midday they stood in the great courtyard of the Louvre he felt inclined to cry like Flanagan, to hell with art. I say, do let's go to one of those restaurants in the Bois Miche and have a snack together, shall we? he suggested. Miss Price gave him a suspicious look. I've got my lunch waiting for me at home, she answered. That doesn't matter, you can eat it tomorrow. Do let me stand you a lunch. I don't know why you want to. It would give me pleasure, he replied, smiling. They crossed the river, and at the corner of the boulevard Saint-Michel there was a restaurant. Let's go in there. No, I won't go there. It looks too expensive. She walked on firmly, and Philip was obliged to follow. A few steps brought them to a smaller restaurant where a dozen people were already lunching on the pavement under an awning. On the window was announced in large white letters, Déjeuner, one point two five, bien compris. We couldn't have anything cheaper than this, and it looks quite all right. They sat down at a vacant table and waited for the omelette which was the first article on the bill of fare. Philip gazed with delight upon the passers-by. His heart went out to them. He was tired but very happy. I say, look at that man in the blouse. Isn't he ripping? He glanced at Miss Price and to his astonishment saw that she was looking down at her plate, regardless of the passing spectacle, and two heavy tears were rolling down her cheeks. "'What on earth's the matter?' he exclaimed. "'If you say anything to me I shall get up and go at once,' she answered. He was entirely puzzled, but fortunately at that moment the omelette came. He divided it in two, and they began to eat. Philip did his best to talk of indifferent things, and it seemed as though Miss Price were making an effort on her side to be agreeable. But the luncheon was not altogether a success. Philip was squeamish, and the way in which Miss Price ate took his appetite away. She ate noisily, greedily, a little like a wild beast in a menagerie, and after she had finished each course 
rubbed the plate with pieces of bread till it was white and shining, as if she did not wish to lose a single drop of gravy. They had camembert cheese, and it disgusted Philip to see that she ate rind and all of the portion that was given her. She could not have eaten more ravenously if she were starving. Miss Price was unaccountable, and having parted from her on one day with friendliness, he could never tell whether on the next she would not be sulky and uncivil. But he learned a good deal from her. Though she could not draw well herself, she knew all that could be taught, and her constant suggestions helped his progress. Mrs. Otter was useful to him, too, and sometimes Miss Chalice criticized his work. He learned from the glib loquacity of Lawson and from the example of Clutton. But Fanny Price hated him to take suggestions from anyone but herself, and when he asked her help after someone else had been talking to him she would refuse with brutal rudeness. The other fellows, Lawson, Clutton, Flanagan, chaffed him about her. "'You be careful, my lad,' they said. "'She's in love with you.' "'Oh, what nonsense!' he laughed. The thought that Miss Price could be in love with anyone was preposterous. It made him shudder when he thought of her uncomeliness, the bedraggled hair and the dirty hands, the brown dress she always wore, stained and ragged at the hem. He supposed she was hard up, they were all hard up, but she might at least be clean, and it was surely possible with a needle and thread to make her skirt tidy. Philip began to sort his impressions of the people he was thrown in contact with. He was not so ingenuous as in those days which now seemed so long ago at Heidelberg, and beginning to take a more deliberate interest in humanity, he was inclined to examine and to criticize. He found it difficult to know Clutton any better after seeing him every day for three months than on the first day of their acquaintance. The general impression at the studio was that he was able. It was supposed that he would do great things, and he shared the general opinion. But what exactly he was going to do neither he nor anybody else quite knew. He had worked at several studios before Amatrano's at Julian's, the Beaux Arts, and McPherson's, and was remaining longer at Amatrano's than anywhere because he found himself more left alone. He was not fond of showing his work, and unlike most of the young men who were studying art, neither sought nor gave advice. It was said that in the little studio in the Rue Campagne Première, which served him for workroom and bedroom, he had wonderful pictures which would make his reputation if only he could be induced to exhibit them. He could not afford a model but painted still life, and Lawson constantly talked of a plate of apples which he declared was a masterpiece. He was fastidious and aiming at something he did not quite fully grasp, was constantly dissatisfied with his work as a whole. Perhaps a part would please him, the forearm or the leg and foot of a figure, a glass or a cup in a still life, and he would cut this out and keep it, destroying the rest of the canvas, so that when people invited themselves to see his work he could truthfully answer that he had not a single picture to show. In Brittany he had come across a painter whom nobody else had heard of, a queer fellow who had been a stockbroker and had taken up painting at middle age, and he was greatly influenced by his work. He was turning his back on the Impressionist and working out for himself painfully an individual way not only of painting but of seeing. Philip felt in him something strangely original. At Gravier's where they ate and in the evening at the Versailles or at the Closier de Lila Clutton was inclined to taciturnity. He sat quietly with a sardonic expression on his gaunt face and spoke only when the opportunity occurred to throw in a witticism. He liked to butt and was most cheerful when someone was there on whom he could exercise his sarcasm. He seldom talked of anything but painting and then only with the one or two persons whom he thought worthwhile. Philip wondered whether there was in him really anything. His reticence, the haggard look of him, the pungent humor seemed to suggest personality, but might be no more than an effective mask which covered nothing. With Lawson, on the other hand, Philip soon grew intimate. He had a variety of interests which made him an agreeable companion. He read more than most of the students, and though his income was small, loved to buy books. He lent them willingly, and Philip became acquainted with Flaubert and Balzac, with Verlaine, Erythia, and Villers de Ilia Adam. 
They went to plays together, and sometimes to the gallery of the opera Comique. There was the Odon quite near them, and Philip soon shared his friend's passion for the tragedians of Louis the Fourteenth and the sonorous Alexandrine. In the Rue Tebeau were the Concerts Rouge, where for seventy-five centimes they could hear excellent music and get into the bargain something which it was quite possible to drink. The seats were uncomfortable, the place was crowded, the air thick with caporal horrible to breathe, but in their young enthusiasm they were indifferent. Sometimes they went to the Bal Bouilly. On these occasions Flanagan accompanied them. His excitability and his roisterous enthusiasm made them laugh. He was an excellent dancer, and before they had been ten minutes in the room he was prancing round with some little shop-girl whose acquaintance he had just made. The desire of all of them was to have a mistress. It was part of the paraphernalia of the art student in Paris. It gave consideration in the eyes of one's fellows. It was something to boast about. But the difficulty was that they had scarcely enough money to keep themselves, and though they argued that French women were so clever it cost no more to keep two than one, they found it difficult to meet young women who were willing to take that view of the circumstances. They had to content themselves, for the most part, with envying and abusing the ladies who received protection from painters of more settled respectability than their own. It was extraordinary how difficult these things were in Paris. Lawson would become acquainted with some young thing and make an appointment. For twenty-four hours he would be all in a flutter and describe the charmer at length to every one he met. But she never by any chance turned up at the time fixed. He would come to Gravier's very late, ill-tempered, and exclaim, "'Confound it, another rabbit! I don't know why it is they don't like me. I suppose it's because I don't speak French well, or my red hair. It's too sickening to have spent over a year in Paris without getting hold of anyone.' "'You don't go the right way to work,' said Flanagan. He had a long and enviable list of triumphs to narrate, and though they took leave not to believe all he said, evidence forced them to acknowledge that he did not altogether lie. But he sought no permanent arrangement. He only had two years in Paris. He had persuaded his people to let him come and study art instead of going to college. But at the end of that period he was to return to Seattle and go into his father's business. He had made up his mind to get as much fun as possible into the time, and demanded variety rather than duration in his love affairs. "'I don't know how you get hold of them,' said Lawson furiously. "'There's no difficulty about that, Sonny,' answered Flanagan. "'You just go right in. The difficulty is to get rid of them. That's where you want tact.' Philip was too much occupied with his work, the books he was reading, the plays he saw, the conversation he listened to, to trouble himself with the desire for female society. He thought there would be plenty of time for that when he could speak French more glibly. It was more than a year now since he had seen Miss Wilkinson, and during his first weeks in Paris he had been too busy to answer a letter she had written to him just before he left Blackstable. When another came, knowing it would be full of reproaches and not being just then in the mood for them, he put it aside, intending to open it later. But he forgot, and did not run across it till a month afterwards, when he was turning out a drawer to find some socks that had no holes in them. He looked at the unopened letter with dismay. He was afraid that Miss Wilkinson had suffered a good deal, and it made him feel a brute. But she had probably got over the suffering by now, at all events the worst of it. It suggested itself to him that women were often very emphatic in their expressions. These did not mean so much as when men used them. He had quite made up his mind that nothing would induce him ever to see her again. He had not written for so long that it seemed hardly worth while to write now. He made up his mind not to read the letter. "'I dare say she won't write again,' he said to himself. "'She can't help seeing the things over.' After all, she was old enough to be my mother. She ought to have known better. For an hour or two he felt a little uncomfortable. His attitude was obviously the right one, but he could not help a feeling of dissatisfaction with the whole business. Miss Wilkinson, however, did not write again, nor did she, as he absurdly feared, suddenly appear in Paris to make him ridiculous before his friends. In a little while 
he clean forgot her. Meanwhile he definitely forsook his old gods. The amazement with which at first he had looked upon the works of the Impressionist changed to admiration, and presently he found himself talking as emphatically as the rest of the merits of Manet, Monet, and Degas. He bought a photograph of a drawing by Ingres of the Odalisque and a photograph of the Olympia. They were pinned side by side over his washing-stand so that he could contemplate their beauty while he shaved. He knew now quite positively that there had been no painting of landscape before Monet, and he felt a real thrill when he stood in front of Rembrandt's disciples at Emmaus, or Velasquez's lady with the flea-bitten nose. That was not her real name, but by that she was distinguished at Gravier's to emphasize the picture's beauty notwithstanding the somewhat revolting peculiarity of the sitter's appearance. With Ruskin, Burne Jones, and Watts he had put aside his bowler hat and the neat blue tie with white spots which he had worn on coming to Paris, and now disported himself in a soft broad-brimmed hat, a flowing black cravat, and a cape of romantic cut. He walked along the boulevard du Montpassant as though he had known it all his life, and by virtuous perseverance he had learnt to drink absinthe without distaste. He was letting his hair grow, and it was only because nature is unkind and has no regard for the immortal longings of youth that he did not attempt a beard. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 Philip soon realized that the spirit which informed his friends was Cronshaw's. It was from him that Lawson got his paradoxes, and even Clutton, who strained after individuality, expressed himself in the terms he had insensibly acquired from the older man. It was his ideas that they bandied about at table, and on his authority they formed their judgments. They made up for the respect with which unconsciously they treated him, by laughing at his foibles and lamenting his vices. Of course, poor old Cronshaw will never do any good, they said. He's quite hopeless. They prided themselves on being alone in appreciating his genius, and though, with the contempt of youth for the follies of middle age, they patronized him among themselves, they did not fail to look upon it as a feather in their caps if he had chosen a time when only one was there to be particularly wonderful. Cronshaw never came to Gravier's. For the last four years he had lived in squalid conditions with a woman whom only Lawson had seen once, in a tiny apartment on the sixth floor of one of the most dilapidated houses on the Quai de Gras Ouest. Lawson described with gusto the filth, the untidiness, the litter, and the stink nearly blew your head off. Not at dinner, Lawson, expostulated one of the others but he would not deny himself the pleasure of giving picturesque details of the odors which met his nostril. With a fierce delight in his own realism he described the woman who had opened the door for him. She was dark, small, and fat, quite young, with black hair that seemed always on the point of coming down. She wore a slatternly blouse and no corsets. With her red cheeks, large, sensual mouth, and shining lewd eyes, she reminded you of the Beaumien in the Louvre by Franz Halls. She had a flaunting vulgarity which amused and yet horrified. A scruffy unwashed baby was playing on the floor. It was known that the slut deceived Cronshaw with the most worthless ragamuffins of the quarter, and it was a mystery to the ingenuous youth who absorbed his wisdom over a café table that Cronshaw, with his keen intellect and his passion for beauty, could ally himself to such a creature but he seemed to revel in the coarseness of her language and would often report some phrase which reeked of the gutter. He referred to her ironically as Le fille de mon concierge. Cronshaw was very poor. He earned a bare subsistence by writing on the exhibitions of pictures for one or two English papers, and he did a certain amount of translating. He had been on the staff of an English paper in Paris, but had been dismissed for drunkenness. He still, however, did odd jobs for it, describing sales at the Hotel Drouot or the reviews at music halls. The life of Paris had got into his bones, and he would not change it, notwithstanding its squalor, drudgery, and hardship for any other in the world. He remained there all through the year, even in summer when everyone he knew was away, and felt himself only at ease within a mile of the Boulevard Saint-Michel. 
but the curious thing was that he had never learnt to speak French passably, and he kept in his shabby clothes bought at Le Belle Jardinière an ineradicably English appearance. He was a man who would have made a success of life a century and a half ago, when conversation was a passport to good company and in ebriety no bar. I ought to have lived in the eighteen hundreds, he said himself. What I want is a patron. I should have published my poems by subscription and dedicated them to a nobleman. I longed to compose rhymed couplets upon the poodle of a countess. My soul yearns for the love of chambermaids and the conversation of bishops. He quoted the romantic Rolla. Je suis vu, nous trop tardens un monde trop vieux. He liked new faces, and he took a fancy to Philip, who seemed to achieve the difficult feat of talking just enough to suggest conversation, and not too much to prevent monologue. Philip was captivated. He did not realize that little that Cronshaw said was new. His personality in conversation had a curious power. He had a beautiful and sonorous voice, and a manner of putting things which was irresistible to youth. All he said seemed to excite thought and often on the way home Lawson and Philip would walk to and from one another's hotels, discussing some point which a chance word of Cronshaw had suggested. It was disconcerting to Philip, who had a youthful eagerness for results, that Cronshaw's poetry hardly came up to expectation. It had never been published in a volume, but most of it had appeared in periodicals, and after a good deal of persuasion Cronshaw brought down a bundle of pages torn out of the yellow book the Saturday Review, and other journals on each of which was a poem. Philip was taken aback to find that most of them reminded him either of Henley or Swinburne. It needed the splendor of Cronshaw's delivery to make them personal. He expressed his disappointment to Lawson, who carelessly repeated his words, and next time Philip went to the Closerie de Lila, the poet turned to him with his sleek smile. "'I hear you don't think much of my verses.' Philip was embarrassed. "'I don't know about that,' he answered. "'I enjoyed reading them very much.' "'Do not attempt to spare my feelings,' returned Cronshaw with a wave of his fat hand. "'I do not attach any exaggerated importance to my poetical works. Life is there to be lived rather than to be written about. My aim is to search out the manifold experience that it offers, wringing from each moment what of emotion it presents.' I look upon my writing as a graceful accomplishment which does not absorb, but rather adds pleasure to existence. And as for posterity, damn posterity! Philip smiled, for it leaped to one's eyes that the artist in life had produced no more than a wretched daub. Cronshaw looked at him meditatively and filled his glass. He sent the waiter for a packet of cigarettes. You are amused because I talk in this fashion, and you know that I am poor and lived in an attic with a vulgar trollop who deceives me with hairdressers and garçons de café. I translate wretched books for the British public and write articles upon contemptible pictures which deserve not even to be abused. But pray tell me what is the meaning of life? I say that's rather a difficult question. Won't you give the answer yourself? No because it's worthless unless you yourself discover it. But what do you suppose you are in the world for?" Philip had never asked himself, and he thought for a moment before replying. "'Oh, I don't know. I suppose to do one's duty, and make the best possible use of one's faculties, and avoid hurting other people. In short, to do unto others as you would they should do unto you?' "'I suppose so.' Christianity. No, it isn't said Philip indignantly, it has nothing to do with Christianity. It's just abstract morality. But there's no such thing as abstract morality. In that case, supposing under the influence of liquor you left your purse behind when you leave here, and I picked it up, why do you imagine that I should return it to you? It's not the fear of the police. It's the dread of hell if you sin, and the hope of heaven if you are virtuous. But I believe in neither. That may be." neither did Kant when he devised the categorical imperative. You have thrown aside a creed, but you have preserved the ethic which was based upon it. To all intents you are a Christian still, and if there is a God in heaven you will undoubtedly receive your reward. The Almighty could hardly be such a fool as the churches make out. If you keep his laws I don't think he can care a packet of pins 
whether you believe in him or not. But if I left my purse behind you would certainly return it to me, said Philip not from motives of abstract morality, but only from fear of the police. It's a thousand to one that the police would never find out. My ancestors have lived in a civilized state so long that the fear of the police has eaten into my bones. The daughter of my concierge would not hesitate for a moment. You answer that she belongs to the criminal classes. Not at all. She is merely devoid of vulgar prejudice." but then that does away with honor and virtue and goodness and decency and everything, said Philip. Have you ever committed a sin? I don't know. I suppose so, answered Philip. You speak with the lips of a dissenting minister. I have never committed a sin. Cronshaw, in his shabby great coat, with the collar turned up and his hat well down on his head, with his red fat face and his little gleaming eyes, looked extraordinarily comic but Philip was too much in earnest to laugh. "'Have you ever done anything you regret?' "'How can I regret when what I did was inevitable?' asked Cronshaw in return. "'But that's fatalism. The illusion which man has that his will is free is so deeply rooted that I am ready to accept it. I act as though I were a free agent. But when an action is performed it is clear that all the forces of the universe from all eternity conspired to cause it and nothing I could do could have prevented it. It was inevitable. If it was good I can claim no merit. If it was bad I can accept no censure. "'My brain reels,' said Philip. "'Have some whisky," returned Cronshaw, passing over the bottle. "'There's nothing like it for clearing the head. You must expect to be thick-witted if you insist upon drinking beer.' Philip shook his head, and Cronshaw proceeded. "'You're not a bad fellow, but you won't drink.' Sobriety disturbs conversation. But when I speak of good and bad, Philip saw he was taking up the thread of his discourse. I speak conventionally. I attach no meaning to those words. I refuse to make a hierarchy of human actions and ascribe worthiness to some and ill repute to others. The terms vice and virtue have no signification for me. I do not confer praise or blame. I accept. I am the measure of all things. I am the center of the world. But there are one or two other people in the world, objected Philip. I speak only for myself. I know them only as they limit my activities. Round each one of them too the world turns, and each one for himself is the center of the universe. My right over them extends only as far as my power. What I can do is the only limit of what I may do. Because we are gregarious we live in society and society holds together by means of force, force of arms, that is the policeman, and force of public opinion, that is Mrs. Grundy. You have society on one hand and the individual on the other. Each is an organism striving for self-preservation. It is might against might. I stand alone, bound to accept society and not unwilling, since in return for the taxes I pay, it protects me, a weakling, against the tyranny of another stronger than I am. But I submit to its laws because I must. I do not acknowledge their justice. I do not know justice. I only know power. And when I have paid for the policeman who protects me, and if I live in a country where conscription is in force, served in the army which guards my house and land from the invader, I am quits with society. For the rest I counter its might with my wiliness." It makes laws for its self-preservation, and if I break them it imprisons or kills me. It has the might to do so, and therefore the right. If I break the laws I will accept the vengeance of the state, but I will not regard it as punishment nor shall I feel myself convicted of wrongdoing. Society tempts me to its service by honors and riches, and the good opinion of my fellows. But I am indifferent to their good opinion." I despise honors, and I can do very well without riches. But if everyone thought like you, things would go to pieces at once. I have nothing to do with others. I am only concerned with myself. I take advantage of the fact that the majority of mankind are led by certain rewards to do things which directly or indirectly tend to my convenience. It seems to me an awfully selfish way of looking at things, said Philip. But are you under the impression that men ever do anything except for selfish reasons? Yes. It is impossible that they should. 
you will find as you grow older that the first thing needful to make the world a tolerable place to live in is to recognize the inevitable selfishness of humanity. You demand unselfishness from others, which is a preposterous claim that they should sacrifice their desires to yours. Why should they? When you are reconciled to the fact that each is for himself in the world, you will ask less from your fellows. They will not disappoint you, and you will look upon them more charitably. Men seek but one thing in life, their pleasure. No, 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 cried Philip. Cronshaw chuckled. You rear like a frightened colt because I use a word to which your Christianity ascribes a deprecatory meaning. You have a hierarchy of values. Pleasure is at the bottom of the ladder, and you speak with a little thrill of self-satisfaction, of duty, charity, and truthfulness. You think pleasure is only one of the senses. The wretched slaves who manufactured your morality despised the satisfaction which they had small means of enjoying. You would not be so frightened if I had spoken of happiness instead of pleasure. It sounds less shocking, and your mind wanders from the sty of Epicurans to his garden. But I will speak of pleasure, for I see that men aim at it, and I do not know that they aim at happiness. It is pleasure that lurks in the practice of every one of your virtues. Man performs actions because they are good for him, and when they are good for other people as well, they are thought virtuous. If he finds pleasure in giving alms, he is charitable. If he finds pleasure in helping others, he is benevolent. If he finds pleasure in working for society, he is public-spirited. But it is for your private pleasure that you give two pence to a beggar as much as it is for my private pleasure that I drink another whiskey and soda. I, less of a humbug than you, neither applaud myself for my pleasure nor demand your admiration. But have you never known people do things they didn't want to instead of things they did? No, you put your question foolishly. What you mean is that people accept an immediate pain rather than an immediate pleasure. The objection is as foolish as your manner of putting it. It is clear that men accept an immediate pain rather than an immediate pleasure, but only because they expect a greater pleasure in the future. Often the pleasure is illusory, but their error in calculation is no refutation of the rule. You are puzzled because you cannot get over the idea that pleasures are only of the senses. But, child, a man who dies for his country dies because he likes it as surely as a man eats pickled cabbage because he likes it. It is a law of creation. If it were possible for men to prefer pain to pleasure, the human race would have long since become extinct. But if all that is true, cried Philip, what is the use of anything? If you take away duty and goodness and beauty, why are we brought into the world? Here comes the gorgeous East to suggest an answer, smiled Cronshaw. He pointed to two persons who at that moment opened the door of the café and, with a blast of cold air, entered. They were Levantines, itinerant vendors of cheap rugs, and each bore on his arm a bundle. It was Sunday evening and the café was very full. They passed among the tables, and in that atmosphere heavy and discolored with tobacco smoke, rank with humanity, they seemed to bring an air of mystery. They were clad in European shabby clothes, their thin great coats were threadbare, but each wore a tarbouche. Their faces were gray with cold, one was of middle age with a black beard, but the other was a youth of eighteen with a face deeply scarred by smallpox and with one eye only. They passed by Cronshaw and Philip. Allah is great, and Mohammed is his prophet, said Cronshaw impressively. The elder advanced with a cringing smile like a mongrel used to blows. With a sidelong glance at the door and a quick, surreptitious movement, he showed a pornographic picture. Are you Mazardine, the merchant of Alexandria, or is it from far Baghdad that you bring your goods, O oh, my uncle, and yonder one-eyed youth do I see in him? one of the three kings of whom Shazarad told stories to her lord? The peddler's smile grew more ingratiating, though he understood no word of what Cronshaw said, and like a conjurer he produced a sandalwood box. "'Nay, show us the priceless web of eastern looms,' quoth Cronshaw, "'for I would point a moral and adorn a tale.' The Levantine unfolded a tablecloth, red and yellow, vulgar, hideous, and grotesque. Thirty-five francs,' he said. 
oh, my uncle, this cloth knew not the weavers of Samarkand, and those colors were never made in the vats of Bokharon. Twenty-five francs, smiled the petter obsequiously. Ultima Thumi was the place of its manufacture, even Birmingham the place of my birth. Fifteen francs, cringed the bearded man. Get thee gone, fellow, said Cronshaw. May wild asses defile the grave of thy maternal grandmother. Imperturbably, but smiling no more, the Levantine passed with his wares to another table. Cronshaw turned to Philip. Have you ever been to Cluny, the museum? There you will see Persian carpets of the most exquisite hue, and of a pattern the beautiful intricacies of which delights and amazes the eye. In them you will see the mystery and the sensual beauty of the East, the roses of Hafiz and the wine-cup of Omar. But presently you will see more. You were asking just now what was the meaning of life. Go and look at those Persian carpets, and one of these days the answer will come to you. You are cryptic, said Philip. I am drunk, answered Cronshaw. End of chapter 45 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com